Show. In the words of a great psychiatrist, too often the human mind is a diabolically complex machine designed for murder. The lust to kill oftentimes lies closer to the surface, unrecognized, than is ever dreamed of. That lust is called paranoia, a word meaningless until a simple hairspring motivation turns the sane to insane, cunning, crafty, calculating held in the vice-like grip of an overwhelming obsession. In a moment, you'll find a deeper meaning in that word paranoia in the story starring Vincent Price. the story of a train ride. A train ride from Willett Falls to the prison city of Banning. We're to be concerned with only three passengers aboard this train. Two of them in compartment B, car 92, their wrists locked together in close companionship by gleaming steel handcuffs. The third passenger... One that is always present when two such men ride the train from Willett Falls to Banning City. This third passenger watches keenly the building of the slow, hot fires of a terrible obsession. Davis. Yes? Care to play a game of casino? Oh, no, thanks. I think I'll read. Okay. This is a very interesting article. You should read it yourself. What's it about? The various types of insanity. <laughs> That's quite a thing to be reading. That's quite academic, not the usual tripe at all. Academic or not, I don't go for that stuff. Screwballs and loons. But those are people, too. After all, every one of us is supposed to have some kind of an insane streak. The majority subdue their manias. These weaker ones are the people who fill our asylums. Who told you that? It says so here in the article. Well, I don't believe it. Oh, that's what makes insanity such an interesting subject. The element of uncertainty which surrounds it. Would you believe that there are people who are insane that the finest psychiatrists are unable to detect? Yeah? Yes. A certain type are called paranoiacs. Well... You see, many paranoiacs are fully aware of their deranged state of mind, and they go to great lengths to conceal it. <laughs> that's what makes them so dangerous. That's all very interesting, but I don't care. <laughs> you can keep your, uh, your, uh... Paranoics? Yeah. And I'll take Dick Tracy. Well, everyone to their own taste. The inspector, mm -hmm. if you intend to read the comics, would you be so good as to keep your right hand a bit closer to mine? I find it quite difficult to hold my magazine and turn the page with these handcuffs on. <laughs> an apple, Davis? No, thank you, Inspector. Well, I'll slice it in half in case you change your mind later on. It's an attractive knife you have there, Inspector. The handle's mother of pearl, isn't it? Hmm? Uh, oh, yeah. What are you thinking about, Inspector? I was thinking of you, Davis. Me? You're a funny duck. I can't help but wonder about you. Wonder how? Why'd you do it, Davis? Well, now, wasn't it you who suggested we didn't think about it? Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, you needn't be, because I don't mind. Not really. Matter of fact, I rather enjoy talking to you. Inspector, have you ever been in love? Well, yes, certainly. But that's a funny question. How was yours? Yeah. See, I didn't tell the others. That rooming house. I lived there myself. I took the room under an assumed name. Dorothy lived right above me. We were engaged once, 
Dorothy and I two years ago. We were going to be married. We were very much in love. Then suddenly she started to change toward me. I thought it was my imagination at first. Then all at once I knew it was true. She had changed. Someone else. No, there was no one. That's why I couldn't understand it. We had a date one night. She told me it was all over. And she moved. I searched for her everywhere. And finally I found she had taken a room in a boarding house. I called her many times, but she left word that she wasn't at home to me. That's when I moved there myself. To get her back? No, no. I, I knew it was impossible as she told me. I, I just wanted to be near her. To see her. I'd watch her go down the stairs to work in the morning. Then I'd hurry home in the evening, so I'd be there first to see her come back to her room after work. And she never knew you lived there? No, never. That is until the night before it happened. I met her on the stairs outside the house accidentally. She told me she was going to be married. <laughs> I congratulated her. I remember that. Then I went up to my room, but I couldn't sleep that night. Because I could hear her laughing and talking upstairs with some man. The following night, I heard the same man's voice up in her room. With the thought of him being there, I didn't like it. Then there was a butcher knife laying on the kitchen table. She took it and I walked up the stairs. I knocked on the door. Dorothy answered, and I, I found her alone. It was him that I wanted, and so I started to go. Then I looked at her face. She was laughing at me. At me. I couldn't stand it. I took the knife, and, and I killed her. Just like that, Inspector, I killed her. Cigarette, Davis? No, thank you. But, Inspector, I, I believe I'll change my mind about that half of the apple. I, could I have it now? Sure. Yeah. Well, would you be good enough to peel it for me, you know? Hmm? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait till I get my knife. Here you are. Oh, I dropped the apple, would you? <laughs> and you dropped your knife, Inspector. Davis! Davis, don't move. You're exceedingly unobserving, Inspector. I didn't dream it would be quite so simple to knock the knife out of your hand. And that over, Davis. Really, Inspector, with this blade in your ribs, aren't you overlooking the fact that I'm giving the orders now? What do you expect to get out of this? First, your key to these handcuffs. All right, give them to me. Be quick about it, please. Thank you. Now your revolver, please. Listen, Davis. You'll never get away with this. Your description will be wired to every police station or sheriff's office in the country. Ah, but you're mistaken. Who is going to wire my description? Why, I... You? Oh, no, Inspector. I trust that at some time or other you'll have the foresight to take out a life insurance policy payable on your death to your wife and children. It would be a shame to see your family left uncared for. You mean... I mean that at a propitious moment I intend to kill you, Inspector. Now give me all your credentials and identifications, please, Inspector. What do you want my papers for? You are dull, Inspector. But I suppose no more so than your law enforcement compatriots. You see, I plan on taking your credentials and representing you. <laughs> Rather fortunate that we're quite alike in stature, isn't it? You must be insane to try something like this. That's one of your first profound observations. Do you recall my mentioning paranoiacs a while ago? Yeah. I wouldn't confide this to anyone but you, Inspector. But inasmuch as you're unlikely to repeat anything you hear, I might as well tell you that for some time now, I've been rather worried that I myself might possibly be mentally afflicted. You're not serious. Oh, but I am quite serious. You see, I've only recently become aware of a certain Machiavellian cleverness in my actions and plots. A cleverness that I must admit was not previously endowed in me. Further... Although I like you exceptionally well, Inspector, I'll confess that, strangely enough, I'm going to rather enjoy killing you. You are crazy. As I've said, possibly. Say nothing. Yes, who's there? Conductor. What do you want? Open up, please. What do you want? I have to have your tickets. Oh, one moment. Conductor doesn't know you by sight, does he? Or answer me, does he know you? No. I'll unlock the door. Give me your wrist. Here, put one of these handcuffs on. Quick. There. You stay beside me. Don't make a move. Understand? Not one move. 
Oh, I'm sorry I was so long in answering. One has yes, to be very... Yes, Inspector Harwell, we were told that you'd have a prisoner with you. Oh? Oh, yes, you were told, of course. I hear the ticket. Ah, uh, if there's anything you should want, Inspector, just press that button for the porter. I have him standing by. Oh, thank you. Well, I hope your trip comes off all right. I'm sure it will, thank you. Well, then I'll be uh, getting along. Conductor. Yes? Uh... How long before we reach Banning City? Oh, about an hour and a half, Inspector. Oh, well, thank you again. Sure thing. All right, Inspector. I I think we'd better get these handcuffs off now. What do you intend to do now, Davis? Well, Inspector, you heard what the conductor said. One hour and a half until we reach Banning City. That doesn't leave us very much time, does it? What are you getting at? Well, if I'm going to make good my escape, I'll have to start making arrangements now, won't I? Davis... Davis, put that knife away. Forgive me, Inspector, but I'm very afraid that propitious moment has arrived. Davis, wait. I'm wait sorry, up. Inspector. Wait, I'm wait, very wait. A blast of steam from the locomotive's whistle drowns out the last gurgling cry of Harwell, the Inspector. The man with a pearl-handled pocket knife who realized too late that the affability of his train companion was but a camouflage to hide a razor-edged obsession. Returning now to compartment B, car 92... And three passengers bound from Willet Falls to the prison city of Bannon. In our story, starring Vincent Price. As the speeding train hurtles down the threads of steel that leads to the death house of Banning City, Davis stares thoughtfully into the glazed eyes of the man he's just murdered. His cunning, insane mind, carefully, analytically planning his next move, with the same shrewd detachment of a chess player moving a pawn. His eyes flicker down to his wrist, still locked in a steel embrace with that of his victim. And again, his mind floods with the exhilaration of his master craftsmanship, the overpowering strength of his one obsession. Glad you couldn't have stayed long enough to witness the last act of my little drama. For you see, now that I've killed you, the rest becomes quite simple. I've sent for the conductor, Inspector, and do you know why? I'm going to ask him to stop the train so that I might make an important call to headquarters. Thereupon, I will disappear, and by the time your body is discovered, I will undoubtedly be in another county, thanks to your credentials. Oh, but come now, you'd better straighten up a bit. There, there, that's better. Oh, here now, I hadn't noticed that you bleed quite profusely. Perhaps we'd better place my handkerchief inside your coat. So you won't appear to be wounded. There you are. I'm sure you'll look... Yes? Yes, who's there? It's the conductor, Inspector Harwell. Oh, wait a minute, please. Well, Inspector, I must be handcuffed to you again, unfortunately. Come in. The uh, porter said you wanted to see me, Inspector. Yes, indeed. It appears that I left some very important papers regarding my prisoner in Willett Falls. This, I'm afraid, will necessitate an immediate phone call. Mm, well, I could have the train stop for you, Inspector. Oh, fine. Only I don't know where you could make a call. This is desert we're passing through. The last stop where you could have got a phone was Cartwright when we picked up our last passenger. Are you sure? Sure as taxes, Inspector. I'm sorry. However, we're on time, being banning in an hour, if that'll do any good. Of course it won't do me any good. I just finished telling you that. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Inspector. Oh, yes, well, thank you. Say, uh, what's wrong with your, with your friend there? What? Your pal. Is he snoozing? Oh, yes, yes, he is. He's, he's taking a little nap. Oh, how do you like that? A guy that can sleep on his way to the death house. <laughs> Boy, some of these killers are sure cold-blooded, aren't they? Yes. Yes, aren't they, though? Uh, well, Inspector, if that's all, oh, I... Uh... Yes, yes, thank you anyway. So long. Yes, so long. Oh. Well, 
Now, what do you think of that, Inspector? It seems that fate has interceded momentarily, doesn't it? Well, I've never jumped from a moving train before, but, well, the sand should be of help. Oh, wish me luck, Inspector. Now, let's get these handcuffs off, hmm? There. Well, it's clumsy of me to drop your keys, eh? Should be under the seat here. Yes, there. I can't reach them. I'll try it with my foot. I... I can't reach the keys. I can't reach them. And the handcuffs won't come off without those keys. The handcuffs won't come off. If you were alive, Inspector, you'd think me a coward, wouldn't you, to become frightened when I found myself unable to reach those handcuff keys. But you would admire me for realizing in time that frenzy must be exchanged for resourcefulness, wouldn't you? <laughs> yes, who's that? I'm sorry to bother you, Inspector. Yes, Conductor, what is it? Uh, this lady here got on a cart right, and we can't find a place for her to sit in the chair car. Oh? She's only going as far as Banning, and I suggest that she might share your compartment, if you don't mind. Well, it so happens I do mind. This compartment is reserved by the police department of Willett Falls, and not for the convenience of wayward travelers. Now, uh, just a minute, Alice. Conductor, I didn't know. Uh, it's all right, miss. Uh, listen, Inspector, this compartment is not reserved. It's a courtesy that the line shows to the police department whenever possible. You'll find that your ticket actually calls for a chair car in Coach 3. Now, if you don't intend to cooperate with us, I'll have to ask you to move to Coach 3. That is, if you can get in at all. Well, under the circumstances, I don't seem to have much choice, do I? Show the lady in. All right, here you are, miss. Forty minutes before we reach Banning, I'll call you. Oh, thank you, Conductor. Yes, Conductor. By all means, call us when we reach Banning City. We'll be waiting. Inspector, I... I'm really terribly sorry that my company was more or less forced upon you. I'd like to apologize. It's all right. Trains are crowded these days. I suppose we just have to make the best of it. I can understand that you would have some hesitancy about having a woman in the same compartment with a murderer. Murderer? Yes, your conductor told me all about your prisoner. But it really doesn't frighten me at all. It doesn't? No. You don't mind being here with a murderer? Oh, not as long as you're here. I'll just trust you to take care of the situation. You... you trust me? Of course. But you don't know who I am. <laughs> what difference does that make? And anyway, I do know who you are. You're Inspector Harwell of the Willett Falls Police Department. The conductor told me that, too. What's your name? Dorothy. Dorothy Jones. I hate the name of Jones, don't you? No. No, I like it. And I like Dorothy, too. I used to know a Dorothy once. Did you? Yes, she looked something like you. She was blonde and tall and young and pretty like you. Thank you. Whatever happened to her? What? Where is she now? Oh, she went away. She took a long trip. On a boat, I think. Oh, I've always wanted to go on a long trip. I never get the chance, though. Maybe you will. Say, your prisoner, he's certainly a sound sleeper, isn't he? Uh, yes. Yes, he is that. He doesn't even look like he's breathing. No, no, some people sleep that way, I guess. He could be dead and you wouldn't even know it, would you? Don't talk like that. What? What's wrong, Inspector? You seem worried. I'm not worried. Why should I be worried? It's just that this job gets on my nerves. I'm not made of steel. You know, you're not much like a detective. What makes you say that? I thought all detectives had nerves of steel. I, I didn't think any of you ever got bothered, but... Inspector, your coat. What? Your coat. It's got blood on it. Oh, oh well, I was I was peeling an apple. I cut my hand. I, I cut my hand, you understand? Oh, what are you staring at? It's the other man who's bleeding. It's the other man. I... Quiet. I... Quiet. You hear me? Don't raise your voice. You... You've got a gun. Yes, his gun. And you may be assured that I'll use it unless you do exactly as I say. Now, listen closely, Miss Jones. On the floor beneath this seat, you'll find the keys to these handcuffs. Be good enough to get them for me, please. Quickly, please. Here. Thank you. There. That's better. Now, why, Miss Jones, you appear to be shocked. Is something troubling you? You're not the inspector. You... 
You're a murderer. You killed Inspector Harwell, didn't you? I'm afraid so. Oh, but come now. Let's not be morbid about it. They'll catch you. They will. I hardly think so. You see, Miss Jones, since you've been kind enough to help me dispense with these bracelets, the problem of escape really becomes quite simple once again. What are you going to do? You're frightened of me, aren't you? You're thinking that I might kill you? That's an understandable emotion. Don't. Don't come any closer. Keep away from me. I'll relieve you of your coat, please. What? What do you want with my coat? Are you tearing it? Of course. I shall need these strips of cloth to bind and gag you. Now, hold out your wrists and we'll slip these bracelets on. There, now, we'll bind your feet. No. No, let me go. I'll have to ask you not to struggle, Miss Jones. I realize how unpleasant this must be for you. However, it would be considerably more unpleasant if I should be forced to pull this trigger. You must be out of your mind. Oh, now, that's strange. Inspector Harwell said the same thing. Just before he died. Now open your mouth, please. No, I... No, there. No. That's fine. I do. Well, now I... Oh. I believe it's time for me to take my leave. I'll say goodbye and... Oh. Wait. Wait a minute. The train's slowing down. Something's wrong. They... Oh. oh of course, the train's taking a side. I'll wait until we slow down a bit more and then I shall... I shall leap from this window... In approximately 30 minutes, this train will be pulling into Banning City. But without me, because Miss Jones, I'll be on my way to freedom. It's done, and I planned it all myself. Nothing could go wrong now. Nothing. Well, goodbye, Miss Jones. Dorothy. Goodbye. Charlie, catch this wire from Cartwright. Holy smoke, so that's the delay. Let me have that phone, Mac. Hello? Hello. This is the station agent in Banning City. You better send an ambulance to Centerville Junction. Some guy jumped in front of an eastbound special just as it was passing the local. Huh? No, he's dead. Goodbye. <laughs> have been listening to Obsession. has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Fearsome days of 1939, when the British Empire stood at the threshold of total war with Germany, 
No mind could withstand the impact of impending disaster without seeking refuge in some escape. In a moment, you'll hear the strange story starring Ruth Warren. A story you'll remember for its weird implications of an obsession. Southampton, the swirling fog and mist seeping through cracks and crannies like the sulfurous vapors of something poisonous and evil, the strange glaring lights on the docks illumining a casket being hoisted aboard a ship, a ship destined to sail this night into the shroud of darkness toward the west. A girl, Judith Webster, also destined to sail the ship into whatever port the fates may decree. But then, let her tell her own story of her voyage through darkness, of an apprehension she could not escape, a complete and overwhelming obsession. It happened in 1939, shortly before England and Germany were at war. I was in London, serving as traveling companion to Mrs. Edna Prescott, a wealthy, quite elderly American woman. She wasn't a pleasant person. The city's practiced blackouts were a particular source of annoyance to her. I remember thinking how ironic it was that she should die during one of them. I even thought it the cause, till the doctors assured me that her death was due to a common heart ailment. I was very busy the next few days, arranging passage to America, getting my train ticket down to Southampton, and, and carrying out the promise I had made to Mrs. Prescott. I didn't relish any part of it. Miss Webster, oh yes, the young woman who's escorting the casket. Here's your ticket. Gate five. The young woman who's escorting the casket. He said it's so, so matter of fact. As if such things occurred every day. I suppose they do. And yet, every minute on that train, I felt uncomfortable. On edge. It seemed as if the trip to Southampton and the steamer docks would never end. I remember how glad I was when it did. And how cheerful the steward's voice sounded as he greeted me at the head of the gangway. Evening, miss. Welcome aboard. Might I show you to your cabin? Oh, yes. Please do, steward. I'm very tired. Oh, uh, I'm in uh, 12A, Deck B. 12A, Deck B. Uh, this way, miss. As I followed the steward along the deck, down the companionways, everything seemed all right again. I didn't even mind the weird cries of the newsboys in the steamer docks. They were shouting something about a blackout killer and how the London police were on his trail. Blackout killer? Oh, what a horrible thought. Oh, but the newspapers, horror stories. Oh, they belonged to the shore. I was safe in the ship, about to sail. Here we are, miss. You have it all to yourself this trip. Very nice quarters, too. Oh, thank you, Stuart. Oh, uh, here you are. Uh, thank you, miss. Good night. Good night. Call if you need anything. My cabin, perfectly safe. I, I realized how jittery I'd been. Oh, upset. I... <laughs> Suddenly I began to laugh at myself. 
<laughs> My fears had been so foolish. <laughs> so foolish. <laughs> An hour later, I went up on deck. I no longer felt tired. And I wanted to watch the lights of the coastline fading away from it. I was standing near the after rail, quietly, looking out across the water. When... Beautiful, isn't it? Oh, oh. oh, I'm sorry. I frightened you? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, you did. I, I didn't realize there was anyone near that lifeboat. Oh, I thought sure you saw me. Oh, I never oh, It's all right, really. I, I, I've been nervous tonight anyway. I, I'm not usually so jumpy. What you need is an ocean boy. Yes, yes, maybe that's it. Were you watching the shore light? Uh, oh, yes, I was. I, oh, I never did answer your question, did I? They are beautiful. Very. And the sea alone is beautiful. She has mood, you know, just like a woman. Gentle sometimes and soothing. Then suddenly flying into a rage and dashing things to pieces. Then quieting right down again. That's right. I see we feel the same about her. Does she frighten you sometimes? The same way women frighten me. Oh. I mean, when I don't understand them. I thought it was the general male consensus that we weren't supposed to be understood. Only love. Isn't that the rest of it? <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, it's a philosophy I disagree with. Oh, well, how refreshing. Oh, but the lady is amused. Oh, not at all. It's just that the lady detects a bachelor. <laughs> because I have a mind of my own. Oh, that's one good clue. And I... <laughs> What am I thinking of? I'm lecturing to you as if I... Well, I believe that bit of triteness ends up as if I'd known you all my life. Now, wait a minute. There's another which makes it perfectly all right. It's that shipboard friendships last forever business. <laughs> yes, of course. However, my name is Alan Bruce. Yours? Uh, Judith Webster. Miss? Miss. Good. Well, we got through that. Quite nicely. You suppose we could get through a dance? There's music in the cellar. Well, there's no longer any view of the shore light. Uh, however, you did say the sea alone was beautiful. Oh, I was so wrong. There's nothing as monotonous as all that water. Mm, it is kind of, uh, flat. Let's trade it for champagne, shall we? Be with you in a minute. Oh, where are you going? Just over here. I want to do the skipper a little favor. But what is it I can't... Oh, for well, the lifeboat cover. How do you suppose it got so loose? I don't know. Noticed it a while back. There, yeah, that should do it. Strange. It was almost as if I... Oh, no. What were you going to say? <sighs> Leave it to me. I... I was going to get melodramatic and suggest that someone might have been hiding in there. You mean a stowaway? Yes. <laughs> of course, it's silly. Well, I wouldn't say so. You're joking. Not at all. It's quite possible someone could have slipped on board and hidden that light bulb. That's why I think we shouldn't mention this to anyone. What? It would only cause an alarm, Judith. But uh, I don't understand. If you really think there might have been someone... Someone... I shall never forget that moment. The thoughts that went racing through my mind. My nervousness on the train. Those horrible headlines the newsboys were shouting from the pier. Alan's strange attitude about the lifeboat. The whole unpleasant nature of this voyage and my... My promise to Mrs. Prescott. I wanted to turn and, and run. I wanted to cry out, but somehow I couldn't. It was like a dream when you can't move. And then the darkness was swept away. I was no longer dreaming. I was in Alan's arms, dancing. There were laughing, carefree people all around us. The ship Alan was so bright and friendly, I, I was ashamed of myself for even thinking there might have been anything wrong. Had enough? They just brought our champagne. Oh, well, in that case, yes. I'd about given up. Oh, a fine way to talk about my dancing. Oh, you know perfectly well what I mean. All right, let her go, Stuart. There we are, bubbling champagne. Gay as life. Well, what should we toast to? Shipboard friendship? Hmm? Yes, shipboard friendship. You know what? Oh, what is it? Something wrong? No, no, nothing at all. I just thought I saw someone. Will you excuse me a moment? Of course. I won't be long. Excuse me, miss, but the gentleman. 
he dropped this bill for Oh, thank you, Stuart. I didn't notice. Oh, just leave it there on the table, please. Very good, miss. The billfold fell open as he placed it on the table. I couldn't take my eyes from it. There was an identification card in plain sight. The name on the card was not Alan Bruce. It was Charles Drew. Sorry to run off that way. Didn't know the fellow at all. Oh, well, say, you haven't touched your champagne. You'll let all the kick go out of it. I'm afraid all the kick has gone out of it. Well, we'll soon take care of it. Oh, my billfold. Where did you find it? The steward picked it up. Steward? Well, we found an honest man after remembering. Hadn't you better look to see if you found an honest woman? I'll take a chance. On my honesty, yes. What about a woman's curiosity? Very good point. But you know, I'm sure you wouldn't tell anyone anything. No? No. I knew from the very first I could trust you, Judy. I knew I could trust you. Implicitly. Attention! Attention, everybody! The first officer has something to say to us. I'm sorry to break in on the dancing this way, but this won't take long. You received a wire from London, and I must ask your cooperation. Wire from London? Oh, well, something's happened. Or well, maybe it's war with Germany. No, no, it isn't war. Nothing nearly as alarming as that. However, the London police suspect we're carrying a stowaway. They've asked us to search the ship and report back to them. Go away. be a criminal if the police were after the blackout killer. Fancy a killer on uh, Wait, please, sure. if you please. It won't help to get excited. The ship's being searched. You'll never get off. All we ask is that you keep your cabins locked. I was afraid this might happen. How long did you expect to keep it from them? Well, naturally, I was hoping they'd never... Uh, Judith. Judith, what's wrong? Where are you going? I say, sir. What's the matter with the lady? Is she ill or something? No, no. I... Please, let me pass, will you? Of course, sir. I'm sorry, but she certainly did run off, didn't she? <laughs> she almost acted as if you were the blooming killer. <laughs> Stowaway, a killer, hiding somewhere in the dark recesses of the ship, or is he hiding? In the mind of Judith Webster, certain pieces of the puzzle seem to fit into place. What was intuition now becomes apprehension, an apprehension that builds and spreads like a slow stain into that fragmentary realm of imagination where deeply sink the twisted roots of obsession. In just a moment, we return to our story. Returning now to our journey through darkness, starring Ruth Warwick. Somewhere on the deep black waters of the Atlantic, a ship flies her way toward the haven of New York. But a ship on which lurks a nameless terror. There is a murderer on board, a killer, not listed on the person's sheet. But in the mind of Judith Webster... There is a mounting suspicion of his identity. But strangely, she has little power to reveal the thoughts that are tucked away in the closet of her mind. For try as she may, she cannot dispel the forces of a powerful obsession. I'll never know why I left the dining salon without telling them. Certainly there could no longer be any doubt. It was all too clear. That loose canvas covering in the lifeboat. The way he'd been standing there. Even the name he had given me. Alan Bruce. I saw it later. The regular passenger list. He must have killed the real Alan Bruce and thrown him overboard. Taking not only his name, but his stateroom and his clothes. But also fantastic. Worse than anything else, I'd almost fallen in love with him. He knew that, I'm certain. That was why he was so confident that I wouldn't tell anyone. And I didn't. Not even when I spoke to the first officer about... about my promise to Mrs. Prescott. I wanted to... I'll arrange it for early tomorrow morning, ma'am. Most of the passengers will be asleep. Thank you. I suppose it's rather unusual, but... 
Then Mrs. Prescott was an unusual woman. Uh, I haven't conducted a burial at sea since the last war, ma'am. However, I'm not entirely unprepared. The company official spoke to me about this before sailing. Hey, don't worry, Miss Webster. The ceremony will be in order, ma'am. Thank you. Good day. I wish you hadn't done that. <gasps> oh, I'm sorry. I seem to have a habit of startling you. What do you want? How long have you been here? Long enough to overhear your conversation with the first officer. You had no right... Please. I know what you're going to say. I had no right to listen. However, it's fortunate I did. What do you mean? I didn't know Mrs. Prescott was to be buried at sea. No one knew it. But it was her last wish. I promised her it would be carried out. And tomorrow morning you're keeping that promise. Yes. Now, if you'll excuse me, I don't feel very well. I'd like to... Uh, wait. Please, Judith. You've been avoiding me, haven't you? Yes, I have. I hope it's only because you've been upset. About Mrs. Prescott, I mean. That's one reason. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I almost thought we, we were beginning to become very good friends. You know, you're the only person on board I can trust. You're very sure about that, aren't you? Of course. You know who I am and what I'm doing on this ship. And yet you've told no one. I've wanted to. I know. Women were never meant to keep secrets. However, I'm going to ask you to keep one more. I'd rather not. I'm sorry, I must include you in this. You see, it requires a change in your plans. So they'll fit in with mine. I'm afraid I don't understand. It's very simple. Judith, this may upset you. But I must ask that you tell them you've changed your mind. That you don't want Mrs. Prescott buried at sea. What? You remember what they said. Even if they couldn't find the stowaway, he'd never get off the ship. He could get off. Very easily. If you'd allow him to take Mrs. Prescott's place in that casket. In the casket? Yes. Clever. Clever? Well, not every man would think of it. Simple as it may seem. Everyone searching the ship, questioning each passenger. And all the while, the man they were seeking would be safe inside the casket. He'd have only to wait patiently until the ship docks, then be hoisted from the hold, lowered to the pier, and be taken away in a funeral car. When he was discovered by the funeral attendants? Oh, I'm sure they'd be so shocked that the dead coming to life, he'd have little trouble. Stop it. Stop it, do you hear? If you haven't any respect for the dead, I'm afraid I have. Oh, Mrs. Prescott, you mean. I should have told you that part of it. Her last wish has already been carried out. You see... Her body was removed from the casket the night we sailed. Mrs. Prescott is already buried at sea. You've thought of everything, haven't you? In my position, one must. I remained in my cabin all that day. The next. I was afraid to see him again. I can't explain the strange fascination he held over me. Remember how, how surprised the first officer looked when I told him I'd changed my mind about the burial. It was as if he sensed the truth. As if he knew Mrs. Prescott's body wasn't in that casket. It was empty. Of course, it was only my imagination. My sense of guilt for this terrible wrong I was doing. sailed into New York Harbor. I went out on deck. He was standing there, near the port rail. I went up to him. He turned and, and smiled, as if he'd been expecting me. Oh, there you are, Judith. I've missed you. I haven't been under the weather, have you? No. I've been perfectly well. You've had me worried not showing up for dinner. You know, I've come to depend on you. Yes, I know. I've decided not to let you get away from me. After this is all over, we you, must... You haven't much time. No. And this may not be easy. Wish me luck. Haven't I done more than that already? Yes, of course. Only, I mean like this, Judith. Suddenly, as he had taken me in his arms, 
He released me. And I remained there by the rail. He hurried away. I watched as the ship moved on into the harbor under the guidance of the tugboat. Their shrill, insistent little whistles. I listened to the shouts of the crew, the longshoremen. Soon we were alongside the pier, and the steward was shouting from the head of the gangway. And then, then I saw it. The casket. We were lowering it toward the pier. There was a car waiting, a long black car. And suddenly I, I realized what I'd done. What a fool I'd been. What a cowardly, frightened little fool. Wait! Stop them! Don't let them do it! Don't let them! You mustn't touch that casket. There's something wrong. Huh? Hey, what's the matter with you, lady? Get out of the way, will you? Oh, please, there's a man in there alive. He's hiding. Sure, sure. Hide and go see he's playing in a coffin. Go on, lady. We've got work to do. Slam those doors tight, Eddie. Please, you must listen to me. If you want, I'll call the police. Someone has to stop you. Did I hear you call the police? Oh, yes, please. These men won't listen to me, but there's a man hiding in that casket. Of course there is. We put him in there, Judy. What did you say? I said we put him in there. Or rather, we let him walk right into our trap. Oh, but are you trying to tell me there's someone else in that casket? Well, surely you're not trying to say you thought I was in there. Who else? Who else? Why, the killer, of course. The killer? The, the black house killer. But then he's getting away. You're letting him get away. No, Judith. Those men know who's inside that casket. And they know right where to take him. They're detectives. Detectives? You know, Judith, for someone who helped plan this entire thing, you're acting very strangely. I'm acting strangely. It's almost as if you didn't know who I am at all. But I... I don't. What? I said I don't know you. I still don't. But the night I dropped my billfold, I I thought surely... All I learned that night was your real name. Charles Drew. Oh, oh, would you mind telling me what's going on? It's all quite simple, Judith. I thought you'd learned of my affiliation with Scotland Yard when you had my billfold. Then all this time you've been trailing the killer. Right. We had a tip-off. He might be on the ship. When I discovered the loose lifeboat covering, I was certain of it. Then Alan Brewster, he wasn't murdered at all. He never existed. You know, detectives never travel under their own names. It just isn't done. Oh, no. No, everything has to be done the hard way. I suppose that's why you couldn't just find the killer and arrest him on board. Oh, no, no, hardly. You see, I couldn't find him. Searched the ship from top to bottom. I guess he really would have given me the slip if I hadn't looked in the casket. He was hiding there all the time? No, at that time it was empty. Well, I, I don't get it. Neither did I at first. And I began to wonder why he would remove Mrs. Prescott's body from her casket, unless it was part of some plan. And? And I decided that it was. A weird, yet thoroughly clever plan. Remember I told you not every man would think of it? Yes. Yes, you did say that. He had only to wait patiently until the ship docked. Then, at the last minute, slip into the castle. And be hoisted out of the hold onto the pier and be taken away in a funeral car. Oh, it's fantastic. And you think I... Oh, John. I nearly wrecked everything. I thought you were the killer. No wonder you avoided me. Oh, I was so darn mixed up. I, I thought I knew so much. Oh, it's my fault, darling. I overestimated you. Oh, Kiss me, child. Will you? Oh. Hey. What was I saying? I underestimated you. I wasn't so mixed up after all. How do you mean? That kiss, darling. That kiss. Oh, you may not know it, dear, but in some ways you are a killer. <laughs> A little knowledge is a dangerous thing, and combined with a sharp knife of suspicion, it destroys all logic and clarity. But how odd it is that one obsession may quickly turn into another, that the killer looking somewhere in the shadows has now become a lover in the bright light of day. The stowaway that was one obsession is now Charles Drew, who will we hope forevermore remain in the mind of Judith Webster as an entirely different kind of obsession. In just a moment, I'll be back with a preview of next week's story.
Now, for a brief on next week's story. A story of a murder that took place only in a man's mind. A nameless dread from which there was no escape. Each moment of next week's thrill-packed story starring Philip Terry will hold you breathless in anticipation of the strange outcome when you listen to... Obsession. This story, starring Ruth Warwick, was produced and transcribed by C.P. McGregor in Hollywood. There is, it is said, but a thin line demarking the same from the insane. A line over which many stumble while groping from the ever-elusive shadows of a mad obsession. Fears, hates, jealousies, loves, these are all kindred things of human emotion, as we are about to prove in this story starring Philip Terry, the story of a man who crossed the line from whence there is no returning in his mad flight to escape the horrors of his own obsession. moments in the tortured life of Norton Roberts. Times when the brilliant flare of reality stabs through the haze of his mist-enveloped mind. And during these times, he has but one desire, to repeat over and over again with a terrible urgency the ironic story of a retribution that destroyed him and everything he possessed. The story of a nameless terror from which there was no escape. For no one can escape the swift, clinging tendrils of a mad obsession. Yes. Yes, I want you to hear my story. I've told it several times now. I 
I believe I can repeat it and without leaving out any details. Mm. I know I won't omit Claire. She meant so much to me. Mm. So very much. Mm. Why, it seems only yesterday that she came walking down the corridor at the investment company and into my office. Claire! Oh, hello, Norton, dear. Hope you don't mind my walking in on you. Well, you know I don't. Busy? The president of an investment firm is never busy. With a big company behind him, he can well afford to hire good assistants to do all the work. Well, you've certainly hired all the experts on Wall Street, then. What do you mean? Just that I've read the semi-annual report of Worthington and Company. There seems to be no end to the amount of money you... Or rather, your hired assistants are earning for the firm. That's our job. But it's not your job to kill yourself working so hard. It's not that bad, Claire. Yes, it is, Norton, and you know it. This job killed my father. And I don't want the same thing to happen to you. What would you suggest? Why don't you retire? You mean you want someone else in this position? It's not that I have anybody in mind, Norton. It's just that I think you've worked too hard all your life and you're entitled to a rest. At my age, Claire, I'm only 35. Of course, to a 26-year-old girl, that must sound quite elderly. That's not what I meant, Norton. Then what are you driving at? I'd like to sell out. Sell out? That's right. My father's been dead exactly one year. You've already increased the seven million dollars he left to me to more than ten. Is that bad? That's just it. It's good. I've got more money than I'll ever need. And you, you're a millionaire in your own right. It isn't the money, Claire. A man has to have something to do. And you insist on working? Call it that. All right, then. Sign these papers. What's this? New incorporation papers. You know, I thought you'd be stubborn and not want to retire, so I had these drawn up. Just put your name on the dotted line, and then the firm of Worthington and Company becomes Worthington and Roberts. Oh. But, Claire... No I... buts about it, Norton. As long as you're going to run this business, then by everything that's right, you should be a full-fledged partner. <laughs> Not just a figurehead of one of the oldest investment houses in America, but an active partner. That meant I had prestige, power, everything. That is, nearly everything I wanted. That night, celebrating the merger of Worthington and Roberts, Claire joined me at my penthouse. After dinner, we stood on the terrace looking out over the city. I never knew that... that New York could be so... <laughs> well, finish it. So empty... Oh, Norton, you're teasing. Look at the city. The lights, the people, the traffic. It's anything but empty. You're wrong, Claire. Look at me. You call your life empty? Yes, dear. Without anyone to share it. Without you to share it. But, Norton... And Claire, you must have known. Yes, I've known. For a very long time. But... But What? I feel so differently toward you. Like... like a brother. Is that why you were so interested in my welfare? Oh, it's more than that, Norton. I wish I could explain my feelings. Is there someone else? Oh. I see. I should have known. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't want to hurt you, not for the world. But for the longest time, I didn't know which one I loved most. Then that makes our merger purely a business one. Yes, Norton, I'm afraid so. When it comes to the heart, you are second choice. Second choice. Norton Roberts, the most eligible bachelor in New York. Second choice with the one girl he wanted. Suddenly the thought struck me. Who was first choice? I... I couldn't help thinking, what if such a person had never come into Claire's life? What if such a person didn't exist? Yes? Hello, Claire? Oh, hello, Norton. I called you to say goodbye. Goodbye? I'm going on a vacation. Oh. Well, it was your idea. You said I was working too hard. Well, where are you going? Hunting in Montana for one whole month. Will you ride? Oh, not a chance. I'm going off with a guide away from civilization. But how can I get in touch with you if anything important comes up? Oh, don't worry. Nothing will come up. I've attended to everything. Change will do me good. But, Norton, won't I see you tomorrow? I'm afraid not, Claire. I'm leaving tonight. Yes. I was going.
going hunting all right. But not for mountain lions or bears or coyotes. I was going hunting for a man. Murder was my game. Just as I'd hired men to do my other work, I planned to hire someone to commit that murder for me. Three days later in San Francisco, I learned that the man I wanted to see was Victor Corrin. Come in. Are you Victor Corrin? Who are you? My name is uh, Walter Bradshaw. That's not your name. But never mind about that. What do you want? I want you to murder a man. Yeah? Look. This is a legitimate business deal. My assets happen to be cash. Yours happen to be, shall we say, brawn. Who sent you here? Nobody. I've been around. I know you're a front man to break up strikes, start riots, to do anything for whichever side pays you most. You know a lot for a stranger. I know the stakes are high. And I'm willing to pay $15,000 for a man's life. Who's the man? I don't know. Now, wait a minute, mister. I don't know what your game now, is. Now, wait but... a minute. Let me explain. Somebody is going to marry Claire Worthington and... You mean the heir to the late King of Wall Street? That's the girl. I want you to kill the man who marries her. And you don't know who he is? No. But no matter who he is, kill him. Why do you want him murdered? You'll be well paid for eliminating the man, not for knowing the reasons why. Is it a deal? Well, how am I to It'll know... It'll be in all the newspapers when she gets married. The method of murder and the time I'll leave to your discretion. Well... It'll cost you another fifteen grand. Fifteen thousand more. That's what I said. This fifteen is my share for giving the orders. The others will be for the killer. I see. And who will that be? That'll be my business. Yes. Yes, of course. Suppose I pay you, say, after the murder has taken place? In this line, we always get paid in advance. Especially when we deal with guys like you who hide their identity. But I don't have that kind of money with me. Well, then get it. <laughs> Very well. Here you are. Well, had it all along. <laughs> Smart business. Man. I've been called that. Anyway, there you are. Another fifteen thousand five tens and twenties. Yeah, good enough. Okay, mister. It's a deal. How will I know that That I've carried out my part? You'll read it in the papers after Claire Worthington gets hitched. Unless you want a written receipt for one murder paid in full. That night I was on the train. Before we got to Chicago, I... I knew that if Victor Corrin sent one of his thugs to trail me for a bit of blackmail, I'd successfully eluded him. Not too long afterwards, I was safely back in New York. I went to Claire's apartment. Norton. Of all people, Norton Roberts. Claire, dear, remember me? Oh, a sight for lonesome eyes. When did you get back? This minute. Haven't even been home. Oh, it was sweet of you to come here first. Well, come on in. I was just going to have some coffee. <laughs> now, sit down. Tell me all about your trip. Well, it was very dull. Slept, ate, walked. Catch anything? No. Set a few traps, that was about all. Oh, you're too chicken-hearted to kill a rabbit. You can't fool me. It was a good change of scene, anyway. You know, I'm glad you went away, Norton. It was your suggestion. No, I didn't mean that. I'm glad you went away because it made me realize how much I depend on oh, you. Oh, don't be silly, Claire. Anybody could carry on the business. I'm not talking about the business. I'm talking about me. Claire. It's the truth, Norton. I knew after you left how much you meant to me. And how much I loved you. But, but this other fellow, the one who was first choice. There never was another fellow. I just had to be sure, that's all. Your first choice, Norton. If you still want me. Well, darling, of course I want you. More than anything or anyone in the world. Well, then let's not wait. <laughs> Dear, we can't jump into this. Well, why not? Are you trying to stall oh, me? Oh, don't talk that way, Claire. You know I want to marry you. Only, only right now... Well, what can possibly stand I, in our way? I, I've... I've got to go to San Francisco on business. Wait, it's so important that it can't wait until we get married? Yes, yes, it's very important it can't wait. I've got to dash off to San Francisco. I'll fly there tomorrow morning. We go together, Norton. No, no, we can't do that. I... Darling, you can't put me off. What do you say? Do we get married in the morning and go to San Francisco together, or... Very well, Claire. We'll get married in the morning. <laughs> Norton Roberts? 
The man Claire marries is to be murdered. Remember? Murdered for a price. The price you paid. And tomorrow, the headlines in San Francisco will put the finger on the man you wanted dead. Think fast, Norton Roberts. And outwit, if you can, the clever scheming of your own obsession. In just a moment, we return to our story. twist in the life of Norton Roberts and his now imperative obsession to change the outcome of our story starring Philip Terry. It is the rightful privilege of a woman to change her mind, but in so doing she oft times causes the undoing of the best laid skeins of plans and schemes and sometimes the undoing of the schemer himself. It was a grim bargain Norton Roberts made. A bargain with death itself. And in his mind, the panic grows and builds, becomes insurmountable. He must live. He must escape. Life, his life, must be bought back at any price. Living now is his only obsession. My bargain in murder had taken an ironic twist. You see, I'd arranged for the murder of the man who was going to marry Claire Worthington, never dreaming that Claire would change her mind at the last minute and, and marry me. Now, combining a honeymoon with what Claire thought was business, I had to hurry back to San Francisco to try to change the pattern of my design for murder. It... It wasn't easy making explanations to Cleo when I dropped her at the hotel, but I managed it, and then I told the cab driver to take me to a waterfront address. That's it. Over there, driver, on the other side of the street. Uh, this the place, mister? Across the street, I said. Well, if you take my advice, you'll stay away from that joint. It's being watched. By whom? With the cops. They're hot after the killer. Somebody murdered? Somebody murdered, he asked me. Victor Corrin was bumped off this morning. Victor? Corrin? Yeah. And they got away with $15,000 that he was carrying. Do they know who did it? Yeah, the cops don't. But the grapevine has it that it was one of his own men pulling a double cross. You better stay clear of that joint, sir. There may be fireworks. Uh, back to the hotel? Yes. Victor Corrin was dead. And since he had only $15,000, that meant he had already paid off the murderer. The murderer who was after me. Somebody was going to kill me. Somebody, it could be anybody, like the taxi. Yes. Yes, it could be the taxi driver. Why are you stopping here? Traffic light. In San Francisco, the red light means stop. Oh. A uh, boy... Oh. Uh, give me a morning paper. Yeah, thanks. That taxi driver. He knew too much about Corrin and the money. He, he didn't want me to go up there. How do I know Victor Corrin was murdered? How do I know that the taxi driver wasn't plotting against me? I watched him closely, and then I noticed through the rearview mirror that he was looking at me. 
But I was ready for him. Yes, I was ready when he suddenly half turned and said, Say, you're Norton Roberts, aren't you? No, no. Hey, 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 look out. Don't, 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 don't. How do you feel now, Norton? Fine. That, that taxi driver, he tried to kill me. Oh, that's nonsense. Then what am I doing in this hospital? Darling, you were hit by an automobile. I was. Not hard, thank goodness. The car's crashed to save you. Let's get out of here. Well, it'll be a day or two before you get over your shock. Then you'll be perfectly all right to attend to your business. I've finished with my business. Let's go back to New York. All right, Norton. We'll go back to New York tomorrow or the day after. Who's that? Well, take it easy, darling. It's probably the doctor or nurse. I'll see. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Oh, hello, driver. Won't, won't you come in? Uh, thanks. Uh, how do you feel this morning, Mr. Roberts? How did you know I was Norton Roberts? Well, your picture. It was in the front page of the morning paper. Oh. Oh, I was afraid of that. And the next time somebody recognizes you, you don't have to jump. Yeah, especially on a moving taxis. It's bad business. Is your car wrecked? Yes, ma'am. The other driver really smacked it up trying to keep from running over Mr. Roberts. Well, we'll handle the expenses, of course. You don't have to worry. Oh, gee, th thank you, ma'am. You can drive me to the hotel and I'll give you a check. Darling, now you just rest comfortably and I'll be right back. Oh, you can't leave me here alone. The hospital is well staffed with doctors and nurses. Where are you going? To arrange for a trip back to New York. Claire. What is it? Will you... Will you charter a private plane for just the two of us? Yes, Norton. I'll charter a private plane. I didn't trust anyone. Before we left San Francisco, I made them change the pilots. For all I knew, one of the pilots might have been my killer. The only thing I was sure of was that somebody was going to murder me, and I had to get to him before he got to me. Why do you look at me like that? I was just thinking... thinking what? How much you've changed since you went hunting that day. Nonsense. It's excitement coming back, getting married, flying across the country. Man doesn't do that every day, you know. I should hope not. Now, don't you worry about me. As soon as we get back to New York, I'll... I'll be myself again. Norton, I want you to do me a favor. Anything. I want you to see Dr. Armstrong. What for? Your nerves. There's nothing wrong with my nerves, nothing. You're as jittery I'm not as jittery. You... Yes, you are. Besides, you promised me you'd do whatever I asked. For heaven's sake, Claire, don't treat me like a child. Well, I'm only thinking of you, dear. It's up to a wife to make her husband happy, you know. That was a fine one. She... She only wanted to make her husband happy. <laughs> if I hadn't married her, I'd have been all right. Perfectly all right. What is it? Mrs. Roberts? Yes? I am Sperber, the new butler, ma'am. Oh, yes. Uh, come in. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Come along with me. Yes, madam. Can you cook by any chance? Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, but I don't as a rule, ma'am. Well, I, I met just for tonight. You see, we're hiring an entire new household staff, and the others won't be here until tomorrow. I, I understand, ma'am. There'll be just the two of us, Mr. Roberts and myself, for dinner. Um, think you can find everything? Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, just leave everything to me. You're not eating very much, Norton. I'm not hungry. There must be something troubling me. Nothing's you. troubling me. Who's the new butler? His name is Spurgeon. Yes, I know, but where does he come from? Santa Barbara, I think. The West Coast? Well, what's so terrible about that? How can you let a strange man in the house without even knowing one little thing about him? Well, darling, he had references. They checked on him at the agency where I always get my servants. Oh, shh. Here he comes. The soup was very good, Sperber. Oh, uh, thank you, ma'am. What's that? This, sir? Why, it's meatloaf, sir. What's in it? Ground sirloin, breadcrumbs, onions, tomato sauce. What else? Well, 
The salt and pepper, sir. And poison? Norton. I... I don't understand, it's sir. Very simple. I ask you a question. Is there any poison in that meatloaf? No, sir. Of course there isn't. Then eat some of it. Well, begging your pardon, sir, I've already had my dinner. Well, you see, you're afraid to taste it. Then it is poison. Oh, Norton, Norton, please. Answer me. It is poison, isn't it? I... I was wrong about that butter. But I couldn't take any chances. Not with him or any of the other servants. It was the same way at the office. And my secretary left me. I interviewed a dozen girls before I hired one I could trust. Because my killer could be a woman. That, that's the way it was with me for days, weeks, months. I didn't know what to do until... Until I saw him. A man trailing me. In the morning, when I got into my limousine, he was lounging nonchalantly across the street. If I looked out of my office window, I could see him down by the main entrance. The killer had found me at last. Someday, very soon, he would strike. I had to get away anywhere. I took all the cash I could find in the safe, walked out of the office in the middle of the day. I went down the back stairs, didn't use the elevator, came out in the street at the rear of the building, and there I yelled for a cab. Taxi! Taxi! Look, I want you to take me to... Oh, you have a passenger. It's okay. I don't mind sharing the cab. Get in. No. No, I know who you are. Get in. I'll drop you off. Where do you want to go? The... the... To Wall Street. But you just came from there. How do you know? I know a lot about you, Mr. Roberts. Then... Then you know that I'm married to Claire Worthington. I should. Look, I'll, I'll give you money. Fifty thousand, a hundred thousand. Here I have a lot of cash. There's more. If you leave me alone. But, Mr. Roberts, I'm not trying to do... Leave me alone, do you hear? Leave me alone. Mr. Roberts. Leave me alone. Don't kill me. Don't kill me. Don't kill me. Thank you very much for your services. I'll have the check sent to your office. Uh, thanks, Mrs. Roberts. Oh, uh, that's the Coronet Detective Agency. Yes. Um, Will you need any further reports? No. The doctors say there isn't any doubt that my husband's insane. I... I guess not. Does he still keep telling that ridiculous story? Oh, to everyone who will listen. He just finished telling it to his nurse again. The, uh, the poor devil. Yes. It makes it doubly hard because... Norton was such a good man. Such a good man, Claire? Perhaps. But the punishment fits the crime as it always must. The escape was made, but into a shadowy realm from which there is no further escape, a realm created from his own device, the tortured labyrinth of a mad obsession. In just a moment, I'll be back with a preview of next week's story. tell you the story of a man whose life meant less to him than his house. A man with an obsession so overpowering that he was willing to murder his best friend. 
drive the woman he professed to love insane rather than lose a monument he had built to himself. You will live every moment of next week's story as you follow John Loder in the role of Norman Marshall through the twisting, devious pathways of a homicidal maze when you listen to... Obsession. Tonight's story starring Philip Terry was produced and transcribed by C.P. McGregor in Hollywood. Of course, we just had a run of bad luck. Why, last winter I... Hold on. What is it? There, ahead. Did you see those branches move? Where? Is your gun loaded, Christine? Yes. It's that shot we've been waiting for. Go ahead, you take first crack. I don't see it. Shh. The bush. That bush to the left of the big tree. Oh. Hurry up. All right. Good shot. I think you got it. Come on. Oh, God. Wait, wait for me, Lord. Come on, Christine. Here we are, we... Lloyd! Oh! Oh, Lloyd! It's Martin. Good afternoon. I came to inquire about... I'm sorry, we're not interviewing reporters. This has all been a terrible shock to Mrs. Holliday, and she's unable to see anyone. Wait a minute. I'm not a reporter. No? No, I'm answering the ad in the newspaper in regard to your selling the house. Oh, well, come in. Thank you. We've been swamped with snoopers and reporters all week long. It's been rather difficult. I'm Dr. Foster, Mrs. Holliday's physician. Glad to know you, Dr. Foster. I'm Norman Marshall. 
Not Norman Marshall, the writer. I'm afraid so. Well, this is a pleasure, Mr. Marshall. I'm one of your most devoted readers. Well, thank you very much. Now, um, as to the estate, I believe I can tell you all you wish to know. Well, there's scarcely much I need know. I've seen innumerable pictures of the Holiday House and the Sunday Rotor Gravure. Now, regarding price... The price is as advertised. Mm Mm-hmm. And servants. Would they be available to a new owner? I'm sorry, no. You see, since Martin Holiday's death, I've had to discharge them. Mrs. Holiday is in a very delicate condition requiring absolute quiet. It was imperative that no one remain in the house who might disturb her in any way. Oh, breakdown? Um, Something of the sort, yes. Well, that's a shame. The entire affair has been quite tragic. But to get back, Mr. Marshall... Hmm? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> the uh, library here, uh, Dr. Foster, this was Mr. Holiday? Yes. He appears to have quite a number of rare works. This one here, for example, I don't believe I've seen this in... I should prefer you not to handle the books, please, Mr. Marshall. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I, I think the library is not for sale. None of the furnishings. Perhaps if we discuss the uh, satisfactory price in a few of these editions? I've just told you, Mr. Marshall, the furnishings are not for sale. And Mrs. Holliday's instructions. Did you call me, Lloyd? Christine, what are you doing here? You're not well enough to be up and around just yet. Don't you think you'd better go back to your room? No. No, it's so warm there. I wanted some fresh air. Who is this? This is Norman Marshall, Christine. How do you do, Mr. Marshall? I'm Mrs. Holliday. Very happy to know you, Miss Holiday. Mr. Marshall is considering buying the estate. Yes, seems to be an ideal place for a person in my line of work. Line of work? Mm-hmm. I'm a writer. A writer? Oh, that's very nice. You know, it's funny, I used to wish I were a writer. I think I still do. There's so many things I could write mm, about. Christine? <laughs> Christine, I'll help you back to your room. No, no, it's quite all right. I, I, can, I can manage. Good day, Mr. Marshall. Uh, uh, good day, Mrs. Holliday. You must forgive some of the things she says, Mr. Marshall. She, uh, she doesn't realize. Well, she didn't seem to say anything wrong. Yes? Well, nevertheless. Now, about the house. The house? Oh, yes, the house. <laughs> well, I'll take it. Oh. <laughs> well, fine. I'll draw you up a check. And by the way, I'll have to ask a favor of you. Well, certainly. What is it? I had a bit of car trouble down the road, and it doesn't seem to be any service stations out this way. I wonder if you'd mind driving me back into town. Oh, I'd like to, but I'm afraid I can't. We haven't a car on the estate. No? No, they're in storage. Oh, I see. Well, I hate to ask, but do you think you could put me up someplace for the night? Oh, I'm afraid it's impossible. Oh, (laughs) well, I'm sorry, then. Oh, that is, uh, I didn't quite mean it in the way I said. After all, we couldn't very well turn you out when you practically own the house, could we? I don't know, could you? You'll find a guest room at the head of the stairs, Mr. Marshall. You're welcome to stay. Good evening. Good evening to you. Oh, good morning, Miss Holiday. Oh, good morning, Miss... Oh, I'm sorry. It's Marshall. Norman Marshall. Of course. Forgive me. <laughs> That's one of my worst habits. I never can remember a name. Fine morning, isn't it? Yes, it's beautiful. I thought I'd pick some roses for my room. Do you like roses, Mr. Marshall? Very much. I planted them myself. Martin used to like roses. Martin... Can I... Can I help you? No, no, thank you. I'm, I'm unfinished. I think I'll go in now. Oh, wait. Mrs. Holliday. What is it? I wanted to talk to you. There was something... Oh, I'm sorry. Lloyd says I'm not well enough to talk to anyone yet. Lloyd's my physician. Yes, I know. That's one of the things I wanted to ask you about. Look, uh, couldn't we take a little stroll? Lloyd might not approve. He might say it's bad for him. Oh, I'm sure it'll be all right. Well, all right then. We can walk in the garden if you like. It's a very attractive garden. I like the forest out there, too. Seems to add something. Forest? I despise the forest. Oh? We were hunting. We were hunting. Floyd said it was there in the clump of trees. It wasn't that I meant to. No, I didn't mean to. Much was with us and he kept barking. Well, look now, Mrs. Holiday, I wouldn't... There, there, you hear it? I can hear it. Well, of course, it's there. the dog. I can hear it because it's playing. I can hear it. Now, Mrs. Holiday, don't run off. Mrs. Holiday. Mr. Marshall.
Marshal. Oh, Dr. Foster. Hello. Mr. Marshal, I've tried to show you every courtesy, and I'd appreciate it if you'd at least grant me the same consideration. Something wrong? Mrs. Holliday and I have made arrangements to turn over the estate to you by the end of the week at the latest. Until then, I must ask you to leave. Well, pardon me for asking, but why the bums rush? If you mean the reason for my asking you to leave, I think that's pretty obvious. I've already explained to you that Mrs. Holliday is a very sick woman desperately in need of complete rest and relaxation. She doesn't seem so terribly ill. Confused, I believe, is a better word. I believe as a physician I'm better qualified to diagnose Mrs. Holliday's condition. It so happens that she is suffering from a rather complex neurosis brought about by the shock of her husband's death. I don't know what you were discussing with her in the garden this morning. However, I do know that since then she has suffered a complete relapse. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. I, I didn't mean to upset her. It's my duty to see that you don't have another opportunity. Oh, oh Martin. Oh, Martin. Christine, stop it. Stop it, you hear me? Go to sleep now. Just go to sleep. Hello? Cedar Grove Sanitarium? May I speak to Dr. Cameron, please? Hello? Oh, hello, Arthur. I'm sorry to bother you this time of night. Yes, I'm afraid it's happened. I'm bringing Mrs. Holliday to Cedar Grove tomorrow evening. You can expect us at six. Thank you, Arthur. I knew you would. Uh, good night. Foster? What are you doing here? Foster, you wouldn't take her to Cedar Grove. I've just made the arrangement. But that... That's an asylum. We doctors prefer to call it a rest home. Good night, Mr. Marshall. In the best of definitions, the word asylum means a place of rest, of safety. But in the case of Mrs. Holliday, we can only wonder about Dr. Foster's definition of the word. And yet, he has made no outward move that could imply anything but the best of uh, intentions. And yet, in the mind of Norman Marshall, and in that Holiday house, there is a static something, a strange undercurrent, that can only result from some sort of an obsession. Returning now to the mystery starring John Loder. Norman Marshall spent a wakeful night in the guest room of Holiday House, a night through which marched a parade of disturbing thoughts like tickets in a fence. And always the question, like the beat of a pulse, why, why, why? And then, as the gray shroud of dawn presaged the coming light of day, Norman Marshall watched Dr. Forrest drive away from the holiday house in a car that should not have been there, a car that was in storage. And again, Thoughts raced through his mind, and he knew that somewhere within this house was the answer to some terrifying problem of obsession. Miss Lloyd, come in. Yes, Mrs. Lloyd, I didn't sleep very well last night. I wish... Oh, Mr. Marshall. Mrs. Holliday. I'm not supposed to talk to you, Mr. Marshall. Lloyd said I might... I'll only take a moment of your time, Mrs. Holliday. There's something I'd like to ask you. There's nothing I can say to you. I'm not well. I wish you'd go. Who said you weren't well? Lloyd's trying to help me. You're not trying to help me at all. Mrs. Holliday, where did Dr. Foster get the car he drove away in this morning? Car? Lloyd has his own car. Has he had it on the estate? Did he have it the day before yesterday? Of course. He uses it to go into town for groceries and to get medicine for me. But what medicine? These tablets here? Yes, they're sedatives. The strange-looking sedatives. You mustn't take those. Why are you tasting them? They're for me. Lloyd gives them to me to quiet my nerves. Really? These are soda tablets, Mrs. Holliday. I, I don't understand. Neither do I. But I believe I'm beginning to. 
What do you mean? Frankly, Mrs. Holliday, I'm inclined to think that your Dr. Foster is doing you considerably more harm than good. I wouldn't say that, Mr. Marshall. Foster. Oh, Lloyd, I, I was I just... believe that will be enough company for you this morning, Christine. You'd better go back to bed. Yes, Lloyd, I... As for you, Mr. Marshall, it appears to be getting quite a habit with us, my asking you to leave. Uh, yes, I suppose it is. Get out, please. Uh, Foster, I... Get out! Mr. Marshall, what are you doing in here? And what are you doing with that gun? I've, uh, just been looking through Mr. Holliday's collection. He seems to have been quite a connoisseur of firearms. This is a fine gun here. Yes. Now, will you be good enough to put it back where you got it? Uh, this, uh, wouldn't happen to be the gun that caused the accident, would it? I couldn't say. It has Mrs. Holliday's initials on it. Really? Well, surely you should remember what... My memory is excellent, Mr. Marshall, thank you. And if it will help to satisfy your curiosity... Yes, that was the gun used by Mrs. Holliday when the tragedy occurred. Well, how interesting. Perhaps this will interest you more. Mrs. Holliday and I are leaving this afternoon. Cedar Grove? Yes. And in regard to your purchase of the estate... Mm-hmm. What about it? Well, I'm afraid I'm going to be rather tied up for the next few days. I doubt if I'll have the opportunity to draw you up a bill of sale, and so I thought you'd like to have your check back until we can work out the details. All right. Well... I'd better go along upstairs and get a few things together. I trust you've been able to have your car repaired. Uh, yes, yes, I have. Oh, and I noticed this morning that uh, you got yours out of storage. Yes, yes, I'll have to drive Mrs. Holliday. Well, drop back after the weekend, Mr. Marshall. I believe we'll have the house in order for you then. Oh, and uh, please don't forget to replace that gun before you leave. Goodbye. Goodbye, Foster. <laughs> Mrs. Holliday? Who's there? It's I, Mr. Marshall. Open the door, please. But I... It's very important. Please open the door, quick. I, I can't. Lloyd locked it. I'll come around through the garden. Meet me at the window. All right. Can't you understand? I'm trying to help you. Cedar Grove is an asylum, you say. I'm not insane, am I? Oh, of course not. But he's a physician. He'll say things about you that, well, they'll be difficult to deny. Why would Lloyd want to do a thing like that to me? He's been so kind and understanding. Except... Except what? Well, some night he comes to my room and talks to me about Martin and the accident. I've asked him not to because, I don't know, I just go all to pieces. But Lloyd says it does me good to hear about it, but eventually it'll make me forget. Is that why you screamed last night? Did I scream? Oh, I didn't know. I, I never know anything after he's finished talking. He talks about the dog barking and the way Martin looked. And, and then I can hear the shots again, just as though I... The shots? Yes. There was more than one shot? Oh, please, I can't. Mrs. Holliday. Mrs. Holliday, how many shots were there? Two. You're certain of that? Yes, yes. Do you have more than one gun with your initials on it? No. Were you using that particular gun at the time? Yes, yes, I was. Why do you... I was just looking at that gun. Only one barrel's been discharged. That was the shot I fired. You fired one shot, yet you heard two. Where was the other shot from? Oh, I don't know. Lloyd was standing... Lloyd. Where was he standing? Behind me, I think. How is your marksmanship, Mrs. Holliday? Well, I, I was just learning. It was my second time out. I see. May I use your telephone? Marshal, I thought you'd gone. Well, I, I was waiting for you. I wanted to talk to you. I'm sorry, I haven't time. Mrs. Holliday and I are late now. I see you've taken that gun down again. Will you kindly put it back? Uh, not just yet. You know, I have a suspicion. Oh, it's only a suspicion, you understand, that 
But this may not have been the gun after all that caused the untimely death of Mr. Holliday. Mr. Marshall, I'd like to stay and chat with you, but... And then again, there's the possibility that Mr. Holliday's untimely death wasn't untimely at all. That's very interesting, I'm sure. And now, Mr. Marshall, if you will forgive me, I'm afraid I must Only be one barrel's been discharged from this gun. There's another shot left. You wouldn't happen by any chance to be threatening me. I might be. Dr. Foster, I believe you killed Martin Holliday. Well, of all the ridiculous... Mrs. Holliday tells me two shots were fired. She only fired one of the shots. Who fired the other? Mrs. Holliday is not responsible for what she said. Perhaps you might give her a soda tablet to help her remember. How did you... Perhaps you might reconstruct the accident for her every detail. Remind her the way Martin Holliday looked after he was shot. Really, Mr. Marshall, you don't think... I don't think anything, Foster. I'm going to leave that to the police. The police? They're on their way here now. Oh, I see. You've been quite thorough about this thing, haven't you? I hope so. Huh. Well, inasmuch as I'm being held captive, would it meet with your approval if I smoked? Certainly. Thank you. Uh, do you happen to have a match? Here you are. Thank you again. Tell me, Mr. Marshall, with your evidence, do you believe the police will be able to um, convict me of murder? I think so. Well, that's odd. So do I. You... You did kill Holiday? I'm afraid so. Why? It's rather a long story. Well, we... We have plenty of time. All right. This house here... It was once mine. I built it. Every dollar I could get my hands on went into the building of it. The library, the collections, everything. I bought them. By the time it was finished, most of my money was gone. But I had what I wanted. Something I'd worked all my life for. The Foster House. It was mine. Every inch of it. The only thing I'd ever owned. Then I met Martin Holliday. He was in charge of a stock and bond company. We became great friends. I had a little money. The market was doing exceptionally well at the time. And he advised you to yes. invest? Yes. I used my savings to buy some shares of stock at his suggestion. The stock failed. Martin assured me I'd be able to recover my losses if I bought on margin. I took his advice. Borrowed on my house and everything in it, but to no avail. The stock was worthless. How did he come to buy the house? He took it in exchange for my debts. My house. I was penniless and it hadn't cost him a thing. He stole the house from me. That's why I killed him. Hey, here, what are you doing, Foster? Give me that gun. No, Marshal. Stand back. There's one more shot, remember? Your cigarette. You've set fire to the draperies with it. Yes, a moment ago. And you're going to give that fire a chance, Marshal, do you hear? No, let me put it out. Christina, help me. You can't stop it. Either of you. I'd rather see my house burn to the ground than let anyone else have it. Give me... smoke. Yes, Norma. We were lucky to escape. What's that? Oh, just a scrap of paper. But an idea for a story. The Holiday House by Norman Marshall. Oh, well, couldn't have been a very happy story anyway. Is that what you want to write about? Something with happiness in it? Yes. Where will you go to find it? I knew a place once, almost halfway around the world from where we are now. It's a beautiful place. The most beautiful I've ever seen. I'd like to show it to you. The fire? It's gone out? Yes. Forever. Come along, Christine. Please. And don't ever look back. <laughs> been listening to Obsession. through the World 
worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. was it to begin with, Jake? Almost 10000 10000 Where has it gone? Where do you think? You wanted a new car, didn't you? You insisted on that trip to Tahoe last summer. You asked for this house, didn't you? Oh, so I was the one at fault. I spent the money. I suppose the next thing you'll be saying is that I instigated the whole affair. Oh, listen, Trina, we won't get anywhere this way. We've got to figure a way out. I need your help. When are the bank examiners due, Jake? Next Tuesday. Can't you cover up some way? Isn't there something you can do? Not a thing. Since that new manager's been in, I haven't had a chance. Oh, Jake. I, I don't know what to say. I, it's... It's... The word's larceny, Trina. Grand larceny. And that's how it began. That was the reason we had to do what we did. We were desperate... There didn't seem to be any way out. No way at all. Then, as though fate had planned it, a letter came. Oh, try and be nice to him, Jake. Cousin Charlie doesn't visit us often. Well, it's too often to suit me. When's he due in? Noon train tomorrow. He says we needn't bother meeting him at the station. He'll come ahead to the house. Oh, that's just dandy. I can hardly wait to hear that cheery laugh of his. Then there's the one about the two bookies who went to heaven. Have I told that to you? Is it funny? (laughs) Sure is. Well, then you haven't told it. Then I haven't told it. (laughs) Say, that's good. That's real good. Yes, that is good. Uh, uh, Cousin Charlie, Hmm? uh, I've laid out some towels for you if you want to freshen up. And your room's ready whenever you are. Oh, thanks, thanks. I guess I'll go upstairs and... Say, where's that little traveling kid of mine? Oh, over there with your suitcase. Oh, so it is. (laughs) Getting so I can't see a thing without my glasses. Think I'll take my suitcase up, too. I... Oops! Drop the kit. Oh, here, here, I'll get it, Cousin Charlie. You seem to have... Uh... Why, you seem to have a lot of money here, Charlie. Oh, kit come open, didn't it? It's in cash. Sure. Just sold a piece of property of mine in Missouri. On the way out here, some funny old codger bought it. Insisted on doing business in cash. Quite a lot of cash by the looks of it. Yep. $10,000. That's an awful lot of money to carry around. Yes, I haven't had a chance to deposit it yet. 
You know, the funny part of it is, I've been trying to get rid of that property for years. No one to touch it. Then suddenly this fellow offers me 10000 for it. Just like a present, ain't it? Yeah. Well, I guess I'll go up to my room. Good night, kids. Good night, Cousin Charlie. Good night. You know, Jay, I've been thinking, as long as Charlie has the guest room... $10,000. No... $10,000, Trina. That'd make up what I'm short at the bank. Oh, I know. I know, but I don't think... $10,000. Jake. Good Lord, Jake, you... you... Cousin Charlie's got $10,000. <laughs> Remember Charlie saying he couldn't see very well without his glasses? Yes. He's always been quite nearsighted. All right. One of us has to get our hands on those glasses. We break them. Make it appear accidental, of course. Then? I've typed this note. We'll find some way to get him to sign it. He won't know what he's signing if he can't read it. What are you going to use for the... the... Potassium cyanide. Encyclopedia says five grains are fatal. I can buy it at a photography studio in town. They use it for developing pictures. That way I don't have to sign for it. Oh, Jake, I'm frightened. No, you're not. You're not, Trina. You're not, you understand? When people get frightened, they get caught. And you remember that. But if Charlie should suspect anything... If, if, if Charlie, Charlie should what? Oh, Charlie. <laughs> Good morning. My ears are burning. And what was you saying about me? Oh, my nothing. God. Nothing at all. Oh, yes, you were. I heard you. Heard what? Heard you mention my name. Come on, what's the secret? Oh, oh, well, I was just telling Jake if he, if he could fix the water faucet, well, maybe you could. Uh, would you try before you sit down for breakfast, Charlie? It's stuck. Well, sure thing. Regular handyman, that's me. Uh, which one is it? Let's see. Uh, doesn't seem to be anything the matter with... Hey, look out. Oh, 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 dear, I've splattered your suit, haven't I? I'm so sorry. Here, take this dish, Paul. <laughs> now, let me have your glasses. I'll dry them. Oh, that's you. all right. I can do it. I... Oh, no, no, let me. I... Oh, oh. Oh, dear, look what I've gone and done. I've broken your glasses. Yes, and my only pair. Oh, I'm sorry, Charlie. I'm terribly sorry. It was later that afternoon. Jake had gone to work, and Charlie and I were on the sun porch. I had but one thought. How was I to get him to sign that note? Then, as if in answer to my question, an article in the magazine caught my eye. Here was the solution. And so simple. Cousin Charlie? Hmm? Uh, here's an interesting article. Yeah? It's about the different specimens of handwriting. It says that your entire character can be determined just by the way you sign your name. Yeah? Uh-huh. And it says if you circle your eyes instead of dotting them, you're an extrovert. <laughs> and if you don't cross your T's, you're an introvert. Uh, what are you, Charlie? An extrovert or an introvert? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, I don't go for that handwriting stuff. It's all a lot of bunk. Oh, maybe it's not. Oh, they have a chart here that explains the whole thing. Here, write your name and let me see if I can analyze your handwriting. Oh, no, Trina. I think I'd like to take a walk. Oh, it'll just take a second. Oh, some other time. Oh, now, Charlie, don't be a stick. Here, use my pen. Write your name on this piece of paper. <laughs> all right. Here. Now, are you satisfied? Uh-huh. Yes. I'm satisfied. So far, so good. Then the next step. Jake was late getting home that night. Charlie and I had finished supper and he'd gone into the living room. I was straightening up in the kitchen when I heard the car turning in the driveway. Jake came in the back door. Jake, you're late. Where have you been? The stores were jammed. I had to wait forever at the photography studio. Oh, I was worried about you. I'm sorry. Well, you could have called. I said I was sorry. You don't have to take my head off. Did you... Did you get it? Yeah. Did you get... Here. Oh, Trina, you're wonderful. I was afraid for a while. Shh. Here comes Charlie. Trina, I... Oh, Jake. Finally got home, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I just come in to say good night. Oh, oh, are you going to bed so early? Yep, yeah, got to get my beauty wings. <laughs> well, good night. Good night, cousin Charlie. Bye, Charlie. Uh, oh, Charlie. Yeah. We uh, uh, 
We're just getting ready to fix some tea, weren't we, Trina? What? Oh, oh yes, yes, we were. Why don't you join us in a cup before you turn in? Uh, no, thanks. I don't think so. Well, then maybe Trina can bring you up a cup after you get to bed. Help you to sleep. Well, okay. Bring it up when it's ready. Night. Night. What's the idea of the tea? Oh, Trina. You... You mean now? Sure, it's perfect. Can't you see? I'll put the water on. Oh, Jake, let me see that note again. What's the matter with you? You've seen it. But we might have left something out. There might be a mistake. I'll tell you, it's all right. If it'll make you feel better. Here. Now, is there anything wrong with that? No, I guess not. Then put this in his cup. There's ten grains here. All right. Wait, Jake. What's the matter now? The police will ask where we got the poison. Oh, Trina, Trina, don't you think I've thought of that? Charlie must have found it in the desk. I used it last summer for developing pictures. Oh, Jake, I'm afraid I'm going to be sick. You're not anything of the kind. You're all right. Everything's planned perfectly. I'll take that tea up to Charlie. All right. Go ahead. Up the stairs. Yes, I'm going. Yes, Trina? Here's your tea, Cousin Charlie. levy against life. A dollar a day for 27 years. And Cousin Charlie is nearing 50. A dollar a day for 27 years. And that is the price Jake Crowley and Trina has placed on life with no rate of interest. The perspective on money and life becomes incredible when that perspective is twisted and warped by Obsession. Back now to our story starring Bonita Granville. It is the following morning after solicitous Trina took Cousin Charlie a cup of hot tea. A cup of tea loaded with cyanide. A lethal charge sufficient to kill many Cousin Charlie. And perhaps this morning, Cousin Charlie lies sprawled in the guest chamber in the horribly contorted paroxysm of death. At least, that is the burning hope of Jake and his wife, Trina, as they recount their evil conspiracy in the breakfast room downstairs. Their voices hushed by the tense mute of a desperate obsession. I don't want to go up there, Jake. I just can't. All right, you don't have to. Let me have the suicide note. I'll take it up and put it on the lampstand. Must we call the police this morning? Of course. But there's nothing to worry about. We simply tell them I went upstairs to call him for breakfast and found him... Well, that way. Jake. Listen, Trina... I was thinking last night, there may be more than 10,000 in this for us. Charlie's a rich man, isn't he? I think so. And you're his only living relative, aren't you? Yes. All right, he's almost certain to have mentioned you in his will. Do you realize what that means, Trina? We'll be rich. Rich? Oh, oh Jake, it must be wonderful to be rich. <laughs> you said it. Trina, we're both alike. I think that's why I love you so much. And I love you, Jake. I always will. Well, good morning. <gasps> Charlie. Charlie? Oh, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. I... Oh, uh, here's that cup of tea, Trina. Oh. I must have fallen right to sleep last night. Didn't get a chance to drink it. Thanks, anyway. Oh. Well, come on. What are you staring at me for? Well, what do you got for breakfast? Breakfast? Oh, oh breakfast. Eggs. Fine, fine. Say, how about dishing me up a platter? I'm kind of in a hurry. Thought I'd go into town this morning and get a pair of temporary glasses. Oh, yes, I'll fix you something right away. Oh, say, I I meant to tell you. 
I used the phone in my room for a long distance call yesterday. Hope you don't mind. Oh, no, of course not. <laughs> Had to call my foreman at one of my ranches. We're going to enlarge. Finally got an okay with some building material. Figured on going up to look it over day after tomorrow. You told the foreman you'd be there day after tomorrow? Why, yeah. <laughs> sure. Say, uh, how about them eggs? Oh, sorry. Uh, right away, Cousin Charlie. <laughs> Jake and I had been very lucky. If Charlie had drunk the tea after making that phone call to his ranch, the police would have checked with the foreman and become suspicious. Yes, we had been lucky, but it hadn't solved our problem. So that evening... Trina, did Charlie get back? He's in the front room, listening to the radio. Did he get his glasses? Well, yes. Good. There's only two days left, Trina. Oh, I know, Jake, but... Listen... But this is foolproof. We'll tell him there's a package for him in town that he must sign for personally. We'll loan him the car. How does the that... The skid chains are off, and the roads are slippery with snow. I've loosened a bolt in the master cylinder of the brakes. Before he reaches town, all the hydraulic fluid will have leaked out. You mean the brakes won't hold? Call Charlie. Oh, no, Jake, I can't do We haven't I... much time. Call him, Trina. <laughs> It was easy to talk Charlie into going. And as the front door closed behind him, I felt relieved, exhilarated. I stood by the window listening for the car motor to start. I didn't hear it. Instead, I heard a voice calling. Trina! Jake! Come here, quick! Why, it's Cousin Charlie. Sounds like he's on the porch. Open the door. Charlie, what's wrong? I... I slipped on the steps. Oh, don't seem to be able to get up. Here. Give me a hand, will you? Yeah, here. Oh, be careful, Let's careful. get him into the uh, house, Jake. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, Take it easy, Charlie. Uh, Come on. Charlie had sprained his ankle. We called a doctor. He advised Charlie to stay in bed, and he would pay him another visit in the morning. Jake found an old cane he had used when he had had a foot infection. We left it at Charlie's bedside and went downstairs. Jake was furious. The thing was getting to be an obsession with him. I don't care, Trina. I don't care what's gone wrong. We can't wait any longer. We can't. We won't be able to do it, Jake. You can see that. It just wasn't meant to be. It was meant to be, all right. And it's going to be. Oh, no. Don't you realize, Jake, there's something bigger than you or me. There's nothing bigger than you or me. Listen. You kept up the insurance on the house, haven't you? Why, you know I have. All right. This time we'll do it. There's plenty of kerosene in the basement. We'll burn this house to the ground and Cousin Charlie with it. Oh, you can't... We'll be in the garage, understand? We won't notice the fire until it's too late. Charlie started it with a cigarette, accidentally. He was smoking in bed. But he's crippled. He'd never be able to get down the stairs. Well, of course, that's the idea. Oh, no, we couldn't do that to him. We can and we will. Oh, Trina... We've gone too far to stop now. Hello, Charlie. How do you feel? Oh, a little better, thanks. Say, Charlie, that money of yours, don't you think Trina and I'd better put it away for you? Oh, I don't know. Nobody's going to rob me, are they? Oh, no, of course not. I just thought, well, we have a wall safe downstairs, and in as much as you're laid up, Oh, <laughs> come to think of it, might not be a bad idea. Uh, there's my traveling kid over there. Take it down with you. Fine. Say, uh, what do you got in that can there? Oh, it's kerosene. Uh, we were just going down to the furnace. Thought we'd heat your room up a little for you. Oh, well, thanks. Oh, 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 dear, I spilled it. I'll get a cloth and clean it up right away. Oh, don't bother, don't bother. It'll dry up. Well, if you're sure you don't mind... Oh, no, it's okay. Here's a package of cigarettes, Charlie, in case you'd like to smoke. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, you better keep them. I don't smoke. You don't smoke? No, sir. Oh. Oh, well, that's right. I forgot. Come on, Trina. We'd better go downstairs. <laughs> Why can't we tell 
tell the police that it started with the cigarette. Oh, don't be a fool. Don't you think they'd discover he didn't smoke? Uh, no, we got to find something besides a cigarette. What can it be? Well, I'll get it. Hello? Speaking. Oh, hello, Evans. Yes? Yes? Hey, what? They're on the way over here now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you called. Thanks. Goodbye. What is it, Jake? Jake? What's wrong? They've discovered the shortage at the bank, Trina. The investigators are on their way over here now. Evan said he thought I'd like to know. He's a nice kid. But how? I thought the bank examiners were due until... I don't know how. Trina. Trina, you said you loved me. I do, Jake. Heaven help me for it, but I do. We'll run away. You and I. But supposing we're caught... Well, we'll be caught if we stay here. Trina, we've got Charlie's 10000 Maybe we'll be able to start again somewhere else. Oh, do you think that this is the right... Will you come with me, Trina? Yes. Yes, Jake. I'll come with you. Are you afraid? No. Not anymore. They're probably at the house by now. Jake, do you have to drive so fast? Well, they'll be looking for us pretty soon. But you're doing almost 70 in the roads. Jake? What's the matter? Jake? Good Lord, Jake! This is Charlie Barton. They... What? Both of them? Yes. I'm... Mrs. Crowley's cousin. Well, I... I have a sprained ankle. But if you'll send someone... Yes. Yes, I'll come down and identify the bodies... thousand dollars. That's strange. I was planning on giving them that money as a, as a present. Why? I thought the world of those two kids. <laughs> facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Russia. The abject misery of loneliness has no circumference, is bounded by no rivers or seas. It is the well of darkness, wherein only the shading of a friendly light can lift the soul to peer over the crags of a storm-ridden coast, as you shall see in the story of the North Wind starring Jane Wyatt. of a New England's windswept coast, time and tide have carved from the stone of the tall, menacing crags an unpretentious little fishing village that shall be known as Cape Sharp. Here men live by the grace of the elements and the yield of the sea. This is the land of the north wind and a land rich in the loam that is the perfect culture or the growth in the mind that is known as obsession. I'm Elsa. I came to Cape Sharp because I was alone. I came in search of my aunt, whom I'd been told to take residence at the resort there. The journey had been hard and long. I stood at the cliff's edge and gazed down upon the Cape for the first time. It was early evening, and the lights were just starting to blink lazily in the village below. So calm, so peaceful there. The contrast to the rest of the coast, where the sea lashed against the cliffs violently, frightening me. I started down the path. This was to be my home. Here, with the wind and the ocean sky. Hey, Pedro. Good catch today. Gee, gee, very good. And you? Oh, can't complain. Fine, that's very fine. We can be thankful for our good luck today. Soon now we may not be able to go out. And why? The north wind, she's coming again. You had better lash up real good from now on, Marcus. I will. Thanks, Pedro. Gee. Mister, fisherman. Yay. Could you tell me where the resort is? No resort. No re- Well, of course there is. My aunt... It blew away last year. Blew away. Yeah, the big wind. That's all that's left. There, ahead, see? But where did the people go, the, the ones who live there? Who knows? Everyone gone? Mm-hmm, everyone. Uh, thank you. Hey, hey, what's wrong with you? I, I feel so. Don't fall here. it up. Stay where you are. How do you feel now? What... What happened? You fainted. Here, drink this. It'll do you good. What is it? Soup. Go ahead. Drink it. Oh, no. Thank you. I... Go ahead. All right. How did I get here? Did you... I carried you. This is my house. You feeling any better? Yes, much. You've been very kind. I think I can manage all right now, though. You're going? Yes. Where? Why, why... But you haven't got any money. Where are you going to go without money? How did you... I went through your purse. You... Oh, I wasn't going to rob you. I just wanted to find out who you were. Oh. You're Elsa, aren't you? Yes. I'm Marcus. I'm the best fisherman on the Cape. You are? Yeah. I can afford a lot of things the others can't. I eat well. I live well. My house is paid for. That's fine. I own a shed behind this house. I sleep there in the summertime. I could sleep there again. I... I don't understand. Well, you're welcome to stay in my house if you like. You're sick. I think you're hungry, too. My house is yours. And my food. I appreciate your kindness. Believe me, I do. It... It wouldn't be possible, though. And why not? Where else would you go? I don't know. Well, then Stay. I can't take your house. I offer it to you. Rest first and, well, then go where you like. You're very generous. No, I just... Hey, Marcus! Marcus! 
They're, they're calling you. Yes, that's my very good friend Pedro and his friend, Manuel. They want me to go into town with them tonight. Marcus! Yes, I hear you. I'll not go with them, though. You won't? No, but I'd invite them in if you'd care for company. Why, if I'd care, Marcus? Well, they come to drink wine. Sometimes they get drunk. I won't mind. Well, I'll get the wine from the kitchen, then. No, no, that's all right, Marcus. I'll get the wine for your friends. <laughs> you should have seen him, Marcus. When he pulled up his net instead of mackerel, he's got a whole school baby shark. <laughs> Where did it happen? About five miles out. You know, Marcus, I was last in tonight. I don't like the look of it out there. Pedro is right. He's too quiet. Just like last year before the blow. Uh, what do you call them? A, a lula before the storm. A lull, Manuel. Oh. Will you have some more wine? Any of you? No, thank you. Marcus? No, I don't think so, Elsa. I, uh, I think I have one more glass. Check it. Manuel. Uh-huh. A lady's name is Elsa. Oh, see, si, see, si, Marcus. No harm. Quiet, Marcus. quiet, Manuel. Uh, Marcus, uh, we were talking about the wind. Yeah. Do you really think the north wind will come again this year, Pedro? I think so. Well, you better be ready for it this time. Uh, what do you care about a little wind for, Marcus? You got your house here on the hill. <laughs> you got some wine. A nice little chiquita. Manuel, 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 Come on, Manuel, we go. You've you had too much. Come on. I take care, Manuel. See you tomorrow, Marcus. Good night, Pedro. Oh, Marcus. Yeah? I, I don't think you should have done that. You're wrong. You don't know Manuel. I should have told him he was unwelcome here long ago. I'm the one who doesn't belong here, Marcus. Already I've come between you and your friends. That's not so. Manuel is no friend of mine. He's not like the rest of us. He's got a bad streak in him. We'll come to trouble someday, he and I. I feel it. But, Marcus, I... No, no, no. Think no more about it. I'll go out to the shed now, Elsa. I take my boat out at five in the morning. I... Won't see you until tomorrow night. Good night, Elsa. Good night, Marcus. What are you doing up at this time of the morning? I fixed some breakfast for you at the house. I didn't see you go. No, I started early and ate at the stand. Oh, well, here's a little something to take with you, in case you get hungry. Well, thanks, Elsa, but you shouldn't have bothered. Well, that's all right, Marcus. Just uh, put it down there in the boat. I? Put it in in the boat? Yes, in the the cabin there. The cabin? (laughs) Oh, come on, Elsa, what's wrong? No, Marcus... You take the sandwiches. Elsa, you're afraid of the boat and the sea, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> it won't sink. I know. Well, but... then why don't you... No. No, Marcus. No. Oh, it's all right, Elsa. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. I was afraid once, too. You... Do you hear that wind out there? Yes. That's the north wind. That's what I used to be afraid of. Till I found out what it was... Found out? Sure. That wind isn't blowing just out there, Elsa. It's blowing a lot of places. Sometimes it's down inside you. And it blows hard and cold and you've got to fight it. Ends when it's worse because you can't see it. But you, you've got to make it stop. And if you do, you won't be afraid anymore. You won't ever be afraid. Bring out now. Take care of yourself, Marcus. I will. I'm coming. Just a moment. Yes, what? Hello, Chiquita. Manuel. I I forgot something last night. Uh, can I can I come in? Well, all right. Come in. Why didn't you go out today, Manuel? Oh, the wind, she blow too much. Uh, anyway, I think it's a good time for me to come over and uh, see you. You've been drinking. 
Oh, just a little bit. What did you forget, Manuel? Uh, I want to... want to ask you a question. What is it? Oh, come on. Why you speak so quick like that? You, you mad with Manuel? Manuel, you better leave here. Marcus will be home very soon. Oh, uh, Marcus. A fool with Marcus. <laughs> hey, I know you came to be here with Marcus. He picked you up on the pier last night, see? Get out, Manuel. Everybody tell poor Manuel to go. Nobody like poor Manuel. Maybe it's a kid oh. and like poor Manuel. Let me go. Give poor Manuel a kiss, a kiss. Stay back. Just a little kiss for Manuel. Get out of here. Oh, so you slap Manuel. I teach you. Maybe you don't act so smart now. Manuel, look. Huh? It's Marcus, coming up the path. Go on now, leave. <laughs> Marcus, that's a joke. I'm telling you the truth. Look, there, through the window. Uh, it is Marcus. Go, go quickly, or Marcus will kill you. I go out the back door, shoo, shoo. Elsa, Elsa. I'm coming, coming, Marcus. Who was that was just here? Why, it, it was... Elsa, you... Your face is scratched. Yes, I... I... That looked like Manuel outside. Was he here? Marcus. Was Manuel here? Yes, but... He, he scratched your face. Oh, it's all right, Marcus. Manuel! Manuel! Marcus! Marcus, where are you going? Marcus, come back! Please, come back! by the winds and the storms, Elsa shows terror. But against the buffeting of the lust of man, she shows only the bravery that is a woman's heritage. And the reason for that bravery is the bubbling spring of hope and courage. Yes, and of love. That becomes in the shriek of the wind an obsession. <laughs> that has reached into the innermost pockets of his heart and found comfort there. And thus out of the night has gone Marcus in search of Manuel, down from the hill into the village, walking swiftly, watching carefully, oblivious to the driving rain that beats against his face, the roar of the surf from the straggling beaches and the fury of the north wind, oblivious to everything except finding Manuel. And Elsa waited at the house, keeping a vigil at the window, held there in the grip of a strangely surging building obsession. The storm grew, and I wondered when it would stop, if it would ever stop. I looked down to the lights in the village, one would flicker and go out. Now another. It was growing dark. I remember the day I'd stood on the cliff and gazed down at the village for the first time. How friendly, how beautiful it had seemed then. How changed it was now. Suddenly I felt a chill, something blowing cold and hard. The wind. Marcus. Marcus, I'm alone. I'll be afraid if I'm alone. Come back, Marcus. Wherever you are, come back. Manuel. Marcus. I'm going to kill you, Manuel. No, Marcus. No, no, stop. Marcus, stop. <laughs> Marcus. Elsa. 
Your back. Yes. The blood. You're hurt. No, no, no. I'm, I'm all right. You... You killed Manuel. No. Then... He was drunk. We fought. That's all. Oh. Oh, Marcus. I was afraid that... No, he deserved it. I... I couldn't do it, though. I'm glad, Marcus. Yes. I'll get some warm water. Those cuts should be bathed. Elsa. Yes? Sit down. I didn't kill him because of you. Because of me, Marcus? If I had, you'd have hated me, wouldn't you? I could never hate you, Marcus. You see, we fishermen are simple people, Elsa. We think but two ways, right or wrong. If you're right, the Cape's a good place, and people are glad to share your wine, and you're glad to give it to them. And if you're wrong? Manuel was wrong. Marcus, you're handed. It ought to be bandaged. Elsa, I, I want you to understand... I think I do. I'll get the water. How long will the storm last? Oh, there's no way to tell. Seems as though it's getting worse. It, it can't get much worse, can it? it? Never has before. Marcus, doesn't anything ever frighten you? I don't think so. What if the storm would grow and, until the sea came up and, and washed away the village? Even your house. Wouldn't you be frightened then? The sea gave me this house. It's been good to me. Why should I be frightened of it? But what if you were to drown? Well, then I'd be dead. And what can you be afraid of when you're dead? Oh. Oh, Marcus, you're funny. Why do you say that? Marcus! Marcus! Oh, there's someone at the door. I'll answer. Marcus! Marcus! Pedro. Where's Marcus? I... Oh, hello, Pedro. Marcus. Marcus, I come as fast as I could. They're looking for you in the village. you got to leave here right away. Now, uh, take a breath, Pedro. Who's looking for me? The police. Uh, the police? What do they want me for, Pedro? You know. I don't know. What is it? Manuel. What about Manuel? He's dead. He's dead? But Marcus... Marcus had a big fight with him. He killed him. I didn't kill him, Elsa, I, I didn't kill him. But they find him in the street outside the saloon. Maybe you don't know you hurt him so bad. But I didn't fight with him near the saloon. Look, amigo, I believe what you say. But the police, they will not believe you. They hear too much in the village. They come here to take you to jail. You go now, Marcus, before they come. Yes, Marcus, go. Don't let them catch you. Elsa, you'd have me run away? Oh, Marcus, they mustn't catch you. They mustn't. It was all because of me. You're afraid for me? Yes. You shouldn't be afraid, Elsa. I've told you before not to be afraid. Marcus, if they find you, they'll... They'll take you to prison. No, Elsa, I'm not a criminal. I know, I know, but... I won't run. I'd never run. I'll tell them the truth when they come. They'll believe me. I've never lied to anyone. Oh, Marcus. Marcus. Marcus, the police are here. Open the door, Pedro. Amigo. Open the door. Marcus, the fisherman? Yes, I'm Marcus. Come in. You know Manuel? Yes. You fought with him tonight? Yes, but I didn't kill him. You're under arrest. Oh, no, 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 he didn't do it. Come along. No, you can't take him. You can't. Come along. I'll be back, Elsa. Wait for me. I'll be back. <laughs> Is it, Pedro? It's almost midnight. Pedro, he won't come back. Shoot me. He will. You know it, too. All right. I, I guess I do. We've got to help him, Pedro. See, si, see, si, I want to help my very good friend, Marcus, but what can we do? I'll go to the police. I'll explain it to them. Explain what? That he didn't do it. That he couldn't lie to anyone. They won't believe you either. We can try. You love Margaret, don't you? What difference does it make? It... You do. Yes. Marcus is good, man. He loves you, too. Pedro can tell. Then, Pedro, take me to him. But we cannot drive the road into the city. She's washed out. Well, well how did the police get here? They come in their big boat. They go back down the coast in it. A boat? I got small boat. Be much danger, though. She's acting up something bad out there. We'll... We'll go in your boat, Pedro. You might get scared. No. 
We'll go, Pedro. Yes? You have a man here by the name of Marcus? Is he a fisherman? Yes. He's here. May I see him? He's out for murder, no. But he, he didn't do it. I want you to know that. He didn't. Do you have evidence? No, but... No, you can't see him. Oh, please. Dead out. What did they say? They won't let me see him. Pedro, sorry. Oh, Pedro. Don't cry. Go. We'll go back. No. no. I'll wait here. But you can't do nothing. I want to wait. All right. Pedro, wait too. Amigo. They let me go, Elsa. Oh, oh, Marcus. He was drinking after I left him. A, a car ran over him in the storm. The, the driver just reported it. it. It's all over? Yes. We can go home now, Elsa. Oh. Amigo, the storm, she's letting up. Yes, it looks like the end of it. Pedro has his boat waiting. You came in that? Yes. You weren't afraid? No. No, I, I wasn't afraid. wind has come and gone. Out across the water, the dawn is breaking. And this will be a beautiful day. The fishermen are going out. Marcus is with them. Marcus says the north wind may come again next year. If it does, we'll be ready for it. And I won't be afraid. I know what it is now. I'll never be afraid again. <laughs> has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hyde, if you please. Beneficent on the distaff and 
terror, yes, even a murderer of the earth. This is the story of a question of personality, starring Don DeFore. sometimes leave no scar, at least not physical scar. This is the story of such a man. His name, McPherson. Occupation, police detective. There is no breath that can exact the moment when his unusual story began. No writer to break his story down into numbered chapters. However, that moment when he stood before his doctor, tense, nervous, waiting to be dismissed from a rest home after what the doctors called neurasthenia, a nervous breakdown. That was the moment when the first germ was conceived of obsession. Well, McPherson, so you're all packed and ready to go, huh? That's right, Doc. Bags packed and everything tidied up, including my nervous breakdown. <laughs> now, McPherson, remember, we're not to think about that. We're all better now, huh? <laughs> we're all better. Doc, your technique's much better than the night nurses. <laughs> <laughs> well, from now on, no more detectives as patients. Oh, too much criticism. Well, Doc, I was going to recommend you to all my friends in the force when they had their breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, I reversed my decision. Well, Doc Keene, it's really been nice. Thank you, Mac. I, uh... I wondered if you'd thought of that thing that was bothering you. Oh, a vent? Sorry, no luck. You know, I, I really wish you'd stay here a few more weeks. Well, considering the fees, Doc, I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> well, haven't you heard that old adage, charge them enough and they're bound to think you're good? Wish the police force worked on that principle. You complaining about being a detective? Why, I thought you were the man who ate fingerprints for lunch. Yeah, and we just about get paid off in licorice buttons and shoelaces. <laughs> Well, if the bill is more than... No, you. no. I got the dough for it. But that ranch I've been wanting looks pretty far off. Yeah. You'll get it. Yeah, maybe. Another year in the force would do it, I guess. Remember your promise, McPherson. Oh, uh, yeah. Detective work is out. But why? Because you broke down and had to come here when your wife died. Okay. Well, she's dead. A part of me died with her. But that's over. I'm better now. The rest of me has got to keep living. You see, I'm a detective. It's it's all I've got. McPherson, detective work is out. But why? Because of that vague feeling you still have. That, that feeling of having done something wrong. <laughs> the psychiatrist speaks. That's what I get for spilling my dreams on that couch of yours. <laughs> That's what you get for being a great detective. Well, should I be modest and say nothing or tell you I don't know what the devil you're talking about? All right, McPherson. Why do you think you're a great detective? I outthink him. Any of those two-bit crooks. What do you mean, outthink? Outthink? How? I outthink him. It's simple. I put myself in their place and figure out what any criminal would do. Uh, even a criminal like Lagrosso? How do you know about him? <laughs> the couch is my detective. And the couch in your dreams. I've learned a lot about him, like to hear it. Well, so what if you have? Half the boys in the force are bored hearing me talk about him. Legrosso, Peter Legrosso, 1612 to 1667. One of the most famous crooked operators in history. Murdered, stole, poisoned, tortured, kidnapped, blackmailed. Mm -hmm. Embezzled from the age of ten on. Name it and he did it. I know more about him than any professor of history. Probably more than anyone in the world. He hated his father. He had a scar on his thumb received by climbing a wall with broken glass on top of it. He had even... McPherson. Huh? Why is he always on your mind? Why, he's not. Even in your dreams? Well, why shouldn't he be? He's, he's my hobby. He's, he's my relaxation. He's more than that. All right. He's made me... With... Well, he's made me a good detective. I know his every thought. I can put myself in his place and figure out what he'd do any time, any place. And it was putting myself in his place that taught me how to outthink those cheap little mugs who commit crimes without brains to get away with it. It was putting yourself in Legrosso's place that put you here. Oh, Doc, 
You'd better stay away from that couch. Ah. <laughs> Good technique, McPherson. Nothing like a joke to stop someone from telling the truth, huh? Talk, talk, go ahead. A man can't think like a criminal and behave like a detective. You're a good man trying to think like an evil one. And the conflict will twist your brain in half. Two entirely different halves that fight each other. That's why you had to come here. I was sick. But first, and what might have happened before you came here, I don't know. But I do know that under pressure, those two halves might get confused. You might not be able to tell them apart. Oh, yes, I can. Look, Rosso, he speaks with an Italian accent. Yeah, yeah, that's right, McPherson. And he did. On the couch. Don't go back to the police force, the doc said. Remember, there are things you don't even remember. So you stand as long as you can. Living in a hotel room, staring out at the empty brick walls of the city, going down to the hotel lobby and talking to the same people who are just as bored as you are, reading the same papers every day, even to the advice of the Lovelorn column, and thinking so much of a little ranch you want that you can't stand it anymore. And finally, finally you write to the one man who can make it all possible. And then almost hold your breath till he sends for you. Hello, McPherson. Come in. What's the matter, Chief? Servant quit while you were away? No, I sent him out. Wanted to talk to you alone. Oh? Well, it was nice of you to see me here at your apartment. Was it? Well, wasn't it? That depends. On what? Whether you think that my refusing your request to come back on the force is pleasant. Refusing my re... Well, why? Because I'd like to give you a break, but not at my expense. <laughs> well, you, you're talking in riddles. You better come to the point. I was away when you were mixed up in the steward case. You're forgetting it, ain't you? The steward case? Your mouth is open. Shut it. Look, I, I wasn't on the ball that night. I was sick. My wife dying. The boys must have told you I was framed. <laughs> oh, now, that's a new story. I heard different. You were left to guard that jewelry. And I did. Except one of the servants heard some guy with an accent talking in the room with you. I tell you, whoever the guy was must have sat me. It knocked me out. I woke up and my head was splitting. <laughs> yeah. And later, your buddy slipped the stuff to you and we found it where you hid it in your home. Look, Chief, I tell you, I'm clean. Maybe the DA was sucker enough to let you clear on account of your wife and needing dough. But I'm not going to have anyone on the force. Look, I swear, I don't know what happened except I didn't do it. Look, please, Bill, give me a break. Just give me one more oh, year. Oh, but... cut it. Don't weep on my shoulder. Blue third stains. Thanks. I, uh, I suppose you told them this down at the force. No, as a matter of fact, they all expect you to report back. But uh, that isn't the way it's going to be. No. No? That isn't the way it's going to be. I run a police force, not the Salvation Army. And one more thing. What? Cut my throat. Do what you please about that, but stay out of the private eye business. What should I do for a living? Shine shoes? You better not. The way I feel now, I might have my boys run you in. Who do you think you are? Some almighty saying to himself, now I'll wipe a fly off the earth. Make it scum and you're right. Well, I'm no scum and you're no... Ah, get back. You're breathing in my face. Jesus. Now, get up and get out of here before I Jesus. push you through that wall. You are pushing me. Look closer. Get out. Answer me, answer me. Get out, you bum, you and your pony accent. I have Don't touch me. Put that gun back, McPherson, or I'll... Uh, One more. One more. (laughs) (laughs) Your your Italian accent. That guy guy in the room. You, McPherson. You should call me Senior LaGrosso. But now... Now she's too late. Lieutenant McPherson. Uh, Lieutenant. What? You want me? Uh, Lieutenant McPherson. I'm glad you're back with us. I guess you heard what happened. No? No, I haven't. I had a splitting headache last night. 
I don't know what don't know what happened. I was supposed to see the chief, and instead I woke up in my room at twelve, sitting in an armchair. You, you were supposed to see the chief. Yeah, sure. Hey, hey, what's the matter? What are you standing at me that way for? Oh, I'm sorry, Mac, but the chief. Last night somebody shot him to death. You what? Hey, that's a crummy joke. No, it's true, Mac. The inspector wants to talk to you about it right away. What for? What for? Why, well, he's putting you on the case, of course. I'm going to work with you. Oh, uh, my name's Wilson. Oh, yeah? Well, come on, Wilson. We we got a murder to solve. A murder to solve? Well... What are you waiting for, Wilson? Could it be there are several latent suspicions kicking around in your mind regarding Mac? Could it be that you have a vague idea as to his double personality in the frame of schizophrenic and realize somewhat of his strange obsession? <laughs> Question of Personality, starring Don DeFore. The Mr. Hyde of Dr. Jekyll's personality shot and killed his own chief during a strange and violent rage. Afterwards, his mind was that of a blackboard eraser, and he wandered about aimlessly pondering the warning and lackluster words of a psychiatrist who had talked of that nightless separation of schizophrenic, split personality, one half good, the other bad. That morning, reporting back to duty, McPherson countered the shock of being assigned to a case of schizophrenic murder. And as he stood once more in the apartment... The red of the murdered man's blood became the hypo to complete the terrible and murderous obsession. Look at this place. They must have been pushing each other around to mess this play up this way. Yeah. Mac, uh, have you looked at the body yet? Yeah, enough to see he still looks as though he had heartburn. But he wasn't a bad guy. It seems funny to... Mac... What's that? Huh? Here in the corner. A badge. Hey, Mac, it's a detective badge. Well, that puts you at the head of the class. 302. Hey. And hey, that's my number. Well, here's your badge. Well, I, I must have dropped it while I was looking around. You weren't in that corner, man. You're crazy. You're crazy. Why? Uh, uh, pardon me, sir, but uh, the policeman outside said you wanted to see me. Oh, yeah. Are you, uh, Eddie, the houseboy who found the bunny? Yes, sir. I'll tell you, Wilson. Eddie, tell me. Do you remember hearing anything that might have come from this apartment? Well, well, I was working a party upstairs, so I had to go by the door a couple of times, yes, sir. Uh, I heard him talking with a man with a, with a funny voice. Well, what was funny about the voice? Well, I, I don't know exactly, sir. It was kind of like a, like an Italian accent. Oh, oh. Okay, Eddie, you can go, but uh, wait around outside the door, will you? Yes, sir, I'll be around. I work here. So, you almost found me out, Wilson. And it wasn't over. Not by a long shot. I was a murderer. Assigned to reveal his own crime. Still, I had knowingly committed that murder. So why should I be punished for it? I went on pretending to do my job, looking for the killer everywhere, or just about everywhere. But day by day, I knew my partner was growing more and more impatient. I knew that pretty soon, he'd start wondering about things. Maybe mention finding my badge to the inspector. I decided there was only one thing to do. I went over to see Jocko Martin at his nightclub. 
Hello, Martin. Hmm? Well, Flatfoot McPherson. You knew you'd be glad to see me. Been quite a while. Has it? I don't miss cops. What do you want, Mac? Not much. Just want to give one of your boys some work. Huh? Come out of the closet. You're talking in the dark. Listen, Mug, I made a mistake. And you're going to fix it so I can go on like it didn't happen. Otherwise, well, I know enough to fix it. Oh, no. You're not going to make me jump and squirm. Okay, Marty. But you will when they put a rope around your neck. So long. Hey, 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 wait a minute, Mac. Who's it got? His name is Wilson. And I can send him any place you say. Okay, Mac. Make it that empty warehouse out on 96th Street at 10 o'clock shop. Hello? Wilson? It's me, McPherson. Oh, yeah, Mac. What's up? I'm on to something hot, but it goes in two directions. About the case? What else? Listen, I have a line on someone who had a beef against the chief. Well, what's holding us up? Just that I also got a call from some stoolie. He says to meet him out at that empty warehouse on 96th. Two breaks. Oh, that's great, Mac. I can check the guy with a beef while you see the other. Oh, no, 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 no. I think you'd better go to the warehouse. I'll handle the other. Well, whatever you say. Uh, what am I do out there? Ten o'clock, Wilson. Ten o'clock, sharp. <laughs> I said. And at ten o'clock as the door to that darkness opened, I would be at home with no less than a police inspector as my alibi. Everything was ready. At eight, the inspector was due. But eight o'clock came and no inspector. Eight thirty and still he wasn't there. I began to get frantic. I needed somebody with me. Somebody could swear I was home with Wilson when Wilson got it. I started making calls. Everybody. Everybody I knew. Glenn Hoffman. Bill Mulford. Malone. But my luck was running out. But I couldn't locate a single one of them. And then... And then when I put down the phone in desperation, something happened. Something that seemed like the best thing in the world. Hello? McPherson? Yeah. Yeah, who's this? Dr. Kane. I'm down in the lobby. I was just wondering if I could run up and see you for a few minutes. Kane? And Dr. Kane? Yeah. Hey, that's wonderful. Yeah, of course. Come on up. I hope you don't mind my dropping by. I had to come into town for the weekend, so I thought... Mind? You're going to come at a better time. How have you been? Working at anything? Nah, nah. Just kind of taking it easy. Like you said. Good. Glad to hear it. I... Mac, why are you wearing that shoulder holster? <laughs> Holster? Well, I guess for, for old time's sake, just a habit. Mac, I'm your doctor. I'm working for you. I'm a doc. I promise you that I was... You're back on the force? On my word of honor, I... Mind if I look at your coat? No, but what? I thought you'd have it. Huh. A badge pinned to your coat. A detective's badge. All right. All right. I'm back in the force. So what about it? Mac, do you remember what I told you could happen under a string? You've got to quit. When I finish one more year... Ah, oh, be sensible. Because if you don't... Look, Doc. Supposing I did start talking with that accent once. I'm not sure. Well, let's say that strain you, you gab about. You want to know what had happened? Well, I couldn't say. Almost anything. Anything that other personality, that other half of you would do. Well, there, there are so many things in psychiatry. Yeah, but could it be a, a new pattern of life? Yeah, I doubt it. Once the chasm, the, the void between the two personalities is, has been bridged... It, yeah, but why should a man, uh, someone who never... That, look, Doc, Doc, I, I don't believe it. It doesn't have to happen again. Well, the other mind has found the path and the bridge has been constructed. And it will happen again. Then, eventually, a, a man would... Crack again? End up in that place of yours with stone wall around it? Yeah, that could happen. Or the other personality could become dominant. The conscious one. Me. McPherson. Not a guy with an Italian accent? I believe that if the other mind was strong enough to subdue yours once or twice... It would do it again and again? Yeah. And I'd spend the rest of my life hunted, hiding... 
there a second when I'm not going to look behind me? Mac, I, I... I don't mean to upset you this way. Nothing's <laughs> happened. After all, I, I still don't hear any trace of an Italian accent. <laughs> there, there's no way back. What? I guess I... I wanted that little ranch too much. Mac, there, there must be something wrong. Why not tell me? Doc, what time is it? Huh? Oh, 9.30. Why? Never mind. Uh, I'm sorry, Doc. I, I gotta leave. Uh, there's something I gotta do. Mac, where are you going? Mac! Open up. Open up. There must be another door. This must be it. Hey! Hey, who's ever in here? You that's supposed to meet Wilson. I'm gonna tell you, it's all off. It's all off. Off! Oh. Off! Oh. Oh. The ambulance will be here in a minute. So it's a matter. But you see, kid, that's how it happened. Just a slight case of lead poisoning. Those bullets were meant for me. Yeah. Yeah. But the right guy got them. Mac, why did you rush in that way? Why? Why? I don't know, kid. I guess I... I just didn't want that... That ranch so much. After all. You see, I... You see... Mac. Mac. You're gonna be all right. You're gonna be all... Yeah, Mac. You're all right now. been listening to Obsession. has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. eagle its fledglings, or the beaver its kits? The answer then, in just a moment, is in this story starring Hilary Brooke. a rugged New England coast where a small farmhouse stands forlorn and alone near the edge of a jagged cliff. Against this cliff, the sea strikes in monotonous rhythm. Inside the house, a shriveled old woman sits at the supper table 
holding taut the silver cord that binds her to a pretty young girl who works at the menial task of clearing away the refuse. The silver cord that is at once the strength and the weakness of a selfish obsession. Leave my cup, Sarah. Right there, Granny. I haven't touched it. Can't see why you're rushing so. Tain't as though there was any reason for it. You know there's a reason. What reason? How would I know? Granny, there's no use pretending. Pretending? You know I've been counting on going to the Harvest Festival. You ain't said nothing lately. Thought you'd given it up, Jason being gone. Well, I haven't. Driving three miles into town and back alone, just for... I've hardly been out of this house for weeks. I want to be where there are people to talk to and fun and laugh. Those who set store by such things manages to forget their duty. Maybe. But you've got to laugh sometimes. Anyway, when you're young, you've got to. Laugh? Fiddlesticks. You ain't fooling me none, Sarah. Tain't laughing you're so hurried to get away for. It's to get dancing with them Struthers boys and Tom Doyle and the like. And there isn't anything wrong with dancing. And wanting to get their arms around you. That's what you're in such a hurry for. Duty or no duty. Am I forgetting my duty just one in one night of dancing? Don't I wait on you day in and day out? Isn't that about all there is in my life? Strikes me you ain't very grateful for my taking you in when you was left alone. I didn't have to, me being your grandfather's second wife. It wasn't my flesh and blood. Oh, Granny, I'm grateful, but... I don't know what you'd do if it wasn't for me. No place to go, no kith or kin. I'll do what I can to make up for it. Funny way to make up for it. Go and gallivant and leave me here all alone. Just so as you can set your cap for some young fellow. I'm not setting my cap for anyone. And I ain't forgot how you was acting about Jason. Meeting him yonder on the cliff... Running out to him whenever he whistled. Jason's gone, Granny. Trying to come between us, he was. Trying to take you from me. Wasn't anything of the kind. He never even spoke of marrying. I'll change my dress now. Sarah! Yes, Granny? As long as you said I'm gone, seems like you could look to my comfort a little. What is it now? Uh, you could move my chair to the window so as I can see the storm. You know well enough I ain't able to. It is beside the window. Uh, Tain't turned right. I can't see the cliff. There you are. <gasps> <laughs> must have hit close by that one, must have. <laughs> it's getting late. I'll have to... Ew! Listen to it. It's coming nearer. Coming closer to the cliff. Coming to keep an old lady company. Yes, many's the time I've gone out to meet it. Out to the cliff, Sarah, where you and Jason used to go holding hands. Other things have gone out there. Yes, lots more important things. Long before you and Jason, your Uncle Robert died out there. Eh, you know how he died, Sarah? I know, I've heard the thing. Yes, you heard what people say, but you don't... I'm ready. I'm going now. Sarah, you ain't going in the storm. Yes, Granny, I am. I should think you'd be afraid the lightning would strike the buggy. Sometimes does, I've heard tell. I'll get there, somehow. <gasps> oh, 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 Sarah, quick. What is it, Granny? I've been took with one of them stomach spares. Uh, quit the medicine. Here, drink it. <laughs> Nasty stuff. Don't do me no good. You'll be all right in a minute. Oh, but I ain't, Sarah. The pain's awful. They'll wear off. But suppose they don't, and then you're gone. I'll put the medicine right here. Oh, pain's getting worse. It's creeping all over me. You ain't going now, I guess. Oh, Granny, can't you possibly get along without me this one? Suffering the way I am, you know how them sparrows are. I know well enough how they are. You never can tell when another one will come. All right, I'm staying. You'll be better now. Though? Granny, did you hear that? Huh? No, nothing. 
nothing, 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 nothing but the wind. There it is again, that whistle. There is someone on the cliff. It's Jason. Suppose it is. You ain't going to go. Yes, Granny. You'll be all right now, and I'm going. Sarah! Sarah! Oh. Uh, oh. All right. Go on. Go ahead. But you'll never marry him. Never. Who'd you think would be whistling? Oh, the lightning flashed. Granny said she saw a man on the cliff and said it looked like Uncle Robert. And then the wind went down and I heard the whistle. Oh, but I couldn't be sure, Jason. It might have really been just a whistle. I was afraid you might have gone to the festival. I was going, but Granny had one of her spells. Hmm. She hasn't changed any since I've been away. No, she hasn't changed. Nothing changes here. Things just go on. Listen to the waves. Pounding day in and day out against this cliff. Wearing down its strength little by little. So someday it'll get too tired to fight any longer. Slide down into the sand. People get worn down too, Jason. And for most of them, there's no way to escape. If there was a way, Sarah, would you take it? Oh, yes, Jason. But would you, Sarah, would you? Why did you go away? Well, you'll know in a minute, Sarah, but first I have to say something to you. Something I... I've never said because somehow I figured there wasn't any need. I figured you just knew. You what, Jason? That I love you, Sarah. If you did know, you must have. Oh, I wasn't sure you never said it. I was hoping that's how it was. Jason, being with you is all I've had from life. You do love me, Sarah. I wasn't a fool believing it. No, Jason. Oh, Sarah. It seems strange. All these hours we've been together and you never kissed me. Never held me and kissed me before. I wasn't sure you loved me. Oh, I do love you, Jason. So much that it's all that's kept me going. Even when it seemed as if there wasn't anything left to live for. Sarah, it was wrong of me not saying right away how I felt and what I was hoping to do, but I wanted to surprise you. About what, Jason? I have a job, Sarah. A good job down at the county seat. That's what I went away for. I'm going back tomorrow. Leaving? So soon? In the morning. Start work. And I'll be alone again. Not seeing anyone but her. What are you talking about, Sarah? We're getting married. Oh, Jason married us? Sure. And living together in our own place. Well, there's life going on and people to talk to. And you coming home every evening. A home of our own. Maybe there are better things than that in life, but... But I'll never ask for more. There is nothing better, Sarah. And as soon as you can arrange things, I'm coming back for you and we'll be married right away. Oh, it'll be wonderful, Jason. We're forgetting something. We're forgetting her in there. I'm not forgetting her. I'm finally setting you free of her. But I have a duty to her. You can't forget duty just to get something you want. Sarah, you've got to see this thing straight. You've paid her a thousand times over for whatever she's done for you. She's a selfish old woman who doesn't care about anything but herself. I don't love you. Don't her. say that, Jason. I love you so much that just now when I heard your whistle, my... My heart was pounding till I thought I'd die. Pounding louder than the sea down there. Then you must see it isn't right for you to give up all your life for what's left of hers. Look at what she did tonight, fixing it so you couldn't even go to the festival. She said she was ill, Jason. Well, it's mighty queer she's always ill when you try to get away for a while. Sarah, there's something unnatural about her power over you. Remember, you have a duty to yourself. I guess I've been blind. But I'm not blind any longer. I will marry you, Jason. I'll marry you as soon as you can manage it. Oh, Sarah. Sarah, this is something we have to celebrate. You're beautiful tonight. Oh, Jason. I'll get my coat, Jason, and meet you here. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm, I'm almost scared. Remember now. It's right what you're doing. You mustn't let her talk you out of it. Oh, not now, Jason. Never. Oh, my darling, I'm free. At last, I'm free. <laughs> Strand.
strands of the silver cord unravel and unweave in the face of a love that knows not the word of defeat. The blood of heritage runs thick, but the wine of life brews high with the yeast of love. Each life to live, each life to die as it chooses, save that life in the grip of a greedy and selfish obsession. implications that are twisted by an obsession. Pondering the relative fates of a life buffeted by the squalls and mistrals of jealousy, Sarah has at last made the resolute determination to be free and to live her own life within the orbit of her love for Jason. Sarah has returned from her meditation on the cliff to the lonely old house and to the lonely old woman who lives in it. The lonely old woman who lives deep in the quagmire of obsession. Sarah, that you? Yes, Granny. You were gone long enough. Only a few minutes. And that's all I'm going to stay. Sarah, what are you doing with that coat? Where are you going? I'm going to the festival after all, Granny, with Jason. So, it was him a whistling at you. He's back. And he turned you against me at last. You young fool. Where do you think this is leading you? Jason and I are getting married. That's where it's leading me. You can't marry Jason, oh, Sarah. Oh, yes, I can. And I'm going to. You know about your great uncle, Robert? You know the tale about how he died? Of course I know. You told me over and over again. Folks always said he was walking on the cliff yonder in the storm. And getting too close to the edge, he slipped and fell into the sea. I've heard the story, Granny. And Jason's waiting. He didn't slip, Sarah. He didn't slip at all. No one but me knows this. Not a body in the whole world but me. I was there on the cliff. I seen it. He jumped, Sarah. He'd done away with himself. Suppose he did. What has that got to do with me? Well, don't you see? He jumped, Sarah. He jumped because his head was full of strange notions. What are you saying? He used to tell me about his notions. Granny, what? He was mad, Sarah. Mad? Yes. And your blood relation to him. You're tainted, Sarah. Me? Oh, no, Granny. So you see now why you can't marry nobody. Never. Do you see? Well, where are you going, Sarah? Jason's waiting, Granny. I've got to send him away. I'm not hungry. Uh, perhaps a little tea would do you good. I'm not hungry. But you got to eat. You got to keep alive. Why? What about a lip? Oh, now, Sarah, that's no way to talk. Why, it's been most a year since that Jason went away. You got to forget him. Why? If all I can ever do is think of him, why must I forget him? Oh, oh, look, Sarah. Uh, look here at the window. <clears throat> why, there's Doctor Williams. Headed for Widow Carey's. He ought to stop past here first and see me. Nothing wrong with her. Nothing at all. Oh, it's getting cold in here, Sarah. Might be we could build that fire up a mite. You can put some wood on if you're cold. No, I suppose I'll have to. You wouldn't care if we were both to freeze to death. Take easy, Brendan, and lift it, please. Oh, stop it, Granny. You're plenty able to do it. Oh, that's what you say, but... And that's what I know. You're getting old, Granny. And you keep forgetting I found you out. Learned that you weren't helpless and been deceiving me all these years. Oh, well, what does it matter now? It matters when you won't do nothing except sit there day in, day out. Staring out to sea, never saying nothing, just thinking. I have plenty to think about, Granny. After what you told me that night. It was my duty to tell you. 
My duty to send Jason away. But it hasn't made living any easier, knowing what I know. Sarah, we've got to look after each other now. Yes, Granny. We've got to look after each other. Shut in these four walls. Hating each other, waiting for it. You watching me day in and day out. Dreading it, feeling your heart. Not knowing when it'll come or how. Now, if you go on brooding like this, I don't know what I'll do. I just can't stand it. You can't stand it. And I'm waking every morning and wondering, will it come today and all day long? Think, how will it come? Will I know when? You've got to stop dwelling on it. Stop? How can I stop? Nobody could, I tell you. I've tried. But it's not known. Waiting. Fear. Well, of course, there ain't nothing certain about it. Uh, your Uncle Robert was past 40. Past 40. And I'm 24. Harry, you've got to get hold of yourself. Sure, i got to get a hold of myself. i got to keep on standing. Well, I can't do it here. Not even God could ask that of me. Sarah, where are you going? What are you going to do? Sarah, stop! Sarah! Yesterday, Sarah ran into Jason. He wanted to know how you are. Oh. Uh-huh. Gave me a message for you. He's coming here tonight to take you to the festival. Good boy, Jason. Suppose you'll be marrying soon. He's doing so well and everything. Me marry him? Why not, if you love him? Granny told me, Doctor. Why I couldn't marry him. Granny told you? Told you what? Why I couldn't marry anyone. Ever. Oh, she did. And why was it, child? She told me about Uncle Robert. The real truth about him. Just what did she tell you, Sarah? You know, you must. She said his head was always full of strange no, notions. Oh, he was a queer one at times. She said it wasn't an accident the way he died. She was there and saw him. She said he jumped off the cliff. She had no right to tell you such a thing. She told me it was because he was mad. Your Uncle Robert mad? That's why I couldn't marry Jason. Nor anyone. Sarah, you poor child. Please, Doctor, it isn't sympathy I want. I can't stand that. But I've got to know the truth, all the truth, about myself and Uncle Robert. There are others in my family that, that suffered too. No, 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 Sarah, never. It's a lie she told you about your uncle, all a lie. Doctor, you're, you're not just trying to make it easy for me. You wouldn't say that just to me. No, no, I tell you, it's a cruel lie, Sarah. I was the first one to reach your uncle after he fell. He was dead. Hit the rocks below the cliff, but clutched tight in his hand was a bush he grabbed to save himself when he slipped. The rain had washed the roots and it gave way. It was an accident. He was no more mad than I am. You sure there was never anyone in my family who... No, 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 of course not. I've known them all from a way back. Uh... Come, Sarah, let's... Let's go on down to the house. Oh, Dr. Wilson. I can't believe anyone could be so cruel. Yeah, it was a terrible thing to do, sir. Terrible. Old folks are selfish sometimes. They try to hold on to the young ones and keep them from living their own lives. It's as though coming to the end of the road, they hate to be shoved aside and clutch at anything to stay in the thick of things. They don't always fight fair. But a whole year, Doctor, I believed it. And maybe there's another thing had something to do with it. You see, Sarah, 
She was in love with your great uncle Robert, although she was married to his brother. And maybe being thwarted in her own love, she was jealous of you and Jason. That happens sometimes. But that isn't any reason no, to. No reason for a normal, healthy mind. But you see, Sarah, she's been acting strange like at times. That's why I've been watching her coming in every few days. Oh, she's harmless enough, but. Well, we'll see, Sarah. We'll see what's to be done. Doctor, it's Jason. I can marry Jason now if you want me. Of course he wants you. Go to him, child. I'll look in on Granny. Maybe I'll see you and Jason at the festival later. Here I am, Jason. Here by the. Seem to come from the clear fire. Sarah, are you all right? Oh, holy cow, Jason. Did you see? Yes, yes. It, it was your grandmother. You saw her, Jason? Oh. Did she fall? Oh. She went over all right, but I don't know whether she fell. I'm afraid we'll never know. Oh, poor Granny. She was very old, child. Very old. No matter how it happened, she's set you free. Yes. He's right, Jason. Granny set me free at last. are the slow poisons that saturate the most brilliant mind until it becomes dank and spongy, a cavern of foul and nauseous thoughts hidden away from the light of the sun, a secret place where no longer live the clean structures of love or honor or decency, as the twisting roots of destruction dig deeper and stronger interlocking like the fibers of some malignant cancer. And so, in just a moment, the story of the hangman starring Tom Conway. This is the story of the hangman, the hooded man skilled in the subtle arts of the hempen noose, the springer of the trap. In a small town in the south of England, 
In a wayside inn, a young man sits at a table, tense, expectant, obviously nervous, and even more obviously held in the vice of some strange and decidedly urgent obsession. Hello, Nellie. Sit down. Oh, I'm sorry to be late. Have you been waiting long? Twenty minutes. What detained you, Nellie? And Alice. She hasn't been feeling well. I couldn't get away. You mean you couldn't sneak away without her seeing you, isn't that it? No, darling. No, that's not true. There's no need to lie, Nellie. I'm aware that your aunt doesn't approve of me. Oh, it's not you personally, Oliver. It's just that, well, Aunt Alice is frightfully set in her ways. She believes that you should have a steady position, an income. Oh, I see. As she prefers that I give up my painting, find a job as a day laborer, a three-pound-a-week clerk, or, or perhaps a newsvendor. Yes, there's a nice steady position. Arthur, you're in another mood. Possibly. Oh, darling, darling, don't let's quarrel. It's such a beautiful day. Don't let's spoil it. I'm spoiling your day? Oh, forgive me. I didn't mean that. It's just... Well, the things you say... I... Oh, what would you like me to say? Say that you understand. No, Nellie, I can't understand. There can never be an understanding at this rate. Meeting in dark corners, afraid we might be seen together as though we were criminals. I know, I know. Nellie, we could put an end to this deceit. We could. I've asked you many times before. I ask you again. Nellie, will you be my wife? Your wife? Yes. Oh, Oliver, I... I love you, Nellie. And I love you. You know that. Then... I want to. I always wanted to. Yes. Yes, I'll marry you. Darling, let's leave here. I'll pay the tab and... Oh, uh, Nellie. Oh, well, of course, darling. Here's the money. And so, Nellie and I were married in a little church just outside the village. Afterwards, we drove home in Nellie's car. She wanted to break the news to her aunt. Nellie was convinced that the old woman would feel differently toward me now that we were married. But she didn't. Her aunt wouldn't even see me. Well, we just had to make the best of it. Nellie had some money of her own, and so we bought a small house in Middlesbrough. It was a quaint little place, had an attic that we converted into a studio where I could do my painting. Nellie and I were very happy there for a time. Good afternoon, Mr. Copeland. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mrs. Copeland. And how is my rising young artist coming with his work today? I've started my new and best painting, Nellie. Look, do you like it? Yes. Ah, though it seems a little... Almost weird. Yes, yes, that, that's the way it was meant. I, I'm not nearly finished, of course. I, I'm just starting to sketch in the background. Uh, but it has life to it, hasn't it, Nellie? Yes, it has more than that. It even frightens you a bit. Ah, then it must be good. I I hope to finish it in time to take it to the exhibit in London next month. Oh, uh, that reminds me, dear, I'll need some money. Oh, Oliver. Oliver, I've been meaning to tell you. Yes, dear? There isn't any more money. What was that you said? There isn't any more money. It's dwindled away steadily ever since we came here. You see, darling, I didn't have too much to begin with, and, and after buying this house... But I and... thought there was plenty. You led me to believe there was plenty. Oh, I didn't, Oliver. Really, I didn't. What are we to do now? Well, I've been thinking... I've been thinking perhaps Aunt Alice would be of help. Perhaps she'd change her mind about it if you'd find a position, darling, for just a little while. Till we get, get straightened out again. You could still paint. I see. So you've turned against me, too. No, darling. No, certainly not. Oh, Oliver, it would only be for a few months. Only a few months? And what of the London exhibit in the meanwhile? I suppose you'd just as soon have me wait until next year to go. No, I want you to go. But I don't see how in the world we can possibly... Afford it? We'll afford it, all right. I'll get that money somehow. I'll get it. I was furious with her. She had led me to believe she was wealthy, and, and now... Now we'd come to this. I left the house, and, and I walked. I, how far, I don't know. I, I had to think. My entire career might depend on my new painting and the London exhibit. I had to find a way to get that money. Then, that night, in our neighborhood, the thing started. The papers said that it happened close to 11 o'clock in the evening... 
woman was walking home alone down Cedar Grove. Yes? Who's there? Who's... Oh! <laughs> the woman was found beneath a tree, stamped to death, and her purse was gone. The following morning, Nelly and I had a caller. Someone at the door. I'll get it. Good morning, miss. Good morning. I'm Inspector Le Mans, Scotland Yard. I've been calling by the local police for routine check-up in this neighbourhood, and I... Uh, who is it? The man from Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard? What's he doing here? Oh, please don't be alarmed, sir. Just a routine check-up. You see, we had a rather nasty bit of business in this neighbourhood last evening. Oh, yes, you mean the killing on Cedar Grove. Yes. How did you know, sir? We were just reading about it. Oh. Well, I dropped in to ask you if you've noticed any strangers loitering around this district lately. No. No, I can't say that we have. I see. Well, sorry to trouble you. Necessary thing, though, you know. Oh, of course. I certainly hope you find the guilty party. We usually do. Uh, good morning. Good morning. That wasn't the last I was to see of Inspector Lamond. Nor was that the last murder. They began occurring with startling regularity. One, two in a week, right under the very noses of the police... Always in the same district. Always a woman. Stabbed to death. Her purse gone. One morning, some ten days after the inspector's first visit, I was leaving the house when Nellie stopped me at the door. Oliver. Oliver, you won't be late tonight again. I might be. Why? Where do you go at night, Oliver? Why do you leave me alone? I told you. I walk. I enjoy walking. Why do you ask me ridiculous questions? I won't ask questions. I won't say a word. You'll only stay here with me at night. I'm frightened. These killings, they happen all the time now. And always right around us. Oh, really now, Nellie, you're acting like a child. I can't help it. I am, I, I'm, I'm frightened. Yes, yes, of course you are. I, I'm sorry. Oh, Oliver. Now, 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 no tears. Look, I have a surprise for you, Nellie. Surprise? Yes, I, I was saving it, but here. Ten pounds. Where did you get it, Oliver? I uh, sold a painting. The one I call Blue Meadow. Uh, to an art dealer in town named of Dubois. Oh, that's wonderful, Oliver. Yes, well, the money's all yours, Nelly. I'll be home early. Good night. Inspector Lamont, do come in. Thank you. What brings you by this morning? Mrs. Copeland, I'm afraid that I'm going to have to ask you some questions about your husband. My husband? What is it? Now, please answer carefully. These are some things I must know. I understand from the neighbors that you and your husband have been quarreling lately. Is that true? Well, we have our little difference. And your but... husband stays out evenings until quite late. Tell me, do you know where he goes, Mrs. Copeland? Yes, he, uh, he goes walking. He likes to get out in the fresh air after painting all day. Oh, he's an artist? Yes. Does his profession afford him an adequate income? Well, wait. You're not thinking that my husband could have anything to I'm do with... I'm simply asking you some very important questions that you must answer. Does your husband have an adequate income? Well, well we're, we're comfortable. Uh, okay. Then, have you seen him with any extra money? Has he, uh, has he given you any? Well, come, come, has he? No. I see. Uh, well, thank you, Mrs. Copeland. Sorry to have troubled you again. Good day. Good day. The money for a painting. Yes, it was for a painting. Blue Meadow. Dubois. Dubois. Oh. D, 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 R, D, U. It is 
Du bois. Arte là. Hello. Du bois Art Gallery. Uh, this is Mrs. Nellie Copeland. Mrs. Nellie Copeland. Yes. Yes. I'd like some information. Did you purchase a portrait from a Mr. Oliver Copeland titled Blue Meadow? Blue Meadow. Was it an original work? Yes. Well, I could not have purchased it then. Are you sure? Positive. I have not bought an original art piece for over a year. Well, thank you. Oliver. Oliver! <laughs> full import of the neighborhood murders strikes home now, and a dark, ugly cloud of fear and suspicion settles in the mind of Nellie Copeland. Her husband a murderer? Or could it be a mere coincidence? There are reasons, of course, for suspicion. The strange attitudes of her husband, his unaccountable nocturnal meanderings through dark streets and the headlines of death in the mornings. These thoughts grow in the mind of Nellie Copeland, build, gather momentum, until they become solidified into a powerful obsession. Artist Copeland and his wife, Nellie, and the house of Middleborough that stands in the shadows of the hangman, starring Tom Conway. Try as she may, Nellie Copeland cannot escape the secret dread that lurks in her heart as fact piles upon fact, and the stern finger of suspicion points ever closer toward her husband, Oliver. Her husband that has changed so much as to be almost a stranger, living alone in a world of his own creating, a world seemingly filled by the apparitions of some inexplainable obsession. It was two days later. The London art exhibit was but a fortnight away, and my painting, my masterpiece, the one that Nellie had called rather weird, was almost completed. Then... A thought occurred to me. My London trip was to be a success. I should have to meet people of importance and influence, taken a social affair or two. Yes, I need more money. Where was I to get it? Then, suddenly I knew. It was all so very simple. Nelly. Yes, Oliver? Uh, Nelly, I've been thinking. I'll be off for London in a fortnight, and, uh, well, Nelly, with these uh, horrid Jack the Ripper sort of killings here in our neighborhood... I rather dislike the idea of leaving you alone. It would be very nice if you could have your aunt come and visit you. Aunt Alice? Yes. Inasmuch as I'll not be here, she should have no objection to accepting her niece's hospitality for a short while. I shall feel considerably more at ease, Nellie, if you would ask your aunt to come and stay with you. I'll write Aunt Alice and ask her to come. Thank you, Nellie. Nellie scribbled a note to her aunt. At my suggestion, she requested the old woman to come to Middlesbrough on the 15th. I was not due to leave for London until the 16th. But, of course, I couldn't tell Nellie that. We received a reply in the mail the following afternoon. Aunt Alice would come on the 15th at 
6 p.m. I arrived at the station to meet her. The train from Cushing was on time. It uh, was going on 8 when I returned home. Oh, oh, Oliver, I was wondering what kept you. I... Was that Alice? Isn't she here? Here? How could she be here? I thought you went to the train. Uh, yes, but uh, I was late. I uh, had a bit of motor trouble. I, I didn't get to the station until half past six, and uh, she wasn't there. I uh, thought I'd missed her, but she'd come ahead to the house. Well, perhaps the train was late. Oh, no, I inquired. It was on time. Oliver, you don't think anything could have happened to her? Oh, of course not. It's very likely that she just couldn't get reservations on the evening train. It sometimes happens, you know, and so she's taken a later one. We had just finished our supper when the doorbell rang. It was the boy with the evening paper. Nelly went to the door. The boy it was quite late this evening. I thought it strange. Oliver! Oliver! Yes, Nelly, what is it? Oh, a special edition. They, they found the killer. What killer? Oh, the one who's been committing all those murders in the neighborhood. Found him? Let me see that paper. Here, darling. Simon Reynolds, 34... Arrested in Wales last night, gave police a full confession this morning to the Middleborough Jack the Ripper slayings. Wales? Wales? That, that's more than an overnight journey from here. Then he hasn't been in this vicinity for days. What, Oliver? Nothing, Nelly, nothing. Oh, oh, the phone, I'll get it. Hello? Hello, is this Mrs. Denny Copeland? Yes? This is the Tupa Art Gallery. I am calling in reference to that painting you asked me about yesterday, the Blue Meadow. Yes? Well, we did purchase it after all. That is my associate did, and he forgot to tell me about it. I thought perhaps you'd like to know. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I, I do know. Everything's all right. Everything's just fine. Goodbye. You know, Oliver, I'm so happy. I'm so relieved. I just can't... Oliver? Oliver, where is he? Oliver! It was awkward to leave the house that way, but I hadn't much time. I drove over to a vacant lot on Charing Cross Road. Everything was as I left it. Nothing was covered. I decided to park the car in the alleyway in the rear of our house and wait until Nelly had gone to sleep. When the light in her room was finally turned out, I slipped in the house through the back door, went down into the cellar. I took every precaution so as not to awaken Nelly, but to no avail, she heard me from upstairs. Oliver? What do you want, Nelly? What are you doing down there, Oliver? I, uh... It's the hot water heater. It's broken. I was fixing it. But it's after two in the morning, Oliver. And if it is, I I'll have to fix it sometime, won't I? Now, go back to bed. But I... Oh, Nelly, go back to bed. She did as I told her. That was one thing I liked about Nelly. Next morning, Nelly wanted to know where I'd been during the evening. She was more insistent than usual, almost suspicious. But I finally managed to pass it off by mentioning that it was time for me to go to the railway station to see if her aunt had arrived. I got to the station rather early, 20 past nine. I went to the window and asked for my reservation on the London train... Then, as I turned to leave, I bumped into the man I least wanted to see. Good morning, Mr. Copeland. Oh, Inspector Lamont, good morning. Mm, taking a trip? Yes, I'm going to London for the art exhibit. Really? Well, I'll be going to London myself this afternoon. Back to the yard now that all this nasty business is cleaned up. Yes, well, have a nice trip. Good morning. Good morning to you. Well, rather unsociable fellow. Good morning, Mrs. Copeland. Oh, oh, good morning, Inspector. Will you come in? Thank you. I, uh, I ran into your husband at the railway station, and it reminded me that I had an apology to make. An apology? Yes. I do hope you don't feel too badly toward me for that last rather professional visit of mine, line of duty and all that sort of thing, you know. Of course, I understand. Fine. Uh, your husband tells me he's going to London. Yes, to the exhibit. He's going to enter one of his paintings. 
He's really a very good artist. <laughs> well, he certainly has the temperament. Do you know, I started to chat with him at the station and suddenly he just turned and went off in a huff and drove away in his car. Drove away? But it isn't even ten o'clock yet. Uh, I beg your pardon? You say he drove away? What time was it, Inspector? Oh, I should say a little before 9.30. But he went there to meet my aunt. We were expecting her on the ten o'clock train from Cushing. Your aunt? Yes, she was really due in it last evening at six. Oliver went to the station, but she wasn't there. Well, uh, haven't you telephoned your aunt to find out what the trouble was? Well, I-, I thought to last night, but Oliver said she'd surely be in this morning, so there was no need to worry. And yet he left the station this morning without waiting. You look rather odd, Mrs. Copeland. Yes, it is. Very. Uh, when did your husband return home from the station last night? Well, he was home for supper. It was around eight. And then... Oh. Yes? What is it? Go well, on. He went out again. He didn't come home until quite late. He wakened me when he came in. He, he was fixing our water heater in the cellar. Fixing a water heater in the cellar at that late hour? Mr. Copeland, I'd like to have a look at your cellar. Oh, it, it's right down here. Uh, perhaps you'd better wait up here, Mrs. Copeland. No, no, please, I'll come. Very well. Everything appears to be in rubber. I say, hold on a moment. What is it? Here, this section... It's freshly laying cement. Oh! Hand me that pick axe over there. Please, Mrs. Copeland. Here? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Mrs. Copeland, look here, and please try to keep hold of yourself. I'm afraid that what you're going to see won't be very... Oh! Oh, Inspector Lamond, what are you doing here? I've been waiting for you, Copeland. Waiting for... The cellar door, it's open. Who's been... Your wife and I have been down there. You're under arrest, Copeland. Oh. So you know. Nelly, too? Yes. Why did you do it, Copeland? She was old and wealthy. She'd lived her life... Alive, she was of no use to anyone, but dead. Your wife would inherit her money and you'd benefit from it. Yes, but why the body in the cellar? Uh, unavoidable circumstances. After I did it, I left her body in a vacant lot on Charing Cross Road. I thought when it was discovered that her murder would be just another one attributed to our Jack the Ripper friend. Hmm. But, of course, when he was apprehended in Wales, well, my plans had to be altered. I see. Well, I think we'd best be getting along. Uh, uh, one moment... Uh, This portrait here, I should like to take it with me. May I? I don't see why not. Take it. Thank you. Uh, I say the the figure, the man is very well done, but the the background. But why, isn't that a gallows you painted? Yes, it is. Oh, uh, and this really should give you quite a chuckle, Inspector. I call the portrait the hangman. That a subconscious mind oft-times reveals inward secrets in the outward expression of art. Oliver used the murky colors of his own mind to mix the oils that spread across that taut canvas that portrays so realistically the cross arms of the gibbet, the swinging knotted noose, and the stolid, remorseless figure of the hangman. And so Oliver Copeland's pathway leads him to thirteen steps, and terminates with the crash of the trap that shall obliterate forever a mind that lost its free agency in the powerful grip of a greed-filled obsession. In just a moment, I'll be back with a preview of next week's story.
for a brief vignette of next week's story when Peter Van Eyck brings you the narrative of a summer evening when an enduring obsession was created on the altar of love when two minds become fused in the common purpose of mankind you'll find deathless purpose that held high the eternal torch of a great and magnificent love in next week's story of Obsession. Tonight's story was produced and transcribed under the direction of C.P. McGregor in Hollywood. determines the shape of the testament that shall be probated by those that follow. And so, in retrospect, we trace two lives that found themselves in the soft dusk of a summer evening, starring Peter Van Eyck. began on a summer evening at Mrs. Falconer's rooming house in the East 30s, just off 2nd Avenue. Mrs. Falconer's place is unique in that it has a veranda with a porch swing, a heavenly oasis in the inferno of Manhattan at the twilight hour of a day in late August. And it's out here that Mrs. Falconer wages her personal battle with the heat, swinging lazily while she talks to her newest roomer, Mrs. Briggs. For like many other girls, ilk, to Mrs. Falconer, talk is an obsession. A thunder shower, Mrs. Briggs. That's all we need right now, a thunder shower. Oh, you think so? I never can decide about thunder showers. Like the rain, of course, but when there has to be lightning along with it, where... Well... Say, Mrs. Briggs, here comes Mr. Martin. I didn't tell you about him. He's an artist. Him and his wife come here and took the parlor suite over a year ago. A more in love couple you never seen. Shh, I'll tell you later. Evening, Mr. Martin. Good evening, Mr. Martin. Oh, good evening. <laughs> sure a scorcher today, wasn't it? Uh, uh, this is Mrs. Briggs. She's taking Mr. Collins to his old room. <laughs> How'd you do, Mr. Martin? <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, Mrs. Briggs, Mr. Martin is just the most wonderful painter you've ever seen. The refined kind, I mean. Oil pictures and portraits. Of course, he had bad luck for a long time, but now... <laughs> well, uh, you know them pictures all over billboards of soap and things like that? Well, Mr. Martin's got a new job drawn for them billboards. And he's going to make... You're mistaken, Miss Faulkner. I had a job drawing for those billboards. I was fired an hour ago. Fired? Yeah, here's the back rent I owe you till today. I have some money left, but I've got to keep it. I can't pay you in advance. I'm sorry. 
Of course, as long as it's you. Uh, only, well, Don't I was... Don't worry about your rent. Yeah. Somehow I'll see that you get it. Hello, David. Nay. You mustn't look so. You mustn't, my darling. No matter what this day has been for you. Please, David. Mary, if you only knew. You needn't tell me. I do know. The job. Yes. And I'm glad. Glad? So must you be. David Martin drawing billboard ads. It is a kind of sacrilege. What are the real creation that's in your heart? I... I can't talk about it now. No, David, listen to me. We're going to talk about it. No. You're tired. Hot and tired, so just lie down and rest. David, you're going away. You shan't stay here longer because of me. Don't talk like that. I cannot go. There's too much that holds me here. You know that. You never mentioned Leslie Marshall. But he's written to you. Weeks ago... He's written you to come west and share his studio. To get back to the kind of painting you should be doing. And you're going. There's a bus that leaves at nine o'clock. The money you have left is just enough for fare. You're going to take that bus tonight. I can't leave. You know that. And you know why. No, you can't leave. You must stay because of me. The dreams we've shared for you can go unfulfilled because of me. I don't care. I don't care if I ever paint again. Listen. Listen, David. The first time we heard this melody together, in Naples, on that magic day, the day of our meeting, help me, David, to remember this. Naples, David. Naples. And a beautiful young American girl, newly arrived in Italy, unsure of herself and of the language. And the man who had taken that street by chance, stopping and watching, half amused, she tried so hard to make herself understood. Oh, uh, Signor. Si, si, Signorina. <laughs> Dove est la officine? Ah, Signorina, peut-être vous comprenez français. Français? Si, mon Perhaps English would be better. You don't speak English. That I will leave to you to judge. Oh, I don't believe it. And the American Express office is just around the corner. Oh, thank you. But how did you know? It's always the first place the newly arrived American tourist is seeking. Oh, Oh, forgive me. I am David Martin. Oh, I'm Mary Reynolds, and thank you so very much. Wait. What? Please don't go. (laughs) You know, it's funny... But for the first time in my memory, I do not know what to say to a girl. Well... Do not misunderstand. I'm aware that, well, that two people do not meet like this. At least, by tradition, they are not supposed to. Well, I'm afraid I must agree with you. And yet, how can I say it? The fact is so simple that the words... Miss Reynolds, if only you had first met my mother instead of me. Your mother? Why? She's such a wonderful old lady. And very wise. She would have said, here at last is the girl I must introduce to my son. And then, besides, she might have given that son a fairly respectable reference. Completely without prejudice, of course. Really? And what would she have said up there? Oh, that he was born in a small French town near Paris. That he was an ordinary boy, not too good, not too bad. And that for some inexplainable reason he determined to devote his life to painting. And so went to Italy to study. There he wasted three whole years until one day... One day, he met a girl on the street who was looking for the American Express office. And that changed everything? You think that's impossible? You really here studying? I have been. And you? I've come to study voice with Pietro Camroni. A singer? Mm-hmm. Then you can't refuse. Refuse? It just happens I have two tickets for the opera tonight. With very good eyes from these particular seats, you can almost see the stage. Please, you must say yes. You don't really have tickets. No. You see... I cannot even lie to you. But I will get them. Come with me, Mary Reynolds. You see, I'm a prophet. 
And these are prophetic words. This is more than a chance meeting of two strangers. Believe me, a very great deal depends on your reply. I know. I, I feel that, too. Afraid. I believe you were actually afraid at first. In a way, I was myself. Yes, but that didn't matter. I couldn't have stopped myself from seeing you again, even if I'd wanted to. More memories. David, we must bring back the other memories. That night. The opera. You and I, in the highest tier of seats, looking down almost on the heads of the singers far below. But that made no difference, for we saw nor heard no one. Nothing save each other. And the days that followed. Those wonderful, carefree days. Castellamere, Sorrento, and... Capri. The blue grotto in Capri. The hills above the town. The music there, too. The music of the cypress as the wind blew through them. And the one hill that we chose apart from all the others, like... like a little world unto ourselves. And as we were there alone... Mary! Mary Reynolds! Do you hear that? The very hills of Capri call back your name. Hmm. Which only proves that they know now that they belong to you. And weren't they surprised to hear it? Not at all. They're used to my whims. I simply told them they were now yours, that I gave them to you. Oh, I'm extremely grateful. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Of course, I should warn you. It is not altogether an outright gift. No. No. There's the matter of a very small payment. No, I was afraid of that. Well, Senor Shylock. Would another very small kiss be fair enough? <laughs> Oh, David. Have I remembered today to tell you that I love you? Mm, not today. I do love you, my darling. I adore you. Mary. <laughs> this is going to be something serious, I can always tell. You get that somber look deep in your eyes and your voice drops half an octave. <laughs> David, you want to tell me something? Yes, Mary. I must get back to my work. And there's only one way that that is possible. You must marry me. Well, I'm sure no girl ever got a more flattering proposal. Now, I have it all planned. The wedding at my mother's place, it'll mean so much to her. And afterward, we'll go to Paris. I know of a perfect studio in Montparnasse. In Paris? Of course, Paris. It is my home. The logical place for me to do serious work. But what about my work? Oh, you're singing. If you still wish to study, we shall find you some teacher in Paris. When we can afford. David, I, I don't think you understand. Certainly I understand. You wish to be a singer. All right. But everything in its time and in its order. And your painting is first in order, is that it? But naturally, Mary. Please do not be unreasonable. It is not like you. Well, why is it unreasonable to want to finish what I've started? You wouldn't give up your work. Why should I? Because, as my wife, there's no need for you to work. Well, perhaps you think there is. I see. You haven't faith enough in me to believe I can support you. I didn't say that. And anyway, that's beside the point. Beside the point? Why must you paint in Paris anyway? Why not here? I have my reasons. Many of them. Already I've stayed in Italy far longer than I intended. Which is my fault, of course. For I'm sorry to have detained you. Mary, please. I'm sure these weeks have meant a great loss to art. An irreparable loss. Mary, listen to me. We mustn't speak like that to one another. This is childish. Childish. So it's childish for me to want to go on with my singing... Something that's really important to me. Oh, don't worry, David. You'll have no further trouble with my interference in your plans. Because I'll have no place in those plans. Now or ever. You can depend on it. Now, back to the story of David Martin. And the pathetically sweet story of a summer evening starring Peter Van Eyck. The interest we have in the future lies in the memories of the past, for memory is the guardian, is our wisdom and surety and hope in the future. And so in the precious memories of David and Mary, the bridge between tomorrow and yesterday is spanned. And the courage is reborn to cleave to the irrevocable truth of color, line, and form. A truth that must burn as a lamp in the darkness and be in the heart and soul of the artist the power of surge of creation 
and the one honest and unswerving obsession. So you were gone from me in anger. Gone. My world into which you had brought light and warmth was dark and desolate again. You were gone, and with you had gone something of myself. And I knew then that unless I found you, I'd never paint again. It was the end, as though quiet death had struck in the midst of life. Go on, David, quickly. The memories that are left, there's so little time. And you must leave tonight. You must go and take that bus. Remember. David, remember. After all those futile months of parting, Vienna. Vienna. I finally learned you had gone there. And I followed you, forgetting my work, forgetting everything, searching for you even after it all seemed hopeless. And then suddenly, there you were, more fragile and more beautiful than ever. On a bench in the Hofburg Gardens, just as though we'd had a rendezvous. And when I saw you looking up at me with wonder and happiness in your eyes, I knew, I knew that all of what men call time had passed before to make that single moment just for us. And you took a piece of paper from your pocket and gave it to me. It was a poem that you'd written the night before. There's beauty in the very thought of you, my dear. The music and the echo of your laughter. My life is more than life when you're near. And when you leave, my universe goes after. David. Faster, David, faster. The other memories that are left. Our wedding in that little church in your hometown. The ceremony in French that I could only half understand. Our honeymoon in Paris at last. And that impossibly tiny studio that you call the Martin Pilots. And you painting. Painting with all of the genius that was in you. And always with you as my inspiration. And yet it seemed fortunate forgotten us. Still, all I had to offer you was hardship and a poverty that seemed to grow worse each passing day. But you never mentioned it, never complained. And then at last, at long, long last, that day I had been waiting for, praying for... And that evening in the studio, as I arrived... What? David, what does it all mean? Those baskets, what's in them all? Oh, nothing very much. Nothing at all, really. Just champagne and caviar and fat chicken and oranges as big as cabbages and strawberries out of season. Oh, oh but you shouldn't. My budget. Oh, I'm a little bored with your budget. Please burn it the next time we have a fire. What is it? What's happened? Now, don't you lie to me. I can tell by your eyes. Nothing at all important has happened. A little check, that's all. What's a check, more or less, in the life of a successful artist? Let me see it, please. Well, if you must, uh, have it here somewhere. Oh, here. David, 12,000 francs. Is that what it says? But how? Where? Well, there was a certain collector who thought 12,000 francs a fair price. For what? For the painting which won the Grand Prix at the National Institute today. The Grand Prix? You... You're not joking with me. Does that check look like a your joke? Oh. Oh, David. Oh, no. Here, darling. I've won. Surely that's not a cause for tears. I admit it's a bit of a shock to have more than 50 francs in this house at one time. I can't help it. I'm so happy for you. What canvas was it? The seascape, of course. We have done no better. You and I. You and I? Then I haven't hindered you. I have really helped somehow. Help? My darling, don't you know the truth? You are the creator in this studio, and I am merely, merely the instrument of expression. The work I had done before that day we met in Naples, what was it? Meaningless splashes of color upon a canvas. Oh, Mary, you, and you alone, have given me the key to whatever greatness I may possess. This canvas, this price, it is not the end, it is but the beginning. Oh, I'm sure of that. I have a great purpose now, my darling. One that nothing shall stop me from achieving. This nameless wonder that is between us two. This love that is more than love must live on. On beyond us both in color and in line and in form. Other men must know and feel and be warmed by it. Long after both of us are gone. And I promise you it shall be so. Nothing under heaven shall prevent it. Nothing under heaven. That was 
was your promise, David. That was your promise. Now, quickly, the last of our memories. It's so near the end. The voyage home. Sailing on the Ile de France. Yes, the voyage. I was so sure our real future lay in America. In your homeland. And I was so confident of great achievement. We were coming here to our glorious future. To our glorious future, indeed. To Mrs. Faulkner's rooming house off 2nd Avenue. To the dead end of dreams and the sudden death of genius. Stop it, David. That's all. It's ended. The curtain's down. And our parade of memories is over. It must be. That was the final time we'll call them up. Now you're going. How can I go? Each word that we have said, each fragment of a memory only holds me here more sharply. No, it's a fragment of memory that must release you. Your promise to me in Paris, the day of the Grand Prix. Say it again, now. And let that be our parting. This nameless wonder that is between us two. This love that is more than love must live on beyond us both. In color and in line and in form. Other men must know and feel and be warned by it. Long after both of us are gone. And I promise you it shall be so. That promise must be fulfilled, David. And it will be if you go now. I know that. Please. Please, my darling. But how can I? You must. It will mean that I, too, am freed. You're sure? Yes, David. Then I shall go. What are you going to do? I have to pack. I couldn't leave without... You'll leave with nothing, David. You're just break clean. Go now, just as you are, and take that bus. Take nothing? Not even... Nothing. And go gladly, my darling. Let me be prouder than ever when you're mine again. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mary. And of course, Mrs. Briggs, I never believe in talking about anyone, because if you do, why you shouldn't. Oh, Mr. Martin, I, uh... Forgive me if I was abrupt before, but there were reasons... You may rent the rooms to that couple, after all. Yeah, but I, uh... I'm leaving now, tonight. Tonight? You're going to get a new job? Yes, a tremendously important new job. Good night, Mrs. Faulkner, and goodbye. Yeah, but Mr. Martin, wait, you... Well, what do you know about that? Gone without a bit of baggage. And no telling what condition the rooms is in. Come on, let you and me see, Mrs. Freak. A good mistake. Say, did you notice his eyes, Mrs. Faulkner? Like there was fires burning in him. Yeah. Imagine walking out and leaving everything as... Uh-oh. What? He even left that. Hmm? What is it? Picture of his wife. Only picture he had left of all that he come here with. Hmm. He wouldn't sell it. I even come in here one day and found him talking to it. Talking to a picture, mind you. There. Then you mean his wife is... Well, good Lord, didn't I tell you? David Martin's wife died of pneumonia more than six months ago. He stayed on alone here ever since. The words of Mary that ring in David's ears like the soft chimes of a silver carry-on. This love that is more than love must live on beyond us both in color and line and form. Other men must know and feel and be warmed by it long after both of us are gone. These words are the incentive, the purpose, the driving force of all creation, which no true artist may escape. For always in the mind of the creator, color, line, and form must become the supreme and magnificent obsession. You have been listening to... Obsession. Deceptive Chameleon than that which we know as love. 
For love and hate are kindred things, each bound by the tensile strength of a silken cord that slowly but inevitably strangles those caught in the web of obsession. And so the story of Surrender is Farewell, starring Joan Loring. Central Station, and the huge waiting room is silent and empty. Empty, that is, except for a small figure huddled in a far corner. There, a young girl, a pretty face streaked with tears, sits writing a letter, a letter of surrender and farewell, in which she pours out a pitiful story of three lives made untenable by the irresistible powers of one mind filled to overbrimming with the slow poisons of an insanely jealous obsession. Dear Linda, in 30 minutes I shall be on my way back to Indiana. It is hard to realize that it's been only two months since that day I saw New York for the first time. The day when Roger and I drove north out of the city to his home in the rolling Connecticut countryside. We were so happy with no premonitions of what lay ahead. Just around the next bend, you'll be able to see it, Carol. Your new home. Our new home, darling. Oh, Roger, I'm so happy. <laughs> when I left here last month on that business trip, I never thought I'd be returning with a wife, particularly such a pretty one. Are you sorry? What do you think? <laughs> hey, there, you can sit over there, over on that little hill. Oh, Roger, it's beautiful. You like it? I'm overwhelmed, darling. I never dreamed that someday I'd have a home like that. For the woman I love, nothing is too good. <laughs> You're all I really want, Roger. Hey, here's the drive. Won't be long now. Oh, I've never seen such trees. And that lawn. Linda's probably watching us out of the front window, just dying to get a glimpse of her new sister-in-law. What's she like, Roger? Oh, she's considerably older than I am. Ever since my parents died 20 years ago, she's been more like a mother than a sister. I bet she's sweet. Well, you have to know Linda to appreciate it. She has a few funny ideas. Roger, I just know we'll get along. Oh, sure. Well, this is it. Cameron domicile. Shall we go in? We will. After you kiss me. Oh, Carol, darling. One's enough, Mr. Cameron. Come on, let's go in. <laughs> you killed Joy. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes Linda now. Hello, Linda. Hello, Roger, dear. I received your wire. Bet you were surprised to learn the big news, huh? That would be an understatement. This, I presume, is Carol. Hello, Linda. Isn't she just the way I described her, Linda? Let's say she's exactly what I expected. Shall we go in? Linda, you can't possibly know how excited I am about all this. You would do well, my dear, to restrain some of that exuberance. I considered your exhibition in front of the house just now. Most improper. But, Linda, I only kissed her. I'm not blaming you, Roger. Hereafter, Carol, remember that you're a Cameron and uh, conduct yourself accordingly. Well, I'm sorry if I... We won't discuss it further. The door, please, Roger. Well, not a thing has changed since I left. Of course not. We shall eat in exactly 25 minutes, Carol. I assume you'd like to change your clothes. Well, I think if I just wash up a bit, I'll it's have to... It's all very well to wear one's oldest suit while traveling. But I think it's hardly suitable for dinner. But I... Yes, Linda. I'll expect you for dinner at six o'clock sharp. Oh, Roger, she doesn't like me. Oh, nonsense, darling. She doesn't even know you yet. One's oldest suit, she said. Roger, this is the newest and most expensive piece of clothing I own. Oh, we'll remedy that, honey. Tomorrow I'll turn you loose in the city and let you buy the finest wardrobe money can buy. <laughs> and, uh, don't you worry about Linda. <laughs> But I did worry about you, Linda. I couldn't disregard the smoldering animosity in your eyes. The edge of resentment in the tone of your voice. I tried at first to tell myself that I was merely imagining things, but... The next morning after Roger had left for his office... Well, Carol, are you satisfied with your new home? I'm in love with it. And I have the most marvelous idea for new curtains in the dining room. New curtains? Mm -hmm. I thought yellow would be nice to replace those rather drab maroon ones. I selected those maroon curtains, Carol. 
I furnish this house from carpets to kitchenware, and nothing will be changed. But, Linda, I am Roger's wife now. We may as well get one thing straight at the outset, Carol. I've been running this house for Roger for 20 years, and I don't intend to stop now. All right, Linda. We won't argue about it today. Nor any other day. I thought you were going shopping. I am. I was just about to get ready. Tell me. How much money did Roger give you this morning? Now, really, I don't think that that's any... I mean... You don't think it's any of my business? Is that what you were going to say? Well, I didn't intend to be that abrupt. I'm sorry. Carol, Roger worked hard for his money. And I'm not going to stand by and see him squander it because he happens to be temporarily blinded by his emotions. Are you calling our marriage a blinding of emotions, Linda? Is, uh, this your purse here on the table? Linda, you have no right to do that. Let's see. Hmm, fifty dollars. Well, that's not unreasonable. Fifty dollars? But Roger gave me two hundred and fifty. I wouldn't lie to you, Carol. Here, you can see for yourself. Yes. That's strange. I put the money in there just 30 minutes ago, and you were the only one in the room. Are you implying that I stole money from your purse? Oh, no, Linda, I didn't mean that. That's I... precisely what you meant. You were accusing me. Believe me, Linda, you misinterpret what I said. You can be sure that Roger will hear of this when he comes home tonight. And you can also be sure that he won't be pleased to learn that his sister was called a thief in her own home. <laughs> I was confused and unhappy. Linda, I wanted so desperately to please you, but it seemed that I was meeting your disfavor at every turn. I left the house and purposely stayed away until late afternoon so that we wouldn't be left alone together. But when I arrived home, Roger still hadn't returned. Is that you, Carol? Yes, Linda. You're a little late, dear. I'm sorry. I, I lost track of the time. Well, we'll have to hurry to have dinner ready by the time Roger arrives. All right, Linda. I'll start dinner now. Uh, before you leave, Carol, uh, there's something I'd like to show you. Yes? Over there on the mantel. It's Roger's most prized possession. You mean that vase? He never told me about it. It was made in Tibet over 1,000 years ago. Oh. It's been in this family for five generations. It's beautiful. I can understand why Roger values it. You can't see it from there. I'll get it for you. Here. Oh, it's lovely. You take it. Linda, it's just lovely. Oh, you dropped it. Linda, you deliberately pushed it from my hand. I beg your pardon. I handed it to you and you let it slip from your fingers. Linda, what should we do? Oh, don't implicate me in this. You're the one who dropped it. How can I ever face Roger with... You'd better have a good story. I'll, I'll have to confess that I did it. I Don't be a fool. It'll be far better if Roger never knew what happened. But I couldn't lie to him. If you value your marriage, you'll do as I say. You can let him think that... that it was stolen. Yes, that's it. No, no, Linda, I can't. You must. Here, I'll help pick up the pieces. I just don't know what to do. Not I... in the wastebasket, Carol. You'll see them in there. But, Linda, I Put don't the think... the pieces in the pockets of your suit. Like this. You can dispose of them later. Please, this isn't right. Hurry, you'll be home want... in a minute. Hello there. Say, oh. what are you two up to? Roger... Carol... The vase. She dropped it, Roger. I told her it was valuable, but... Oh, darling, I'm so Carol, sorry. Carol, weren't you I... putting the broken pieces in your pockets? Please, Roger, I can explain to you. She was trying to escape blame, Roger. She thought if she hid the evidence that you'd think it was stolen. Oh, no, I, I can't believe it. Is that true, Carol? No, Roger. Honey. Oh, darling. I... What about it, Linda? <laughs> you can see for yourself what she was doing. That should be proof. Roger, listen to me. I'd rather not talk about it now, Carol. I can only say that I never thought you'd try to deceive me like this. It would have been a clever ruse, but it just didn't work. Please, Linda. I think you should also know, Roger, that she lost $200 of that money you gave her. And then accused me of stealing it. Accused you? Carol, what's happened to you? It was just a misunderstanding, Roger. This has all been a misunderstanding. Excuse me. I won't be down for dinner. Roger, please wait. Too late now, Carol. Oh, Linda, how could you do it? How could I do what? You intentionally created that situation. Why? Why do you dislike me so? All I want is an opportunity to make Roger happy. Happy? 
What do you know about the kind of life Roger should have? Everything Roger is today, he owes to me. And everything he will be shall be the result of my guidance. My guidance, Carol. But I'm not standing in his way. Don't interrupt me. He married you under the stress of an emotion he naively calls love. But why are you so opposed to me? What possible good can you ever do him? You have no money, no connections, no standing. Why, you don't even know the fundamentals of our kind of life. What are you going to do? I'm going to smash you, Carol. And when I get through, you'll regret the day that you had the audacity to enter his life. All right, Linda. But there's something you should realize first. I'm going to fight back, Linda. I love Roger. And I'm going to fight with everything I have to hold him. Story of Obsession, Surrender is Farewell, starring Joan Loring. The most lethal of organic poisons has an antidote, but not so with the slow-acting poison of the mind, compounded from suspicion, doubt, mistrust, jealousy, fear. Roger suffers from that subtle poison. And all the love and trust within the power of Carol is insufficient to neutralize its devastating progress. For this elixir of hate is compounded in the inscrutable privacy of a woman's mind. In the waiting room of Grand Central Station, Carol forces herself to continue the letter. The personal account of a woman's struggle for happiness in the face of a wild and unreasoning obsession. I should have known better than to try to fight you, Linda. I didn't have your weapons. I'd never learned your tactics. Your control over Roger's life had its roots in years of dominance. My power only lay in my love. And so the days slid into weeks, and everyone brought with it new humiliations. I remember one evening two weeks ago... Roger. Roger? Yes, what is it, Linda? You'll be happy to know that I found those gray suede shoes of mine I was looking for this morning. Well, that's fine, Linda. I'm glad to hear it. And I found them in Carol's closet. <laughs> can you imagine it? Perhaps Carol can explain. I how. can't stand it any longer. I can't go on like this. Carol, I don't understand it. Just leave me alone. Leave me alone. But I can't help you if you don't tell me what's wrong. There's not a thing <laughs> wrong with her, Roger. She's merely clamoring for attention. No. No, Roger. I don't know what to do, Linda. She's changed so much during these past weeks. I was wondering when you'd finally see her for what she is. Oh, stop it. Stop it, stop it. Please, Carol. And you ask me what's wrong. Are you completely blind, Roger? Don't listen to her. Believe me, I've tried to be a good wife. But what's the good of trying when she's living here? Carol, what are you saying? I'm saying that Linda's the one behind this. Yes, Roger, your precious sister, Linda. Linda. She deliberately set out to break up our marriage with her lies and implications and tricks. Roger, are you going to permit her to talk about your own sister like that? But it's true. And you can't deny it, Linda. But she's my sister, Carol. Yes, and I'm your wife. That is, if you can call this state of existence a marriage. I refuse to listen to any more. Are you coming, Roger? <laughs> you go on up, Linda. I want to talk with Carol. Very well. Good night, Roger. Oh, Roger, can't we get away from here? Can't we start out all over again? But, Carol, my business is here. And I can't walk out on Linda after all she's done for me. All right, then. If you won't walk out on Linda, I will. You, you, you can't mean that. What's the use of pretending? I don't know what to say. I, I've been so confused. Maybe she was right. Maybe I am ruining your life. So confused, my, my head aches so... Roger, you're ill. No, no, I'm all right. Let me feel your forehead. I, I'm just tired, that's all. Roger, you're burning up with fever. I, I have the strangest feeling like... <sighs> Roger. Oh, darling. Carol, what have you done to him? He fainted. We must get a doctor. 
This is your fault, Carol. If you never mind that now, Linda. Can't you see he needs help? He's resting quietly now. Is it serious, Doctor? Well, it could very easily turn into pneumonia. He's apparently been under some great strain because his resistance is abnormally low. Well, you can be sure, Doctor, that he'll get the very best care here. I'll leave these pills with you, Mrs. Cameron. For one moment, Doctor. I'll take those. But, well, all right. You'll have to watch him closely. If his temperature goes any higher, call me. We can take shifts, Doctor, so that one of us will be with him at all times. Is there anything else, Doctor? No, that's all. I'll stop by in the morning. Good night. Good night. Well... Are you satisfied, Carol? I hold you responsible for this. I want you to stay away from Roger while I nurse him back to health. You can't ask me to do that. Roger needs me. Oh, oh, stop deluding yourself. I've tolerated a lot from you, Linda. I've taken your sarcasm and your humiliations and your cheap tricks. But I will not let you keep me away from Roger at a time like this. You'll do as I say, Carol. We'll see. I'm going into him now and you can't... I'll slap you again if you persist in disobeying me. Good night. During the next two days, you never left Roger's bedside, blocking me whenever I tried to see him. For the first time, I began to doubt myself. Was it true that Roger no longer needed me? On the third evening, we had our first hope that he might recover. It was a black, stormy night, and you were just starting up the stairs to Roger's room. Carol. Carol, hurry. Linda, what is it? Uh, I don't know. I thought for a moment I was going to say. It's no wonder you haven't slept for two nights. Cut right across my eyes. Linda, you've worked until you're ill. I'm going to put you to bed. No. No, I must go to Roger. Don't worry about that now. Here, I'll take you to your room, and then then I'll call the doctor. I'm so tired. Come on. Just a few more steps, and we'll be at the top. Let me rest a minute. Please. There. Just lean against me. I'm so weak. Roger. There's medicine. I'll take care of that. You're going to your room. Yes, yes. You take care of it, Carol. Here we are now. Mm-hmm. Now try to stand while I open the door. Mm-hmm. There. Come on, over to the bed now. Yes. I want to sleep. You're going to be all right, Linda. Mm-hmm. Just lie there while I call the doctor. Hello, operator. Operator. Oh. Linda, the storm must have blown the lines down. I'm going out to get him. But you can't drive. I'll walk. It's two miles. I ran down the stairs, put on my coat, and started out the door. Then I realized I was the only one. The only one who could help you. No one would ever blame me if I didn't go out on a night like that. It was my one chance to get you out of my life. My one chance for a happy marriage with Roger. Why should I sacrifice my whole future for a person who'd given me nothing but pain? I hesitated a moment longer. And then I made my decision. She's going to be all right, Mrs. Cameron. If you hadn't come for me when you did, she might not have lasted until morning. Yes, Doctor, I know. You'd better get to bed yourself, young lady. Running around in that storm couldn't have done you any good. No, I'm all right. How is Roger? Completely out of danger. He'll oh. be up and around in a few days. I'm so grateful. Well, I'll be running along. I hope your sister-in-law realizes she owes her life to what you did tonight. I should have known, Linda, that nothing could ever straighten out that strange warp in your mind. But I did hope. I hoped and prayed that things would be different. 
Only to have those hopes smashed when I overheard you and Roger talking this afternoon. But you can't be serious about this, Linda, not after what's happened. We shouldn't have waited this long. If you weren't such an idealist, you'd understand. Well, I don't understand. I don't understand why the two of you can't live together in the same house. You know how it's been these past two months since Carol arrived. I tell you, the situation is impossible. But it's not fair of you to expect me to treat someone I love in that fashion. My mind's made up. Do you want me to tell Carol? I don't know what she'll think. That makes no difference. This is for your own good, Roger. I turned away then and walked slowly to my room. I left very calmly and quietly. So quietly that even as I write this, you probably don't know I've gone. Yes, I've given up the fight, Linda. And my surrender is farewell. Oh, Roger. Roger, darling. Hello, Carol. Roger. What are you doing here? When I discovered your clothes gone, I figured you'd be here at the station. Oh, come home with me, Carol, please. No, oh, Roger, I can never go back. But why, Carol? Why are you running away? It'll always be the same in that house, Roger. Once I'd hoped that Linda could change, but then I heard the two of you talking this afternoon. Well, I was going to tell you... You don't have to now. I still can't understand why you feel that you must leave just because Linda's leaving. Because Linda's leaving? But I thought that... Well, it seems that Linda's done a lot of thinking since the night of her collapse, and now she has the idea to be better for us if she left. Roger, I can't believe well, Naturally, I was upset. She's my sister, and I do love her. But uh, she said her mind was made up. Oh, Roger. Will you come home with me, Carol, please? Oh, yes, darling, I will. I will. Linda wanted to see you before she left. Maybe... Maybe I misjudged Linda. Maybe we could be friends. I, I was hoping you'd say that. That's all right, darling. I'll take your bags. Say, so, what have you been writing there? Nothing, Roger. Nothing at all. You have been listening to Obsession. has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
danger, high explosive. A red sign of warning to which everyone guarantees clearance. Too few, however, recognize that danger sign in the eyes of a woman whose mind is fused with an obsession of escape. A slow burning fuse that sputters with an angry hiss towards its destination of dynamite. And thus our story, starring Susan Hayward. of every year, the blinking headlights of massive trucks dot the inland California highway route from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Some carry produce from Imperial Valley. Some carry oil from the refineries at Long Beach and El Segundo. Some, which travel a special route, carry cargo identified only by a small red flag and a sign which reads, Danger. Keep your distance. These trucks carry nitroglycerin, dynamite, whose dormant power and force of destruction burns like a fuse in the minds of the drivers until dynamite becomes an obsession. I work in Joe's place. It's an eating place just off the main highway about 30 miles south of Bakersfield. Most of the truck drivers who stop there call me by my right name, which is Maple. <laughs> Except for one or two who think they're being real clever when they call me Toots or Beautiful. So I guess it was mostly on account of the way this Fred first spoke to me that caught my attention. The Bakersfield crowd had just pulled out and I was cleaning off the tables in the back so I didn't see him come in. Then suddenly I miss. heard him say... Oh, miss. Hello. Hello. Say, can I get a cup of coffee? That's what I'm here for. Cream and sugar? Nah, just cream. How's the apple pie? Terrible. I'll have a piece. New on this run? Uh-huh. Just started today. What are you carrying? Oil. El Segundo or Long Beach? Long Beach. You ought to carry HGs. You make more money. What's HGs? High explosives. Glycerin, dynamite, that stuff. Here's a fork. Oh, thanks. Maybe if you carry that, you won't live long enough to spend the extra money. Mm, I know a lot of truck drivers. They look like they're still alive to me. Well, maybe they're just lucky. Maybe they're just smarter. The guys who drive produce and oil have to work three months for what you make in one H.E. run. Yeah, that's what I mean. They wouldn't pay that kind of dough if it wasn't plenty dangerous. Only been one blow up on the route in over two years. Well, just the same. I think I'll stick to oil. I always figure if you gotta die, it's kind of nice to die of old age. You know, I'm a fatalist. I always figure that when your time comes, you're gonna go and nothing can stop it. Well, that's no reason to go out looking for it. It's no reason to be afraid, either. Why'd you say that? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's because I think you'd be afraid. You look like you're afraid of something. Do you always look that way? Yeah, I guess I do. <laughs> you sure carry on a crazy conversation. How much is the pie and coffee? Fifteen cents. You're mad at what I said, aren't you? I don't care what you say. You don't mean anything to me. I might. What do you mean by that? I just said I might. You mean you think I could fall for you? Why not? <laughs> you sure must think you're something. 
Don't you think I'm attractive? Yeah, to some people, maybe. You remind me of a, well, a... Of a what? Uh, one of those H.E. trucks you were talking about. The little signs on them that say, Danger, keep your distance. Dynamite. My name's not Dynamite, it's Mabel. What's yours? Fred. Ah. I'm late now on account of talking to you. So long, Mabel. Suppose I'll be seeing you when you buy this way again. Now I doubt it. No? No, you were right. The apple pie here is terrible. He was a funny kind of guy for a truck driver. I'd never seen anyone like him before. He even made me feel a little foolish about the things I said to him. I guess that's why I was glad to see him leave and glad to hear he wasn't coming back. He sort of got on my nerves. And then one night, a couple of weeks later, I was waiting on an H.E. driver named Steve. Steve and me, we'd go out on dates sometimes when he wasn't running H.E.'s. I think he really liked me. Gee, that coffee hits the spot, Mabel. How about some more cake, Steve? I haven't got time. They're repairing the highway a few miles down. They'll probably hold us up there for a while. So I better get started. You gonna be down south for long? No, I'll be back for the weekend. Oh, say, if you can get off early, maybe we can take in the Saturday night dance up at Bakersfield. All right. Okay, I'll see you Saturday then, huh? So long, Mabel. So long, Steve. Hello, Mabel. Oh, it's you. Yeah, I'm back. I thought you didn't like our apple pie. Well, didn't have any complaints about the coffee. How about a cup? Coming up. Was that your uh, boyfriend that just left? He might be. What do you want with it? Just cream, remember? That'll be five cents. And I haven't any change at all. Just got a 20. Oh, uh, Mabel. Mm Hmm? You know what I stopped in for? To get change for your 20. Now, now I wanted to talk to you. You don't like me. Remember? No, I didn't say that. I said I thought you were dangerous. You should change. You always steal when you want something? I never steal. I just saw you. Why didn't you put my 20 in the cash register? We keep big bills separately. Yeah, but there's other 20s in that register. I even saw a 50. Are you calling me a thief? You called me a coward when I said I wouldn't drive HEs. I told you you could make more money driving HEs. If I wanted money bad, I wouldn't steal it. I want money bad. What for? I'm sick of truck drivers and their dirty hands. I'm sick of the way they talk and the way they laugh and the way they look at me. I hate it here. I want to get away. I'll drink your coffee. It's getting cold. Now, look me. Hey. Hey, what's that? That felt like a quake. No, no, it wasn't. I know that sound. Who? Oh, what was it? That was a truck, a dynamite truck. Fred said we should drive down to where it happened, see if we could help. Well, we might as well have stayed at the restaurant. When we got there, all we found was a couple of pieces of twisted steel, part of a steering wheel, and... Steve wasn't going to be able to keep that date Saturday night with me after all. Uh, Mabel. Yeah? What do you think about it now? About what? About driving those HEs. I've seen it happen before. Doesn't it bother you at all? Steve knew what he was doing when he took the job. He wanted the money. I'd have done the same thing. Would you? You said yourself it was better than stealing. Mabel, you'd do anything to get away from here, wouldn't you? I think so. No, I've never met anyone like you. What do you mean by that? Well, I just haven't, that's all. Tell me something. Steve, well, he was your boyfriend, wasn't he? We got along. You liked him, didn't you? As well as anybody. So why don't you cry about him, then? Don't you know how to cry, Mabel? I never cry over truck drivers. A week went by, and the dynamite company was having a lot of trouble trying to find someone to take Steve's place. The chief dispatcher, a fellow named Nick, was talking about it at the counter one morning. Yeah, that's the way it goes, Mabel. One blow-up and every guy on the run starts getting buck fever. Still haven't found a driver yet, huh? No. Of course, you can't blame the poor devils. Most of them have wives and families. All it takes is something like this to make them realize. Nick. Yeah? Do you know a driver named Fred? Oh, yeah, he's a new man. Been driving oil, I think. Yeah, that's the one. 
Have you talked to him? Nah, those guys are hardly ever interested. They thought to get a tax for that safety runner there. This one might be interested, though. How do you know? Well, I don't. I just have a hunch he might be. Hey, Nick. What? Why don't you talk to him? See what he says. What's the idea, man? No idea. You said you needed a driver. Well, this might be your man. Okay, I'll see the guy if you think there's a chance of getting him. Be sure you don't say anything to him about me, huh? No, I won't. What's your connection, man? Uh, let's just say I'm interested in seeing the guy get ahead. I didn't see Nick again that week. And then Friday night around 11.30, I was getting ready to close the place up. It had been raining all day long and business had been pretty slow. And then just as I was turning out the light... Fred! I'm going down south tonight, Mabel. Be gone for five or six weeks, so I thought I'd stop in and say goodbye. Oh, what are you going to do down there? I got an L.A. to Tucson run. When did you take that? This morning. A pretty important run. Pays good. That's nice. Yeah, a fellow who gave me the job didn't seem too happy about it, though. Why not? Well, he said he didn't want to kid me. That it's real hard to keep from running over stones in the road when you're driving at night. And how you have to concentrate on turning the wheel just right so you don't jar the truck. You're driving an A.T. He said you've got to be especially careful when you come to bridges. The pavement's usually uneven. The truck hits a bump and, well, then where are you? Maybe just where Steve is, huh? What did you take the job for if you're afraid? I'm not afraid, Mabel. I need the money. Why? You know why. What are you telling me about it for? I just wanted to be sure you're awake. I wanted to make sure you were a good investment. I've been here a long time. Stands to reason I'll be here when you come back. Mabel, if anything should happen, would you cry about me? I answered that once before. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, guess I'd better get going. Fred. Huh? Good luck. Oh, thanks. Oh, and, uh, and maybe. Yeah? You didn't have to ask Nick to talk to me about the job. I was going to take it anyway. He told you about me? Now nah, he didn't say anything. I just knew. Nobody has to tell me about you, Mabel. Can't you read, Fred? Can't you see the little red flag that indicates the five-inch sign that warns, Danger, keep your distance. The bump in the road, remember? The bump that detonates the obliterating flash of dynamite, but in this case, a new brand of dynamite. A supercharged high nitro ready to blow at the touch of the sputtering flame of a relentless obsession. In just a moment, we return to our story. Turn to the explosive-laden atmosphere of the story of dynamite, starring Susan Hayward. Thirty 
days clocked by on the undeviating calendar of the pendulum. But the same monotonous pattern weaves in the shimmering heat of Joe's place. The same roaring diesels of the trucks backfiring to a stop. The same pungent venison of hot coffee to bolster red-rimmed eyes in the long trek. The same drivers, the same loud, almost obscene laughter over the same jokes of the coast-to-coast highway. And the same mate, her mind quickening with the ever-building, selfish strength of the bursting germ, obsession. I didn't hear a word from Fred. Not even a postcard. Of course, I didn't hear of any accidents down that way either, so I figured he was okay. Probably just being stubborn, thinking maybe I'd worry about him if he didn't write. Well, if that was the case, he ought to know better. Hello, Mabel. Hello, Fred. Miss me? How did you make out downtown? Pretty good. Come on, let's take a walk. I'll tell you all about it. Mm-mm, can't leave the counter. Oh, come on, just for a minute. We can watch the door. All right. Swell night, isn't it? Uh-huh. You look pretty swell yourself. Thanks. I've been thinking about you. I thought about you lots. You did? I even imagined things about you. Do you ever do that? Imagine things about people? Some people. Did you ever imagine anything about me? I don't know. I don't think so. Once or twice, I imagined you and me being married. <laughs> that was kind of crazy, wasn't it? Yeah. Of course, all this talk, it doesn't matter much, but... Well, I made 3000 bucks down south, and... Oh, here it is. Me. Hey. That's a lot of money. You can leave here now any time you want. Where to, Mabel? San Francisco, the East? No, Los Angeles. I like it down there. How come you're doing this for me? Well, you expected me to, didn't you? I figured you would. That's why I asked Nick to give you the job. Why the act, then? You got what you want, and... Yeah, but... Well, it's kind of a surprise getting it all at once like this. Ah, that's the best way. Keeps us from kidding each other. I wanted to give you the money, and that's why you got it. No other reason. You're a good guy, Fred. You're a real good guy. <laughs> I'm sort of crazy, that's all. I got one more H.E. run. San Francisco to L.A. I'm going to quit after that. When I see you again? No. Fred. Yeah? I want to see you again. Honest. Why? Well, I lied to you just a minute ago. I have imagined things about you. Even like... Yeah? Well... Even like the things you imagined. Well, I thought it was just the dough. I thought so, too. Oh, Mabel. Look, if it was if it was just you and me, just you and me, would this place still look so bad to you now? I don't think so. I told you about that last run of mine. Well, I'm going to make it, and when I get back from L.A., see if you still feel the same way. Will you do that? I'll wait for you. When are you going down? Tomorrow night. Stop in before you go, huh? Okay. <laughs> Don't you want to take some coffee with you? All right. Better hurry it up, though. I'm late now. Here you are. Hope it stays warm. Thanks. Well, I'll, I'll be seeing you. When? I'll be back Saturday. Say, uh, you like dancing? Sure. They're having a big dance up at Bakersfield Saturday night. Maybe we could go. That'd be swell. Okay, then it's a date. It's a date. And, uh, Mabel. Yeah? Hang on to that dough. I'll have another thousand to put with it when I finish this run. Maybe we can buy something we both want with it. Sure, Frank. Hey, Fred. Oh, Nick. Hiya, Nick. Hiya. Uh, Fred, I saw your truck out there. You're running a half hour behind schedule. You better get going. Oh, yeah, yeah, right away. Well, Mabel, I... Fred, don't you want to kiss me? What? Oh, sure. Sure I want to kiss you. Take care of yourself. I will. Goodbye. Bye. See you, Nick. Uh, yeah, okay, Fred. What do you have, Nick? Gee, you like that guy, don't you? What do you have, Nick? <laughs> the usual, pie and coffee. <clears throat> He's a good driver. Mm-hmm. Glad you recommended him. I'm not. Uh, he told me today he was quitting after this run. Uh, that wouldn't be on account of... Uh... Nick, why don't you just forget it? <laughs> oh, sure, if you say so. I didn't mean any harm. I'm sorry. I guess I'm a little jumpy or something. I don't know. What's the trouble? No trouble, exactly. <laughs> The truck, it's a blow-up. Nick, did you... Yeah, 
was the truck, all right, but... Oh. Now, listen, Mabel. It wasn't so bad. Fred jumped before it happened. He was thrown clear. Something must have gone wrong with the truck, and he noticed it before it was too late. Fred's all right? Well, not exactly. You see, he got a shot from the concussion. Where is he? I called the company ambulance. They're taking him to the hospital now. They'll do everything they can, Mabel. Is he going to die, Nick? I don't know anything about those things. But look, I'm going to the hospital myself. I'll call you as soon as I find out something. I'll be here. Hello? Hello, Mabel. This is Nick. I'm calling from Bakersfield. Fred's going to live. Oh. But he's deaf. Deaf? Yeah, they aren't sure yet if it's permanent. There's a specialist here who says he may be able to help Fred if he can operate on him right away. Operation? Going to cost a lot of dough. When Fred came to a while ago, he said he gave you 3000 bucks to keep for him. You better hop a bus and come on up here. And bring the money with you. We're going to need it. Money? You got it, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Good. We'll catch a bus up here right away. Stanford Hospital in Bakersfield. All right, Nick. Goodbye. Money. $3,000. He gave me that money. To get away, to go to Los Angeles. No other reason. To get away. Where's Mabel? No, over there. There's a pencil and paper. Write it down. Yeah. Uh-huh. She, uh... Let's see now. She should have been here by now. Hey, can you read that? She should have... What do you think's keeping her? Don't worry. She probably couldn't get a bus. She probably couldn't? But if you called her four hours ago, I don't understand. I... Fred! Nick, maybe you ought to... Mabel. Oh, Fred. I almost did a terrible oh, thing. Oh, look, honey, I can't hear a thing you say. You'll have to write it all down. Fred, I almost did a terrible thing. I can't understand you, sweet. Here, here's a pencil. I want to tell it to you. Even if you can hear me, you can look at me anyway. I'm ashamed, Fred. For the first time in my life, I'm ashamed. I'll write it down, darling, please. Look, I started to take the bus for Los Angeles. And then I got off be- because I realized... I did realize, Fred. You've got to believe that. All I want now is for you to get well. Please get well. Oh, Mabel. Mabel, you're crying. (laughs) Why are you crying, honey? More apple pie? No, thanks. I think that'll do me. Yeah, what's the damage? 30 cents, penny tax, 31. Yeah. Just right. Thanks. Mabel. Hello, Fred. Honey, I got some terrific news. What is it? You know those oranges I've been carrying from Santa Ana? Uh-huh. Well, I always have to make a check-in stop at L.A. with them. This morning when I stopped off, the guy there hands me this. Oh, Fred, this is swell. I'm going to be a dispatcher. What do you think of that? Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, and you better start packing. We'll be leaving for Los Angeles the first of the week. We're going to live there? Sure. You always said you wanted to, didn't you, honey? And next week we'll be leaving, Fred and me. No more Joe's place. No more watching the trucks go by. Oh, by the way, they rerouted the ATs. They don't come by here anymore. And maybe it's just as well. Well, you know, any guy that'd drive one of those things is playing with dynamite. If properly handled, dynamite becomes innocuous. The laws of physics decree that 
No power is released without a reason. The fuse must be lit. The detonator set before the sleeping destruction is loose. And thus on the San Francisco to Los Angeles run of high explosives, the fuse was snipped in time. The detonator removed from a case of dynamite, created from obsession. In just a moment, I'll be back with a preview of next week's story. vignette from next week's story. A different twist on an old story, one of frustration, when love fails to recognize the symbol of its own creation. A story as free of mystery and murder on the distant side as it is filled with the hesitancies and doubts that arise from the vice-like grip of an obsession. You'll find many forgotten moments of your own life tucked away in the building plot of Windstone, a story you'll hold as a monument to your own happiness and security and love that is sung on the sweet Aeolian zephyrs of the wind in next week's story of... was produced and transcribed under the direction of C.P. McGregor in Hollywood. and fugues and rapturous symphonies composed on the great harpsichord of nature, the accompaniment of light, when that life is filled with the obsession to watch with clear eyes the miracle of young love, and to listen with keen ears to its song in the wind, 
And so our story, Wind Song, starring Rhonda Fleming. <laughs> Distant horizons become closer when viewed from the perspective of a hilltop, as problems become simpler when scanned from the pinnacle of a heart. Love knows its own way. Unleashed, it needs no guide. Its path lies straight and unerring, if we but have the courage to follow. Down this path walks the figure of a lovely girl, Anne Mason, her footsteps at times hesitant, for Anne Mason must reach a decision, a choice in the songs of the wind, the songs that fill her ears with conflicting melody, until their ascending discord becomes almost an obsession. All my life I've loved the wind, the sound of it, the feel of it on my face, cold and biting, or hot with a faint fragrance of other lands and its sting. I've often sat on a hill and looked out towards the far horizon and wondered about the world that lay beyond. It always seemed to me it must be a better world than my own drab, home-to-office life. I lived in a small town, boarded with my older sister Dottie and her husband, Bob. Life and conversation went about the same every day. I knew when I opened the door at night how they'd greet me, and if I was late, I knew what Bob would be saying to Dottie. Hey, Dottie, when do we eat? We've got to wait for Ann, Bob. What's the matter with her? She knows it's Friday and Ed'll be here pretty soon. I like to get to the dance early. I don't like to sit down without her, Bob. Well, just because she's your sister, there's no reason why we have to cater to her. If she'd only marry Ed Randall... Well, then why doesn't Ed ask her? Well, if she had any get-up, she'd see to it. <laughs> Look how you roped me in. Oh, Bob. Hello, everybody. Oh, hello, Anne. Hey, what happened to you? You get lost or something? Oh, no. But it's heavenly out. And I walked home from the office. You walked in that wind? Oh, you must be crazy. But I adore the wind. It's exciting. I love the strength of it pressing against me when I walk. Oh, you talk crazy. You can sit down now, Anne. Everything's ready. Remember, Dottie, how the wind used to blow on the farm sometimes? <laughs> That's right. You used to love it even when you were a kid. Just nuts. Just plain nuts. That's all I got to say. Well, you haven't forgotten it's Friday, have you? No, I haven't forgotten it's Friday. I don't get much chance, do I? Well, what's the matter? I thought you liked to dance. I do. But I'd like to do something different once in a while. I get tired of going the same places, seeing the same people, dancing with the same fellow. Well, you better not tell Ed that. And I get tired of Ed, too, if you want to know. Ed. Well, let me tell you, young lady, Ed Randall isn't a guy to be passed up just like I that. I know. He's good and kind and has a fine job. And pretty soon he'll be head of his department. And next year, he's going to get a new car. And he's got a down payment on a house. Oh, I know all that. Well, a girl could do a lot worse than. Yeah, if I was a girl in your spot, I'd be darn sure a guy like Ed Randall didn't get away from me. He, he, he's safe and reliable. Well, what more do you want? I... I don't know, Bob. I don't quite know. Every Friday was the same. I danced almost every dance with Ed. Nice music, huh, honey? Very nice, Ed. I feel good tonight. Real good. You know what I said to the boss today? No. Mr. Potter, I said, 
These bills of lading ain't made out proper. And he says, I think you're right, Randall. You always are right, Ed. But, Ed, would, uh, would you excuse me a moment? I, uh, I can't dance anymore. I'll be back for the next dance. I promise, Ed. I had to get away. This night had to be different somehow. I don't know why. Maybe it was because of the wind. All I know is I couldn't stand listening to Ed's voice any longer. I went outside, and there, Brad spoke to me for the first time. Hello, beautiful. Oh, you... You scared me. I'm sorry. I, uh... I thought I was alone out here. Pardon me. Oh, oh wait a minute. I'm kind of lonesome out here by myself. Oh, I couldn't. I must go in... My sister will be worried. But you just came out. Well, it, it was stuffy inside, and I... I wanted to be alone. Well, that's why I came out. I wanted to be alone, too, but... I'd rather talk to you. Just for a minute, then. Now, not many girls like going out in the wind like this. Well, it doesn't help a girl's hair do any. Oh, on the contrary. It improves most of them I've seen. Say, here's a bench. Let's sit down and get acquainted. My name's Brad Evans. Mine's Ann Mason. Hello, Ann. Hello, Brad. Um, you're new in town, aren't you? How'd you know? Oh, I've lived here all my life. New face is almost an event in Midland. Do you declare a holiday and celebrate it? That depends. Well, you're right to be cautious, especially in my case. Don't tell me you're planning on being a menace to Midland. I was, but I don't think I'm going to stay that long. Oh, what a shame. Midland needs a little menace. It's much too dull. Yeah, that's why I'm leaving. I wouldn't think of disturbing the calm serenity of your fair city. That is, uh, I was planning to leave up until just this minute. You must be a regular gypsy at heart. Free as the wind. And you? No. My life's not much like that. I live by the clock. Regular boarding house routine, you know. Beans on Monday, roast on Wednesday. And hash on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You're not married, are you? No, uh, not yet. Thinking of it, huh? Well, not exactly. The fellow you came with, maybe. What is this? Information, please? Oh, I'm sorry. It's none of my business, I know, but I noticed you when you came in, and I'm just curious. That's all right. My life's an open book. But I think I'd better go in, Mr. Evans. They'll be looking for me. Hey, if I didn't leave Midland, would you see me again, say, uh, tomorrow night for dinner? I, uh... No, I don't think I'd better. Where can I call you? I live... No. No, you better call me where I work. Harper's Real Estate Office. Ed. Oh, Ed. You won't forget now. Where the dickens are you, Ed? No. No, I won't forget. Good night. Until tomorrow. Ed. Coming, Ed. What are you doing out here without no wrap or nothing? Don't you know you'll catch cold? Why, there was a fellow at the office that caught Ed, cold. I want to go home. Now? But gosh, we only just got here. Hey, what's the matter with you tonight? You're acting mighty funny. Will you take me home or won't you? Okay, I'll take you home. Oh, but for the life of me, I can't figure you out. You act as if something had happened to you. I think you're right, Ed. Something has happened to me. I had dinner with Brad the next night, and the next, and the next. Yes, something had happened to me. Then one night, Brad took me to a carnival, and afterwards we sat for a while on the riverbanks in the moonlight. Ah, say, this is all right. Rippling stream and everything. What do you do, Brad? For a living, I mean. Now, that's a woman for you. Always practical. Oh, I don't mean to be curious. I, I just wondered, that's all. Oh, I, I write a little. Write? An author. Oh, that sounds wonderful. It isn't so wonderful. I make a little money now and then. Sell an article or a story. Most of the time, I'm just roving around. Too interested wandering to bother writing. Don't you ever want to settle down? Have a home? Good Lord, no. Oh, I like to see different places. Meet new people. But the people who love you don't... Well, don't you ever keep track of them? I don't know that anybody's ever loved me. Not the kind of love you mean. Besides, I wouldn't want that. Brad. Well, it ties a man down. 
Oh, I've got memories, same as anyone else. Women I'll never forget, and fellows I've been friends with. But they're part of the past. And there's never anybody you you wanted to come back to? Mm, well, once in a while I thought maybe I'd settle down. But I know it wouldn't work. I'd be on the move again. I see. No, you don't. Just forget it. Ah, oh, come on. We'll have fun and then say goodbye. Is it a deal? Sure. If that's the way you want it. But I think you'd better take me home now. It's getting late. Okay, I'll take you home. Only well, give me a minute more to look at you. These are the moments I never lose. Your face white in the moonlight. Your eyes with tears in them. I'm not crying, Brad. Well, it's just that I... Anne, darling, you sweet, sweet kid. Okay, okay, let's break it up. I'm taking you home quick. Oh, Brad. It's no use lying to you. To myself. I love you. Yeah. I know. I suppose you think I'm a silly little fool. Falling in love with the first man I meet that I haven't known all my life. That's why you've fallen for me. I'm something new, different. A few months out of Midland, you'd wish you were back. Oh, I wouldn't. I know I wouldn't. Oh, I'm fond of you. I, I wouldn't have hung around this burg if I hadn't been. Is, is that all you are? Just fond of me? Yeah, yeah, that's all. Brad. Oh, I'm giving it to you the hard way. That way you'll cry your eyes out tonight and then wake up in the morning knowing how well off you are that I've gone. I'm going home, Brad. Please don't come with me. And wait a minute. No. No. Let me go, Brad. And you've got to understand. You've been clear enough. You've had your fun. Now you're ready to go on your way. Well, go on. And if you ever happen by this way again, drop in and see me sometime. You'll find me in the telephone book listed under Mrs. Ed Randall. And. Blinding, unreasoning anger always has been and always will be the force that dims our perspectives, that leads away from the hilltop view of the horizons, the destroyer of love, that turns into raucous discord the songs of the wind and fills the mind with the slow poison of an angry obsession. In just a moment, we return to our story. The Story of Wind Song, starring Rhonda Fleming. Anne Mason listened to Brad's protestations of love, but the old sweet words fell discordant upon her ears, for their antique poetry was dulled by the clearer notes of honesty that was point and counterpoint like the figurations of a Bach cube. And she left Brad by the side of the river, her ears no longer attuned to the song of the wind, and she became tone deaf in the grip of an angry and unreasoning emotion that is known as obsession. I ran all the way home that night. Dottie called out to me from her bedroom when I came in. Is that you, Anne? Yes. Oh, it's awfully late. Are you all right? 
Yes, I'm, I'm all right. I'm going right to bed. I should think you would, out till all hours. Oh, shut up, Bob. Leave the kid alone. Her affair. Yeah, well, it's my affair, too. After all, she's living in my house. Out with some guy every night that nobody ever heard of. People are talking. And if she won't think of herself, she might think of you. After all, you are her sister. You don't need to worry, Bob. I'll be in every night from now on. Must have had a fight or something. Huh? Well, if only you'd keep your big trap shut. Oh, when I think of poor Ed... Now, listen. If Ed's so darn crazy about Ann, why don't he ask her to marry him? What's he waiting for, a hot foot? Oh, maybe he needs a little prodding or something. Ed's kind of shy. Maybe it'd be a good idea to drop around and have a little talk with him. Yeah, that's what I think I'll do the first thing tomorrow. Yeah, I'll get him to take her to lunch and settle things. Once and for all. And I ask you to lunch with me because I have something to say to you. I know I ain't much on looks, Anne, and I know that I don't stack up too well in education, and I'm not really in your class at all. But I love you, and that's straight. Ed. And this much I know, Anne. I'll do anything I can to make you happy. You've got to believe that. I'm sure of that, Ed. Oh, ever since I was a kid and we were in school, I, I've been crazy about you. I, well, I kind of wish you'd think about it a little before you say anything. I... I know this is a sort of a funny time to propose, but, well, I guess one time is as good as another. You're very sweet, Ed. I don't think I've been quite fair with you. I don't think I've seen things as clearly as I should. I've been living in a sort of a dream world, I guess. Maybe, maybe I'm really growing up now. You mean that there's a chance for me? I'll give you my answer tomorrow night, Ed. I promise. <laughs> Anne, I've been waiting for you. Oh, Brad. I thought we said goodbye last night. Maybe you did. I didn't. I don't ever say goodbye. Really? Anne, you said you understood me, but you don't. It isn't that I don't care for you, I do, but I know myself. And I know that I'm not cut out to be a good husband. I won't ever give you the things you should have. I can't promise security or even happiness. Or we'd live in the rich one week and the next week where... We'd be holed up in a dollar and a half room on a side street, lucky to have a buck to eat on. I want you, Anne. I want you more than I ever wanted anything in my life, but I won't lie to you. I'm only promising you today. Tomorrow, that's another time. Brad, what are you trying to tell me? I'm telling you that if you want to come along with me, marry me and take a chance, I want you. But I'm telling you, too, the kind of a guy I am kind of life you've got to look forward to. It's just whether you want to gamble with me or... a sure thing with Ed Randall. I... I don't know, Brad. I... I've got to have time to think things over. Well, I'm leaving tomorrow night. You know where I live. You can call me if you decide. My way. So, think it over and... be sure, Ann. Be very sure before you decide. Well, I will, Brad. I'll be very sure. Oh, Dottie, I don't know how to decide. I love Brad, I know that. But a girl has to think of so many things. Oh, I know you're having a hard time making up your mind, Dan. I had to make up my mind once, too. You? Hmm. Well, I, I thought there was never anyone else but Bob. There was, though. Back in school, there was a boy named Dave. He wanted me to run away with him. Oh, and Bob came along, and I knew with him I'd always have a home of my own and security. Those things are very important, Anne. Yes. Oh, it's getting late. If Brad was going to call me, he'd have called me by now. Oh, look, honey, why don't we go to a show? Ed's coming over to play Pinochle, and, well, you know how men are when they play cards. Oh, yes, I know. All right. Might as well. <laughs> Bob! Oh, yeah. Anne and I are going to a movie. We'll be back in a couple of hours. And, Bob, if... Well, if anybody calls for me, tell him, tell him I'll be back in a couple of hours. Well, who are you expecting? That friend of yours? I'm not expecting anybody, really. I... Well, just tell anybody that calls I'll be back. Okay. Ed and I play watchdog for you. Oh, 
darn this lock. As sticky as that love scene in the movie. The light's on. I guess Ed's still here. Well, I sure hope Bob hasn't lost his shirt, Dad. He most usually does. One thing I gotta say for Ed Randall, he's always lucky. And if you gotta get married to a man, Ann, you might as well marry a lucky one. Oh, finally got it. Oh, that you, Dottie? No, well, it isn't Lana Turner. Worse luck. <laughs> Pretty good one. <laughs> well, I guess I gave it about over, Ed. <laughs> Hello, Ed. Hello. Uh, no one called, Ed? Nope. Who the heck's gonna call this time of night? <clears throat> Well, come on, Dottie. I expect Ann and Ed. Uh, <laughs> I got things to talk over. I suppose so. Yeah, see you tomorrow, Ed. Sorry you lost to me, but <laughs> you know how it is. Unlucky at cards, lucky in love. <laughs> yeah, well, good night. Good night, Good night, Ann. Good night, Ann. Ed. <laughs> well, well, I'm sure glad Ann is making up a mind sensible like. <clears throat> For a while, I thought she was going to throw herself away on that Evans guy. Just because he's so darn good looking. Ah, women make fools of themselves. A darn good looking? How do you know what he looks like? Well, uh, well, didn't you tell me? Well, I mean, uh, well, I just sort of guessed it. Uh, Bob, look at me. Uh, uh, what's eating you? You think I've done something or something? Uh, look, honey, i got to see a man about a dog. Robert, you come back here. Uh, you can't talk to me like that. I won't have it. Uh, uh, what do you want? You're a bum liar. You're not bright enough. That friend of Ann's, Brad Evans, was here tonight, wasn't he? Oh, uh, uh, no. Wasn't he? Uh, 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 yes, but i got to look out for Ann. She's making a plumb fool of herself. And, uh... Will you stop looking at me like that? What did he say? Well, I tell you, I... I what did he say? Uh, oh, a bunch of slush about being wrong about something. The same old line every guy hands to his girl. <laughs> that he changed his mind. And you told him what? Well, I told him she was out of town. And that she was going to be married, I suppose. Mm, well, something like that. But, but it's for the best. Now, Ed's a swell guy. Oh, yes, Ed's a swell guy. Letting Ann give him her answer without once telling her that Brad was here. Why, of all the two low-down sneaking... Oh, what's the use? Uh, uh, hey, Dottie, now come back. Hey, hey, you're not going to tell her. That's what you think. I've been thinking things over, Ed, and I... Well, I guess I've come to a decision. And, and... Oh, wait a minute. Before you say another word, I... Well, I want to finish something I started telling no, you about No, wait back. a minute, Dottie. This is no time to come busting this in. This is the right time. I couldn't have picked a better one. And... And remember what I said about Dave... The one that, well, he wanted me to run away with him? Yeah. Well, I didn't tell you the truth, the real truth. I didn't tell you that all my life I've regretted that I didn't go with him. That no matter how badly he might have treated me, no matter what might have happened, I'd have exchanged my whole life here for one year, yes, for one month with him. Dottie. Yes, now you know the truth. There's no use having more than two liars in this house. Dottie, what do you mean? Your friend was here tonight. Brad? Yes, he came for you. And those two told him you'd gone away, that you were going to get married. You've gone away for a rest, a long rest. Oh, no. Oh, thank you, Dottie. Now, look, Ann, you've got to understand. Oh, you're so good, Ed Randall. So kind. Such a fine man. So upright and honest. Oh, oh it wasn't as much his doing as it was that precious husband of mine. They're two of a kind, so... Well, so don't make the same mistake I did. Go after him. Maybe it's too late. Brad must have gone by now. Oh, Dottie, I'll never find him now. I'll never find him. Looking for somebody, Ann? Brad. Oh, Brad, you didn't go. Nah. Come on, beautiful. The wind's singing loud tonight. Let's go to our old place down by the riverbanks. We've got a lot to say to one another. How did you know? I mean, that I hadn't really gone away. Well, I can spot a liar a mile away. It was too pat the way your brother-in-law threw it in about you marrying Ed Randall. So I hung around. I saw you come home. I'm glad you found me in time. You see, I have made up my mind, Brad. Are you sure? I've been sure all the time. Well, it was just that I was trying to talk myself out of the truth. You know what you said about there being the Ritz one day and who knows what the next? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I said, but I've been doing some thinking, too. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I can change. Gee, I guess every guy finds one woman that he never wants to leave, and... Well, I found you. You don't have to say that. I don't care. I love you the way you are. Oh, I know there may be days of aching loneliness when you're off somewhere in some crazy chase. I know, too, there'll be good times and bad. There'll be uncertainty and worry and unhappiness, maybe. I'll try to make you happy, Ann. I swear I will. I know you will. Because there's another side to the ledger. 
There's a wonder and beauty of knowing and loving one another. Oh, there'll be the excitement of just being alive, of being together. It'll be like, like listening to the song in the wind. Maybe half the notes are lost. No one hears the words, but the melody's there. Our song, always in our hearts. And again, on the hilltop, not one, but two pairs of eyes view the horizons of tomorrow, their tomorrow. And their hearts beat in unison in rhythmic foundation of their symphony, a song without words. The melodies that are heard in the wind when two souls are filled with the clean, sweet passion of young love and two minds are bound together by the slender strands of a new and glorified obsession. In just a moment, I'll return with something about next week's story. Hunter speaks of the murky clouds of amnesia. How can we return to the place where we left off during our mental sickness? What life is there but the present, shielded from the past? Who are we? What are we? Why are we? Next week, you will hear of a way that clears the fog of a man's amnesia in a drama of Tonight's story, starring Miss Rhonda Fleming, was produced and transcribed by C.P. McGregor in Hollywood. which makes for a mixture of hate, envy, and malice. Add some murky fog closing about a man's mind, 
And that is our story of obsession, starring Barry Sullivan. of early morning sunlight break through the window pane of the room. Out of a drifting sleep, a man is slowly awakening. He rubs his eyes in amazement as he stares from the big four-poster bed. And on the stage of his mind, the demons dance a strange obsession. Hey, somebody, come here. Hey, where am I? Good morning. Now, please don't make so much noise. Oh, who are you? What am I doing here? Well, you had a slight accident last night. I I hit you with my car. Oh, you did, eh? Well, I guess maybe I ought to see my lawyer. I wouldn't bother. It was your fault. I had plenty of witnesses. You were quite intoxicated. Well, why not? But, look, if it wasn't your fault, why did you bring me here? You've never seen me before. No, not that I remember. Then I might as well come to the point. I brought you here for a purpose. You resemble very closely someone I used to know. A man named Robin Marshall. Yes, so what? The name means nothing to you? Nothing. If I didn't know that the other Robin Marshall was dead, I'd swear you were he. But you're very sure this other guy is dead? Very sure. But at first you were not so sure. Why? I know you couldn't be Marshal, yet you're so like him. All right, all right, let's have it. What's the racket? Robin Marshall was killed three years ago in a plane crash in Peru. Go on. There's a girl who was in love with him. She has never believed him dead. She still waits, hoping against hope that he'll return. It's ruining her life. She lives in a sort of never-never land, afraid to face reality. Well, if she's not sure he's dead, how can you be so sure? When the accident happened... The shock was so great that her father insisted we leave her some hope. He didn't tell her that he went to Peru himself to identify the body. I'm the only one that knows that. What's all this got to do with me? Robin Marshall was a crook. She never learned that about him, though all of us knew that one day she'd face a bitter disillusionment. And of course his death spared her that, eh? Exactly. But now she faces something worse. She's dedicated her life to the memory of a ghost. Sure, sure, I can see that. There, uh, there's a man who's in love with her, uh, friend of mine. Uh Uh-huh. But what chance is he against a dream? That's why I brought you here. I want her to live again in the present. I want Robin Marshall to come back to life. Oh, so that's my job. To impersonate a heel? Yes, for three months. And for those three months, I'll pay you $5,000. You'll live exactly as you did before he went away. Yeah, what about the people he knew? The questions I'll be asked. The things and places I'll be expected to remember. Well, you've heard about amnesia? Amnesia? Yes. Well, you were hurt in the plane accident and lost your memory, but uh, somehow you made your way back here. Yeah, what about the father? You say he identified the body. He's bound to smell a phony somewhere. Well, he could have made a mistake. And anyway, he's out of town, and when he's returned, you'll, you'll be firmly established in your old life. My only worry is Marion. Marion? Marion Bingham. That's the girl. Oh. It all depends on her, whether she accepts you as Robin Marshall. If so, there's nothing to worry about. There's one thing I should tell you. A rather curious coincidence. I'm suffering from the same malady I'm being hired to pretend. What? Yes, that's a laugh, isn't it? But it's true. I don't know who I am or where I came from. That's why I wanted to be so sure that you knew the real Robin Marshall was dead. Because the joke would certainly be on you if I turned out to be him. Oh, no. No, it couldn't be. You do look incredibly like him except for one thing. Your eyes. Yours are warm and kind. If it had not for the girl's father's identification, there might still be a doubt, fantastic as it might seem. Three years can change a man more than you think. He could have made a mistake, but I don't think so. And I'm going to gamble on the fact that he didn't. If you're willing, I'll arrange your meeting with Marion. Okay. The sooner the better. 
At least if she accepts me, for three months I'll have a name and a history. You can't imagine what that'll mean. You can't imagine how lost a man can be without an identity. Test, eh, Painter? Yes, Mary is downstairs. I've told her Robin Marshall has come home. It's going to be a little odd being madly loved by a woman I've never seen before. There she is. Why, she's beautiful. Robin! Robin, look at me. Oh, I can't believe it's true that it's you standing here before me, alive and well. Uh, it's been a long time. You must be very sure. But I am sure, Robin. Very sure, indeed. It's your eyes. I'd never forget them. Oh, Robin, darling, you've come home at last. We're almost there now. Do you remember at all how your apartment looked? Well, just vaguely. It was in Browns and... Uh... Uh, quite a lot of wood. Yes, that's right. We did it over together. We were to live there. Oh. We... We will live there. Oh, yes, darling. So very soon. This is it? The one with the balcony and the three windows. Oh. Everything is just as it was when you went away. No one's had the key but me. Here, here. Let me help you out. Oh, thank you. Every time I've been here, I've prayed that before I came again, you will be back. I'm not worthy of a love like that. That's for me to decide, isn't it? And don't forget, darling, love like virtue must always be its own reward. Yeah, I suppose it is. When two people are in love, there's always one that loves more than the other. I don't know why that should be, but it's so. I've always loved you a little more than you ever loved me. And I... I think I'd rather have that way. It's a sort of martyr complex, I guess. <laughs> well, here's your key. There's the door to your manor. Open, my lord, and enter. Well, Robin, what are you waiting for? Well, it's such a small key to open such a large world. Yes, isn't it? Now. Now, do you remember? Yeah, I suppose I do. I can't tell, really. You've been here this morning. Oh, yes, I brought some flowers because I wanted your home to look lived in. As if you'd never really been away. But I have been away. I've been away for a very long time. It's no use pretending. Things aren't the same. They, they can't be the same. Robin. I'll have to learn to live in these rooms all over again. I'll have to learn to... to be with you all over again. I'm not the same man who went away. You've got to believe that. But you only think you've changed. You haven't at all. Well, I knew you better than anyone else. I can tell. I say you haven't changed. What sort of a man was I, Marion? Tell me that. What sort of a man was I? What an odd question. But I must know. You can't remember even that? No. And you're asking me to hand you a character all nicely tailored and ready-made, like... like a part handed out to an actor? Yes. Yes, it would be easier that way. Well, I won't do it, Robin. Whatever you were, whatever you are now, you've got to find out for yourself. Maybe you're right. Maybe you have changed. Maybe you're no longer the man I knew at all. But that's something we've got to find out together. How much a part of my world were you? I've got to know that. The only part of your world that I knew was that which concerned me. Look, Robin, in that desk over there is locked everything that had to do with that part of your life, which I didn't share. I've never opened it. I've never wanted to open it. You'll find the key in that vase. You always kept it there. Yes, oh, yes, of course. I never dreamed your coming back would be like this. I'd always thought of it as being simple. You'd, you'd just take me in your arms, and, and I would kiss you, and there we'd be, just as we always were. Well, the leaving and the returning of people to each other is never simple, particularly the returning. Robin, answer me one question, truthfully. As truthfully as I can. As I am now. As you see me and know me in this little while we've been together, can you say honestly that... that you love me? Honestly? What if I said... I don't... 
don't know. I believe you'd answer me honestly. Well, what are you doing? It's an old record. We used to dance to it. Remember? Uh, sure, sure, I remember. Would you, uh, would you like to dance again? Very much. You're beautiful, Marion. Beautiful. Thank you, Robin. And I... Well, I... You wanted my answer? Here it is. Robin. Oh, Robin, you've never kissed me like that before. You do love me. You do. <laughs> victim of amnesia, has found resurrection and life in the love with Marion. But can we be sure this is Robin Marshall? Here is something like a living ghost, flesh and blood, bone and sinew, with a strong heart that beats with a new excitement. But what about the past? The rising and falling tides of a torn memory become an obsession. And now, back to our story, starring Barry Sullivan. and I can't do it. I see. You've fallen in love with her. Whether I have or haven't is beside the point. I'm telling you now that I'm not going through with this deal. You made a bargain with me. You haven't any out now. I can tell her the truth before it's too late, before things go any farther. I'm afraid you've changed your mind a little late, my friend. I've even told the newspapers that Robert Marshall has come back from the dead. Okay, Painter. <laughs> you've given me a name and a life. I'm really going to move into that life. I'm taking over that name and that world. Not for just a month, my dear painter. Not for just a month, but for keeps. Why, you... And there's nothing you can do about it. Everybody knows it now. You've given out the story yourself. Why, you'd look pretty silly going back on your own word now, wouldn't you? Especially when the girl who loves me would swear on her life that I was the man. Oh, no, painter. You're caught on your own hook this time. And you can dangle there for all I care. You wouldn't have the nerve to do that. Oh, wouldn't I? You don't know me, then. You gave the story to the newspapers. Soon you'll hear them yelling, Robin Marshall's come back from the dead. Well, when you hear them, let me tell you this, Painter. They won't be kidding. Good evening, my dear Marshall. What the... Hey, what the devil are you doing here? And who are you? Ah... So it's true what they say about your amnesia. Don't even remember your partner. Huh. I was, of course, the silent partner. My name is Benton. Hector Benton. What sort of business were we partners in, Mr. Benton? We, uh, we had many interests, Marshal. All of them profitable. Good. Then you can tell me what kind of a man I was. You can tell me what I've done, what I've been. The whole truth about Robin Marshall. I don't want one detail omitted, not one. Very well. I shall start with our meeting, Marshal. It was after the Bancroft affair. You bungled that. It was a very crude swindle, Marshal, but what? it showed you had imagination and initiative. Just what I was looking for. So, with a little guidance, we planned other things. We started going places. We understood each other perfectly. <laughs> Yes? Don't 
don't pretend that you don't know me. That amnesia story. Another one of your tricks, I suppose. Well, again, my past comes calling. You're my second guest tonight. I have no intention of staying. I read about your miraculous reappearance, and I came back to town as quickly as I could. You're, uh, Marion's father. You know that as well as I do. Uh-huh. Now, look here, Marshal. I don't know what's happened to me in the past three years, but I've cornered a little courage from somewhere. And you can't blackmail me anymore. Uh, just how much have I blackmailed you for in the past, Mr. Bingham? Over $100,000. Wow. And what little I've had left during the last three years, I've used to repay most of the money I stole. With a little more time, I might have managed to pay it all. Now I presume there's little chance of that. Uh, Painter said you identified my body in Peru. You must have lied to him. Yes, I did. I wanted him to think you dead for certain. Why? Because I needed his help. With you alive, he'd never help me. He's in love with Marion, and that... Hey, wait a minute. What did you say? I said Painter was in love with Marion. You know that. No, no, I didn't. But I understand a lot now that I didn't understand before. Go on, go on. What were you saying? I know he'd do anything he could for me if he thought it would help him win Marion. You didn't approve of me, but you didn't mind Painter marrying your daughter, if it would help you. I don't admire Painter, but he's preferable to you. Uh I'd rather see Marion dead than married to you, Marshal. That's all I have to say. I'm going now. But remember, stay away from Marion. I mean that, Marshal. Well, Painter, I'm back again. You didn't even begin to tell me the truth about Marshal, did you? Uh, I suppose you ran into Benton. Yes, and Bingham, too. Painter, you really love Marion, don't you? More than anything else in the world. And how can you be sure I'm not the real Robin Marshall? I told you. But we've... Bingham's word for that. But we haven't. What do you mean? He told me last night that he'd lied to you because he wanted you to think that I was dead. He was in a jam. And he knew that loving Marion knew to help him out. Because as a prospective son-in-law, you couldn't do much else. Then... You really might be he. Yes. And if I am, if I was sure that I was the real Robin Marshall, I'd fulfill my bargain with you to the letter. You mean that? I most certainly do. Then let me tell you, you aren't. Marshall would never make such a sacrifice as that. For you do love her, don't you? Yes, Painter, I do. Now look, my friend. I never thought I'd say this to you. But I'd lost. No matter how it works out for you, there's no chance for me. I know that. There is a chance for you and for her, too. I wish I could believe that. Whether Robin Marshall is dead in memory or in fact, you're the man Marion loves. So why not tell her the truth? But for my sake, not all of the truth. But tell her that you aren't sure. And let her decide. Thanks, Peter. That's exactly what I'm doing. Marion, I'm so glad you came. I've been trying to get you all afternoon. Whatever's the matter, Robin? Oh, I, I've got to ask you something. And I'm afraid to know the answer. Oh, don't ask it then. But there's one thing I've got to know. Beyond all doubt, I must know. Whether you are Robin Marshall, is that it? Yes, how did you guess? Ever since you came back, you've been asking that question. In a thousand ways you've asked it. And knowing my own doubt, you still believe? Robin, is it awfully important that you know? Since last night, it is. Something my father said to you? Yes, that and something else I learned. But supposing I were to tell you now that I didn't care any longer whether you were the man I loved three years ago or the man I loved tonight. Marion. All men change. What I loved in the Robin Marshall of three years ago and what I love in the Robin Marshall of today is the same. And to me, that's all that matters. But you never really knew Robin Marshall. You couldn't have known him and loved him. But I did. What I loved in him, no other person ever saw. No one ever knew him as well as I did. I knew him better than he knew himself. But you don't know the kind of a man he really was. I found out. Because I know I... Well, I can't go on like we are. Robin, that first day in your apartment, I showed you a desk and I said I'd never opened it. That much was true. But actually, I lied. I knew all about you before you went away. 
I knew about father and the money. I knew about many other things. That's why I knew you didn't die. You couldn't die with so much left undone, so much wrong that still has to be righted. Because you see, darling, you were searching even then. You hadn't found yourself. And to find yourself, to to really find yourself, you'd first have to come back to me. And you really believe that if I am that man, there, there is a chance that I could find myself? Oh, Robin, believe me, whoever you are, you have found yourself. And that's what counts. What a man is and what he seems to be are two very different things. I know the kind of a man you were. I know the kind of a man you are. It was only that you had to find out for yourself. I... I still don't know what to say to you. Robin, there's been a great deal of wrong done. But much of it can be undone. Don't you see? That's our job. Yours and mine. And if we're strong and we're not afraid... It won't be hard to do. And now I'd like a glass of sherry, if you don't mind. I surely... You know, I... I don't know whether I'm doing the right thing or not. All I know is that... I love you. I love you, and whatever I do, I'll, I'll never knowingly make you unhappy. That's the best vow I can make. That's the only vow I need. Your sherry. Salute. Salute. And now? A kiss. Oh, my sweet... I'll never forget the first time I kissed you. No, will I? You see, that's the first time I really knew the other Robin Marshall. You have been listening to Obsession. has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. The great river of life sweeps poor mortals on and on. It is serious business steering a true course with very little time for comedy. But in every life, as in the theater, there comes a lighter touch of laughter even when laughter becomes tailored for murder. And so to our story, starring Anne Gwynne.
men have minds which seem to be controlled by others. And those in control, very often women with domineering traits, can cause the unsuspecting male a great deal of trouble. We find Hector Habermeyer tossed about like a chip on the running sea, always at the mercy of beautiful Phyllis Stanley. Here is the story, almost a tragedy, woven by the sharp, needling mind of a woman who had to dominate until it became an obsession. Hector? Yes, Phyllis? I think you're wonderful. Gosh. You too, Phyllis? Uh Uh-huh. What do you want this time? Oh, Hector, why are you always so suspicious? I'd like to know why I wouldn't be. I've been wrapped around your little finger so many times, I'm beginning to look like a wedding ring. I'm sorry, but honest, this time, I'm only thinking of you. Phyllis, you really really mean it? Uh Uh-huh. Tomorrow night, would you like to drive me to Centerville to Mildred Rappaport's dance? Mildred Rappaport? Phyllis, you know your father told you that you could never, never go to another of Mildred's parties on account of the last time Yes, I know. This time he's not going to know anything about it. But, Phyllis... I haven't got a car, and there's no bus since Mrs. Murphy had twins and refused to drive it anymore. Father has a car. Fat chance of his loaning it to me. You know what he thinks of me. Papa would never know, Hector. He's sick in bed. I've got the key to the garage. Oh, Hector, please. All right. All right. I know something awful's going to happen, but I'll do it. Uh, I'll meet you at the garage at 8.30. You're just wonderful, Hector. Oh, I'm so glad I know you. And I'll try not to spill any salt or break any mirrors. And I'll wish on the moon just for luck. Why have to make more noise than an airplane? Oh, I wish I was in one right now. Uh, I mean, I wish I was in one right now. I'd feel a lot more comfortable. Where's your overcoat? It's huh? so cold out tonight. You'll freeze. Don't worry about me. I, I'm just as warm as toast. Well, I'm not. You must have unit heat. Oh, where's the key to the garage? Here, and don't talk so loud. All right. Here, hold this box. In. Anyway, it's for you. For me? Yeah. Oh, Hector. Hector. Orchids. Oh, you shouldn't Come have. on, come on. Let's get out of here. I- I'm nervous. Orchid. My very first. Oh, Hector, I'll bet you pawned your overcoat to buy these. Get in and don't talk so much. Is the key in the ignition? No, but here's a duplicate. Oh. I had it made while Papa was getting shaved today. Uh, I guess he didn't know what a close shave he was getting. Hector, did you really pawn your overcoat? No, I, I gave my old one away. The tail is just ain't finished with my new one. You mean you're really going to get an honest-to-goodness tailor-made overcoat? Sure, sure. Made a little extra money. Uh, You know, out of my inventions. Your (laughs) inventions? What on earth did you ever invent? A silencer for a soup spoon. Come on, come on. Let's get out of here. You know, Hector, you're really awful sweet. I guess I don't appreciate you the way I should. Oh, gosh, Phyllis. Uh, nothing matters except that we're together and going to a party. Do, do you realize this is the first party you've gone to with me since... Gosh, I don't know when. I know. I feel kind of as if it was Easter or something. Oh, Hector, you make me so ashamed. And I promise I'm never going to be mean to you again. And this time it's a real promise. I cross my heart and hope to die. I... Oh, 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 I'll be... Oh, Hector, what happened? Oh, flat tire. For a moment, I thought God took me literally. Well, what are we going to do? What can we do when we have a flat tire except change it? Oh, dear, in the car, Papa will find out, and I'll be late to the party, and... Uh, There's a car coming, Hector. I'm going to hail it. Maybe they'll give us a lift. But, 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 what good's a lift? I I can't leave your father's car parked here in the middle of the road. (sighs) He stopped. Well, what do you know? It's little Phyllis. Oh, Archie. And Hector. Archie. Oh, hello, Archie. How wonderful. You're just in time. Are you by any chance going to Mildred Rappaport's party? No place else, beautiful. Uh, trouble, bud? Yeah, but I can... A flat tie. Uh, nothing to it. You just hop in here beside me, beautiful, and we'll be there in nothing flat. But, but Phyllis, you, you, you can't... Get it? Nothing flat. <laughs> Very funny. I like to flatten... Oh, that's wonderful of you, Archie. Uh, you won't mind, would you, Hector? I'll see you in the morning. But, but, but your father... But, but, well, we got to get home. I, I mean, the car... Don't worry about nothing, bud. I'll take good care of the little woman. Goodbye, Hector. That's but, for everything. But... Oh, women. Women. <laughs> It is a 
few minutes past six the next morning. A tired and very cold Hector is driving Phyllis's father's car back to its stable. But Hector's thoughts are on the perfidy of women. He is so engrossed, he almost runs down a hitchhiker, a man in a gray overcoat. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, mister. I, I almost didn't see you. Yeah, I noticed that. Uh, going my way? Uh, uh, sure, sure. Climb in. Oh, mighty cold this morning. Yeah, cold as a woman's heart. You haven't got an overcoat, have you? No. And believe me, it'll be the last time I have... Oh, what's the use? Say, uh, we're just about the same size, aren't we? Yeah, I guess so. You notice this overcoat? Yeah. Gee, your guy couldn't help it. That's beautiful. You know, all my life I wanted one just like that. And the hat, too. That's one swell outfit, mister. Yeah, it is. You can't get cloth like that now. It's a very unusual coat. Tailored for me by my Bond Street tailors, London. London? England? Uh-huh. Gosh. Oh, uh, stop at the next corner I get off here. Yeah. I uh, say, son, um... Uh, how would you like this coat? Oh, would I like it? You know, if I was rich, I'd buy that coat from you. Oh, well, you don't need to. I'll give it to you. Huh? G- give it to me? Are you crazy, mister? <laughs> I'd only give it to someone else. I'm tired of it. You've done me a good turn, you know. Uh, Emerson's Law of Compensation. Yeah, but, but... Here, here. Take it. And I'll throw in the hat for good measure. Josh, I, I can't believe it. I, <laughs> I think I'm dreaming. Only I... I don't like accepting favors like this. <laughs> Ah, uh, don't you worry, old chap. You're really doing a favor for me. You don't know just how big a favor yet. <laughs> well, now, what do you suppose he meant by that? Hello. Is Mr. Hector Habermeyer there? Uh, did he get my message when I called a while ago? Oh, he did? And he didn't leave any word? Oh, he didn't. No. No, thank you. I'll call back. Phyllis! Phyllis, where is the evening paper? I've looked all over the place for it. Man can never find anything he wants in this place. The women always beat him to it. Where is my paper? Papa, for heaven's sake, don't scream so you'll burst a blood vessel. Besides, I didn't touch your silly old paper. Papa, what's that in your hand? Why is the evening paper, of course? It... Oh. Oh, so it is, isn't it? I must have picked it up or something. Yes, I guess you did or something. Oh, Papa, the telephone didn't ring or anything. I mean, Hector didn't call me, did he, Papa? No, Hector didn't call me, did he, Papa? But I saw the little twerp downtown. Oh, you did? Yeah, what's happened to him? Did someone leave him a gold mine or something? What do you mean? Well, I never saw such a sight in all my born days. Instead of the measles, Hector's broken out in a rash of new clothes. Where he got the money, I don't know. But that coat he was wearing today must have cost a fortune. And a hat, the first time I ever saw that long head with a hat on before. Hector? With a hat on? Who was he with? Huh? Oh, that silly little Barbara Dingles. And she was hanging on his arm as if he was going to blow away. Barbara? Hm. Well, I like that. But then Hector never did have any taste. Where were they going? Who do you think I am? A crystal ball or something? The way they looked, you thought they were headed for the moon. Oh. Uh, gray tailored overcoat. Gray felt hat. Hmm. Uh, and a murder over in Centerville last night. Oh, they're always having murders in Centerville. Papa, did... Did Hector look interested in Barbara? Not that I care, of course, but... Some guy bumped off in an apartment house. No means of identification. But the night clerk swears he can identify the murderer. Oh, Papa, who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Well, listen to this description of the murderer, and you'll care. A short, stocky man dressed in a beautifully fitting gray English tweed overcoat. Also wearing gray felt hat pulled low over his face and... But what's that got to do with... Oh, Papa... Gray English tweed overcoat. Gray hat. Yes. Yes, the very same outfit. It couldn't be too like it in the whole country. Couldn't be a better picture of Hector Havermeyer if they'd photographed him coming out of the corpse's apartment. But, Papa, Hector couldn't kill. Well, not even a man. Why, it's ridiculous. Ridiculous or not, I'm going to call the police. Please don't. You're crazy to think it's Hector. And and anyway, Hector couldn't have killed anybody last night. He, he, uh, I mean, he just couldn't have killed anybody. Why couldn't he? The way I felt last night was a fine night for a murder. And besides, what do you know about Hector's not being able to kill anybody last night? Oh, nothing. It's, it's just so crazy. Besides, there are a lot of great coats in the world. Not like that one there isn't. No, sir. I'm going to call the police. No, Papa. Let me talk to him. And if he did it, it must have been for a good reason. Oh, gosh, it's so thrilling. Hector Havermeyer, a murderer. <laughs> I never knew he had it in him. <laughs> 
A fine night for murder, Papa said, and the two articles of clothing worn by the murderer pointed to Hector. A gray English tweed overcoat and a gray hat, once worn by a stranger, now adorn the forlorn frame of Hector. And all this because Phyllis had to have her own way, giving little thought to the man who loved her. Her self-made pedestal was nothing but a growing obsession. In just a moment, we return to our story. Turn to the pattern of gray tweed in this story, tailored for murder, starring Anne Gwynne. Hector Havemeyer has suddenly acquired new glamour, squiring a beautiful girl, and not Phyllis. Dressed in a very fine tailored outfit, he is the bon vivant of the boulevards. Phyllis has woven a complicated pattern, and now filled with tiny darts of remorse, starts to tear down the structure of deceit she willfully built. But maybe this is only another facet of her character because, finding herself scorned, she may erect a new and more complicated dwelling to house her selfish and thoughtless obsession. Hector? Yes, Phyllis? I know you have a secret, Hector. But you know, you can tell me everything. I won't breathe it to a soul. I know you had a good reason. Good reason for what? Well, for... Oh, you know what? I don't know any such hey, thing. Hey, Bud. Oh, Hector, it's a policeman. Hey, Bud, uh, are you Hector Havemeyer? Who, me? No, your second cousin. Come on, Hector. Get the lad out and come along with me. I arrest you for murder. What is this, a joke? Sure, it's a joke. All murders is jokes. And the corpse. Only corpses can't laugh. But, 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 uh, but who? I, I mean, what? I, I mean, whom did I murder? I don't know. When we was introduced, the corpse wasn't wearing nothing but a couple of orchids. <laughs> well, then, officer, I don't believe it was Hector. Hector doesn't like those kind of people. Do you, Hector? Well, he don't know one of them kind now because he ain't around any longer. Oh. And no matter what the corpse was wearing, we know what you was wearing. And it was a snazzy outfit. That snazzy outfit you got on right now. Oh. Gray English tweed overcoat. Cut beautiful, just like yours. Hey, it's nice material. My grandfather had a coat like that once. He was buried in it, God rest his soul. Uh, but to get back to you, Hector, you wore that coat to the murdered man's apartment. That hat, too. You can positively be identified. But, 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 but this coat, it, it, it isn't mine. I mean... Oh, I... so you stole it, eh? Hector. Yeah, your boyfriend's not only a murderer, he's a thief. Oh, Hector, you told me it was made especially for you. Oh, he did, eh? Well, then he's not only a thief and a murderer, he's a liar as well. You just gotta listen to me, officer. I, I was riding along, minding my own business, like I said, when I ran over this fellow in the gray overcoat. So, and... you're a hit-and-run driver, too. So... Now, Hector, don't talk anymore. Every time you open your mouth, you put the electric chair in it. Oh. You said it, sister. But it's true. I, I gave him a ride. We, we were both the same size, and he was so appreciative that he, he handed them to me. Uh, this was 6 o'clock yesterday morning, and well, I... what was you doing out at 6 o'clock yesterday morning? Answer me that. And also, where'd you been? I, I... I... Hector? Oh, yes, Phyllis. I forgot. Well, I... 
I, I was just kind of nervous, officer, and I, I was riding around... Not and... only are you a murderer, a thief and a liar, but a hit-and-run driver. Oh. Well, come along with me, bud. You've got a lot of explaining to do, and you'll do it to a judge. Shut case against Hector Havemeyer. Hmm. Hector Havemeyer held for sensational orchid murder. Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, I told you that jerk wouldn't come to no good end. Papa, I've got to go down to the jail and see him. No daughter of mine is going calling on a murderer. But, Papa... Young lady, you stay right in this house where you belong. I know Hector didn't do it. At first I was excited. It sounded kind of romantic knowing a murderer. But when you think maybe he can be electrocuted for it... Oh, Papa, I've got to see him. He's innocent and I know it. What do you know about it? I... Nothing. Uh... Or about him either, it turns out. That cock and bull story about his being given that coat. Fiddlesticks. You know as well as I do that Hector hasn't got a car. Papa, there's something I've got to tell you. Well, save it till later. I've got important business to attend to. Uh, but Papa... Get my coat and hat and don't bother me. I'll get the car out of the garage. Are you going downtown? Yes, but you're not going with me. If that's what you're hinting. Well, I was only going to the store for some yarn. I'm all out. Oh, all right, all right. Come on, but I'm in a hurry. <laughs> Hope this old crate starts. That's the trouble when you don't drive cars often. And you get kind of balky. Maybe it's leaking or, or something. Leaking what? Gas. Leaking gas? A lot you know about cars. Well, what's this? I... Oh. A box. A box like you put corsages in. What's it doing here? Nobody ever gave me no flowers. Uh, I, I... I don't know. I'm sure and I... And a petal from the flower still in the box. Huh. An orchid petal. Oh, so that's it. Just as I thought. Hmm. Motor dry as a bone. Not a drop of gas in the car. An orchid petal in the front seat. Sure, sure, that's it. That's where Hector Havemeyer got his car. From me. Why, that low-down, dried-up shrimp. That sniveling excuse for an ape. Papa, what are you talking about? Hector Havemeyer, he stole my car. This is the murder car. I'm going right down to the police. You can't, Papa. There's no gas. Then I'll walk. Now, Havemeyer, you talk and talk fast. No more fancy stories. From now on, we want nothing but the truth, the whole truth, to so help you. And even the truth won't help you. But I've told you everything, just as it happened. Except where you were, what you were doing out, and where you got the car. Mr. Officer, hasn't anybody been here asking for me? What do you expect, Santa Claus? Well, I just thought maybe that... Well, perhaps... Well, well, you do too much thinking and not enough talking. Come on now, talk! Hey, who's coming in here? Oh, officer, I... This is a third degree, can't you count? Officer, I got valuable information. I'll hang that low-down excuse for a man. I wish somebody would make up their minds whether I get electrocuted or hanged. Why, you poor sniveling little... Oh, how do you do, Mr. Stanley? You stole my car. What? Yes, not only that. Here's the box. The murder corsage came in. No. Oh. Is this true, Havemeyer? Did you steal this man's car? Uh, I, yes, yes, it's true, but I, I didn't steal it, though. I just borrowed it. Borrowed it? Listen to him. Borrowed it. All right, that'll do, Havemeyer. Now we've got everything except the confession. But... Not that we need it. We can electrocute you without it. No. Hector. Hey, what do you think this is, Grand Central Station? Oh, Hector, I'm so sorry. I hope I got here in time. Yeah, just in time to hear your footloose boyfriend admit he stole my car. Who is this dame? She ain't no dame. She's my daughter. Oh, Hector, I'm so ashamed. And when I think that you would have paid with your life rather than tell the truth... Oh, Hector, how can I ever thank you? Oh, gee, Phyllis, what's a mere life when you're concerned? Hey, what is this? Old home week or something? Officer, what time was the murder committed? Oh, kind of early. Round nine, I guess. Why? Oh, because of Archibald and the gas station attendant. Phyllis Stanley, what are you talking about? They're both outside, both of them. And they'll help me prove to you that Hector did not kill that man in Centerville. He couldn't have. Watch this. Officer... Hector was with me in the car. It was my corsage. Hector pawned his overcoat to buy it for me. Then Papa's car had a flat tire. What? You were with him in the car? He was taking me to Mildred's up before his death. I thought I told you... All right, now, never mind the homework. Let's have the story. Well, it was nearly nine when he had the flat tire, just a few miles out of town. Then Archibald came along. He'll tell you himself if you're asking. Later, later. Go on, sister. Well, then I got in Archibald's car and... And left Hector, all alone in the middle of the road with Papa's car. You trust that lunkhead alone with my car at nine o'clock at night? I tell you, officer, never have a daughter. It's a great mistake. And this other man, the gas station attendant, he fixed the tire, so that'll set the time. Mm. 
You mean you went to the party and left this poor goop sitting in the middle of the road waiting for morning to come along? Yes, and I'm so ashamed. Well, Hector, if all this checks, I guess you're free. I ought to have known that any guy as dumb as you wouldn't have sense enough to commit murder. Hector, I've misjudged you, I'm afraid. I guess I owe you an apology. Gosh, Mr. Stanley, don't apologize to me. I I, I couldn't bear it. You let me do what I want. After all, a man's got to admit he's wrong once in a while. But I... Will you shut up, you little pie-faced twerp? And let me apologize before I beat the few brains you've got out of your head? Now listen to me. I apologize. Uh, Yes, Mr. Stanley. Hector? Yes, Phyllis? Hector, would you do me a great big favor? Why, why, yes, Phyllis. Oh, my gosh. You're falling for that line again, Hector. I take that apology back. Don't pay any attention to him, Hector. And this time it isn't a line at all. I swear it isn't. I... You remember what you asked me a long time ago? I've asked you a lot of things, Phyllis. But this was very important. You asked me to marry you. Oh, oh yeah. Well, Hector, I, I thought if you'd do me a great big favor and ask me again, I I might think very seriously about saying yes. You did? I, I mean, you would? I, I mean, you will? Yes, Hector. Oh. Good heavens, Hector. You fainted. Now I know you really care. And long, long ago, someone said, What a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Thus, full of remorse and seeing the fine and beautiful love of Hector for its real value, Phyllis destroys forever her selfish obsession. In just a moment, I'll be back with a preview of next week's story. white violets mean to a young and beautiful bride of one day? What strange twisting and torture, what doubts and fears are distilled from the perfume of lovely white flowers? And where is the key to the lock of this girl's mind that will open up the doors to peace and beauty? You'll find yourself wanting to help this lovely girl. You'll find her wanting to relinquish the grip on her past in next week's story of Session. Starring Ann Gwynn was produced and transcribed under the direction of C.P. McGregor in Hollywood.
thing to ourselves. Some with deep meaning, and some like the tinkling of little Chinese glass bells. With all purposes, these songs do their part to offset the thousand and one tragedies, both great and small. Perhaps we employ these songs for a definite reason. Perhaps the subconscious is trying to lift us above the shambles and remnants of sorrow by this mechanism of healing. But when the songs are no more, when they fade and die, we are prey to ugly harmonies that bear no relationship to song. They play across our minds like the discordant cacophony of pounding hammers upon metal, pounding, pounding, pounding day and night in the brain. And so, in just a moment, to our story starring Miss Miriam Hopkins. I never had to see or speak to a man again as long as I lived. Gee, that's good copy. Have you heard from uh, Gloria Day, Mrs. Carter? No. How do you feel toward her? She's crippled for life, you know. Is she? It doesn't concern me. I don't know her. Didn't you ever meet her? No. You've seen her in musical shows, haven't you? No. Please, I, I've got to get on the train uh, now. Just one more, Mrs. Carter. You had no idea your husband, David, was uh, interested in Gloria, huh? No. You thought he still loved you. Yes, I thought so. If it will thrill your readers, put it in. Oh, please, I... Uh, yeah, I, I got you, ma'am. Can't you let the lady go into the car? Can't you see she's faint? Oh, no. The train conductor, hold her up. Boy, what a shot. Thanks. I, I'm all right now. Now, wait a second, Mrs. Carter. Just one more. Do you still love David? Well, you ought to keep your reporters away from these trains. You haven't answered, Mrs. Carter. Do you still love your husband? I loved what I thought was my husband, not the one ahead in the baggage car. Oh, boy! Now, goodbye.
your pillow, Mrs. Carter? No, thank you. Anything I can do? No, thank you. Dora. What? Hello, Jim. Oh, I, I didn't expect to see you. I thought you might be on this train. I'm up ahead. I was walking through to see if I could find you. May I, uh, may I sit down, Laura? You know how terribly sorry I am, don't you? Yes, I know. Thank you, Jim. Were you going up to New London anyway? Well, I wired Mother this morning that I'd come home for the weekend. I never thought I'd be going up like this. I thought a lot of days, so... Yes. It seems a great many people did. Would you rather I didn't talk about it? No, I suppose I'll have to get used to it. People talking, I mean. You've suffered horribly, haven't you? You stood up with a fellow and I, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Ten years ago this month, wasn't it? Yes. Ten years ago. We never saw a great deal of each other in New York, but... It wasn't intentional. He and I seem to want to be just together. At least, I thought so. But in the summers in New London, it was different. We saw you there. We've made our plans to come up as usual next month. Well, we won't be there. David loved you. Did he? You know that. You know that he did. I thought so. But I was wrong. Oh, it's difficult for you now, the shock of the accident, and, and I suppose you didn't know anything about her. I never knew such a person existed until the police phoned me. The next day I learned plenty from her story in the papers and the sob sisters and the reporters at the feet. Poor Laura. Oh, I've always read about dumb wives, and I've laughed and felt so superior. I never knew I was just a dumb wife myself. You weren't dumb. You were decent and loyal. It didn't get me much, did it? I can't bear to hear you talk like that. It isn't like you, Laura. It is. Now. But there must be some other side to the story. I... I know David loved you. David was devoted when he was with me. I say that over and over. How could I have been so dumb? And then I say, how could I have been otherwise? There wasn't the slightest change in our relationship from the first eight years. Maybe there was some hope. Men are, men are different than women, Laura. Isn't that a difficult excuse? We're all human, aren't we? Is there any reason why men should be less decent than women? I'm not trying to excuse him. I'm trying to understand. No matter what has happened, David was fundamentally a fine man. There must be more to this than, than you found out. If you could realize that he did love you, it would help now that he's gone, wouldn't it? Oh, no, it wouldn't. Do you think it matters to me whether a love so worthless and so weak do you think it matters now whether that love was sincere or not? Yes, I think it does. You worshipped him. No. I worshipped what I thought he was. Well, so what? This trip to New London ends it all forever. Oh, you mustn't become hard like this. You've always been gentle and kind and so full of fun. My fun evidently wasn't fun enough for him. Laura, can't you try to think of the beautiful things that you had together? No, I, I've forgotten them. They're wiped out forever. I don't think so, dear. You don't know. I know how happy you both were when, when baby came. Oh, Jim, don't, please. You can't forget things like that, Laura. And what happened? I know. You lost her. I thought I'd die when that happened. David put his own misery in the background so as to help you through your grief. They say things are meant to be. Maybe my baby was never meant to live through this grace of a father. David wasn't selfish, Laura. He needed you then. But as soon as you were strong enough, he insisted on your trip to Bermuda. You remember? Yes, I remember everything. While you were away down there, David was so tragic, so desperately alone. Well, he got over it, didn't he? He met her. We were all so happy when you came back and you started to smile and be your old self again. Can't you realize now how all of us, all our new London crowd, are loving you now, wanting to help and, and still loving David, too? I know. I know how kind you all will be, but I want to break clean from everything. Won't you come over to the house, Laura? I've phoned Mother before I left New York. She wants you to come. Thank her for me. I can't. I can't bear sympathy. Are you planning on remaining for a while? No, I want to get rid of the summer house. I'm going back to New York tonight. Friends help, Laura. No. There would be too many men. I don't want to pass the school we attended. 
I don't want to go by the church where we were married. I don't want ever to see our house again. Look at the boats on the water where we sailed. I don't want to meet the people we played with or were brought up with. I want just one thing. What? I planned it all out. I shall leave you here, never come back. I don't intend to go back to our apartment. I'll go to a hotel. I'm going to wipe out every connection and every thought of the past ten years. Poor, foolish Laura. No one can wipe out ten years of their life. I can. You think so, but you'll become bitter and cold and hard. You'll build a wall around your pride and your anger, around your hurt and your grief. At least they'll be hidden. No, they won't. A wall of that sort is like a hothouse. It makes the worthless plants grow and thrive and until they, well, they choke out all the sweet, natural, tender ones. Maybe that's what I want. It'll be for my good. Maybe a woman should be hard for self-protection. You can never be that. Can't you try to remember the good things, the happy things? Give them all your attention. Neglect this one unfortunate happening of it. As time goes on, you'll find that even the memory of it is gone. He lied to me. Even the day he was killed. He left a note on my dresser that morning. In it, he wrote that he loved me. That I was all that mattered. It may have been true. I think it was. Then he went out with her and was killed in a drunken auto crash. Fine love. He was sober when he wrote you the note. Why do you defend him, dear? You wanted to marry me once yourself. Yes, I did, but you chose David. I suffered then, Laura, but I didn't let it lick me. And I gained two good friends, you and David. Pardon, Mrs. Carter. Yes. We're coming into New London. Oh, are we? Oh, thank you. Memory drives a thorn into Laura's mind as she thinks about the ugly death of her husband. One pounding thought, that of her husband, another hammer stroke, the other woman in his life. For him to have shared his life with this woman is as bitter as a cup of hemlock and as poisonous. The song is ended, but the rhythm goes on, pounding into a deep obsession. Just a moment. We return to our story. Very thoughtful, the train and all. I couldn't... No, 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 I'm coming with you. You can't be alone, not now. 
Oh, uh, driver, take us to the nearest forest shop, will you? I, uh, I don't want any flowers, Jim. David loved them. You both did, remember? You two were pretty crazy over that rose garden, Laura. Do you mind if I get some for him? I have no right to say no. You want to do it? Stop, driver. Here's the florist. Oh, Jim. Mm -hmm. Look, in the window. They're beautiful, aren't they? White roses. I'm going in. I want to get them for him. Myself. alone on his grave. No. They're all he would have wanted, ever. Yes. Jim. What is it, Laura? Would you... Uh, will you break off one of the roses for me? Of course. Thank you. Now I... I can take something back with me. I wish I could persuade you to stay. No, and you needn't come in with me. I'll be all right. Goodbye. And thank you. Goodbye, Laura. Seat 11. Here you are. Thank you. Will you lower the shade, please? The car's about empty. Wouldn't you like to sit on the other side? You won't get the afternoon sun over here. Very well, I will. Perhaps you'd like this pillow. Yes, please. I'm so tired. Oh, conductor. Here. Here's my ticket. I don't want to be disturbed. Are you getting off at 125th or Grand Central? Grand Central. I'll call you when it's time. Thank you. Laura. Laura, dear. Oh. Oh, I was dreaming again. Laura, wake up. Infatuated for a while. I grew to hate her. 
Why didn't you break off? Why didn't you tell me? Oh, I, I couldn't. I was ashamed and afraid. Did she love you, David? No. I had money, position. She wanted that. Oh, if you told me, I would have understood. I wish I had. It went on and things got worse. She threatened a suit. I'd sent her foolish letters when we were home that summer two years ago. Dave. I couldn't buy them back. She wanted everything. I, I left you the note last Tuesday morning. I found it after you'd gone to the office. It was true, Laura. It said, I love you, dear. I've always loved you. No one has ever meant anything to me but you. Your foolish husband, David. Your foolish husband. I thought it was more of your sweet nonsense. I laughed all day whenever I thought of it. Till Till the police phoned you that I was killed. Yes. And then she told the reporters everything. I thought we'd both go. I never knew that would happen. You mean... I mean I ran the car over that embankment deliberately. She was going on with a suit unless I... I'd ask you for a divorce. David! Oh, David! Can you forgive me, Laura? Oh, I was wrong. I should have faced it all and come to you with the truth. I'd have stood by you, David. I would have. I know that. I wanted you, no matter what you'd done. And you'll always have me, dear, if you'll believe in my love. I will. I will. I knew today when I passed that floor shop, our shop, darling, where we used to go. I knew then I did love you. Dear Lord. There were white roses in the window. Jim was with me. We went in and bought all he had for you. Oh, my dear. I, I must go now, Laura. Oh, don't leave me. I won't, dear. Let me come back. But how? How can I? My love and forgiveness. Everything else that happened will vanish. And Laura. Yes, dear. Be kind to Jim. He talked to me so wisely, David. I tried to fight, but what he said went deeper than he knew. He was our friend. He is our friend, and he loves you. I don't want you to go on alone. Oh, that could There's be. only love where I am. And this love knows no selfishness. This love knows only the good, those we love. Goodbye for a while, my darling. No, I wasn't sleeping. Maybe not. Anyway, you look awful refreshed and rested. Oh, here's your flower. Must have dropped it here in the aisle. Oh, thank you. Funny thing about that white rose. All this way you've traveled and it still looks nice and fresh. They're beautiful flowers. I have a garden full of them back home. Hey, that's mighty nice. I bet you sure got somebody taking care of them while you're gone. While I'm gone? Sure. Pretty things like that can't just be left. I expect that's the first place you'll look when you get back home. That's your garden. You want it just the same as when you left it. Oh, I... I hadn't thought of that. Hello. Is this the long-distance operator? Oh, well, uh, this is the party that's been calling New London, Connecticut. I wanted to talk to Mr. Jim Randall, 26 Elm Street. I I didn't have the number. You have a call? Thank you. Hello? Hello, Jim. Hello. Jim, this is Laura. Oh, yes, dear. Where are you? Well, I'm in New York. Laura, dear, is there anything wrong? No, no, Jim. It's just that that I want you to do something for me. Well, of course. Jim, will you get in touch with Foley, my gardener? Yes, I believe I can locate him. Oh, but you must, Jim, you must. Tell him that I want him to go back to, out to the house. I want him to be sure everything's all right with the flower garden. Now, what is it, Laura? Well, Are I... you coming home? Jim, I... I don't know. But all this about the flower garden, I don't understand. Jim, don't you see? Somebody has to take care of the garden. Of course, dear, only... Because, Jim... Jim, if I ever did come back, it's the first place I'd look to see if it was... Just the same as when I left it. And a dream changes everything. The first notes of a glad new song rise 
in Laura's heart as she faces life now with courage. Gone forever are the tympanic pounding, the discord that pushed her to this obsession. In just a moment, I'll be back with a preview of next week's story. become divided by the furrows and ridges of the mind? And where does the hate stream end? These are questions with a definite purpose flung before the opening curtain of our story, A Story of Clinging Hate, starring William Gargan. when flying was a dangerous profession, some of the more daring pilots found their way to the airline run above the towering Andes. Here, disaster lurked on every mountain peak. It was in San Mario, a tiny refueling station on this airline, that Ted Jordan stood in the pilot's room staring out into the dense blackness. Before his mind, the vivid picture of Mary glowed back in the shadows. A lurking hate for someone was ready to stalk and cover all good emotion. This was a grinding, relentless surge of obsession. Well, uh, 
You've got something on your mind, kid. Come on. Come on, spill it. Oh, it's Mary, Nick. Mm-hmm. I thought so. She's been gone two weeks. Seems like a lifetime. You know, it's a funny thing, kid. When you first came down here to fly this run, I figured you was a guy who traveled alone. You just didn't seem like the kind who let a woman get under your skin. Huh. <laughs> of course, that was before I met Mary, your wife. I think she's tops. You bet she is. There aren't any more in the world like her. Where'd you ever find a girl like that? I wondered myself, Nick. Seems like Mary came along at the time I needed her most. She kind of drifted into my life about two years ago when I was flying the Salt Lake Mail out of L.A., and she was a hostess on the Frisco Passenger Run. I'd seen her around, and we knew each other, but I think it really began one day in the restaurant at the airport. I was having an argument. Mr. Jordan, I don't do the cooking here. I just serve the stuff. Stuff is right. I wouldn't feed that junk to a pig. Take it back and bring me what I ordered. But this is what you ordered. I wrote it down right here. Don't call me a liar. You can take this junk and scrape it off the floor. Oh! You and this whole chiseling outfit can get down and pick it up. Say it like that. And that. <laughs> Mr. Jordan, I'll have to pay for this. Pay for it in my eye. I'll pay for it. Then I'll tear this place apart and you and all the rest of it with it. Huh? But, Mary, they just... Don't try to explain to me, you hot-tempered idiot. I don't know what got into a ma'am. All of a sudden, he I just... I know, I know. Ted, get down there and pick those things up. But he tried pick to... Pick them up. Go on. Oh, all right. There. Satisfied? Yes. And the next time you start throwing things, I hope someone throws them right back at you. Hey, Mary, wait a minute. Well, what do you want? Walk over to the office with me, will you? Come on. Mm-hmm. Ted, why do you do things like that? Well, because nobody's going to play me for a sucker. There's one thing I hate. Oh, a... Ted, the trouble with you is that you don't understand any other feeling but hate. Now, wait a minute. Somewhere along the line, someone must have hurt you. And ever since then, you've been fighting back without knowing what it is you're fighting. You're a funny kid. I wonder why it is I, I never noticed before that you were pretty. You know, you're darn pretty. Don't change the subject. All right. I know I'm everything that's rotten and no good, which is what you're going to tell me, but that's the way I am, so let's go on from there. You know, I happen to think you can be broken down. You can't be too tough not and have a brother like yours. You know my kid brother, Mary? Of course I do. Gave me a second-hand course flying at breakfast this morning. Yeah? He tells me Wade McCary is going to give him a couple more hours, and then he'll be ready to solo. How do you like that? My baby brother. Sixteen years old. Not out of rompers yet and flying airplanes. Sure. <laughs> and when he gets a few hours piled up, he's liable to show you you're not the only hot pilot in the family. <laughs> You've got a swell brother, Ted. Well, you ought to be. I raised him from a pup. The only thing I haven't been able to do for the kid is teach him to fly. Never had time. He'll be all right in the air, though. He's got it in him. You think an awful lot of Billy, don't you? More than I've ever told anybody. Mm, yes. There's a heart somewhere inside of you made of iron, I think, but there's some soft spots in it. Well, I'm sorry, Ted. I've got to run. The chief stewardess is waiting for me. Oh, wait a minute. What are you doing tonight? Let's have dinner and see a show, huh? Sorry, I already have a date. Who is? Wade McCary, Billy's instructor. Oh, McCary, huh? Tell him three's the crowd. I'll see you at your apartment at six o'clock. You can't, Ted. I've already promised him. You've changed your mind. I'll explain it to him. See you at six. Listen, Jordan, let's not have any trouble. I made this date with Mary a week ago. I'm not making any trouble. She's going with me. Please, Ted, be reasonable. I'm being reasonable. Go on, McCary. Take a walk for yourself. Okay, you're asking for trouble, Ted. Okay, I'm asking for trouble. Why don't you do something about it? Now, get out of here. I'll throw you out. All right, if that's the way you feel about it, Ted. I'll leave. I'm sorry. Goodbye. There's only one way to handle guys like that, and that's treat them rough. Yes, and there's only one way to treat people like you, and that's like this. Hey! There, maybe you understand that. What's the idea? You had a slap coming to you. You think you can get anything you want with your fists and that hateful temper of yours. You're not living in the Middle Ages, Ted. Oh, I guess I've done it again, haven't I? You certainly have. No, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why I do things like that. I, I know it's all wrong. I, I do it before I think. Maybe it's the way I'm made. I, I don't know. All I could think of just now is that I wanted to be with you and McCary was standing in the way. 
You've got to change, Ted. If you don't, that... That evil that's in you is going to make you terribly unhappy. Something frightful is going to happen. I know, Mary, but before, it's never mattered much. I, I never cared what anyone thought or how anyone felt. It. Maybe I've been wrong. You have been wrong. You know it. Why not give me a chance to prove that I'm not all bad, Mary? I, I, I promise I'll try. All right. I'll give you a chance. But so help me, from now on, whenever that hateful disposition of yours comes out, I'm going to slap you seven ways from Sunday. Hey! Hey! Look where you're going, fella. You want the whole sidewalk? Ted, it was an accident. He didn't mean to bump into you. Accident my foot. He's one of those smart guys who thinks he owns the world. I'm going to... Ted! Huh? Come on, this time the left side of your face. Oh, for the love of Mike, did you see that guy, Mary? He cut right in front of us. That's the kind of guys I hate. Hold on, baby, I'm going to get even with that guy. I've had to chase him all night. Ted, stop the car. Uh-oh. Look at me, Ted. Okay. Night, Ted. If you've got to take the mail out at six in the morning, you better go home. There's uh, something I've been wanting to ask you, Mary. Well? How have I been doing? Oh, you're doing swell. I'm really proud of you. Oh, thanks. I, I've been thinking about you and me, and now I see the whole thing. <laughs> when you're around, I feel different, oh, almost as if I were another guy. That's, that's on the level. And what it all adds up to is that without you, well, I'm no good. Do you, do you get what I'm trying to say? Well, uh, hmm? don't you think you could uh, say it a little more plainly? <laughs> I guess what I mean is that I, I love you, Mary. I don't want us ever to be separated. And, and what's more, well, I... Well, uh, how about it, lady? Can, can you use a husband? Oh, okay. <laughs> Darling, you know... You said once that I'd never been happy. Well, I didn't know what you meant then, because I didn't know what happiness was. I, I just didn't know the difference, that's all. And uh, then you came along, and all of a sudden, I, I find there's a reason for living. It, it's wonderful. We'll save our money, and then you won't have to be flying the mail run. We can settle down and live like other people. <laughs> you know, that's what I want to... <laughs> the thing I've always laughed at and kidded other guys about, uh, now I want a house, You'll be there, and whenever we go away, we can think how swell it's going to be to get home. Mm. Sounds nice, doesn't it? Yeah. I'll call Wilson, tell him to take the run for me in the morning. We'll pick up a plane, whip down to Las Vegas, and be married tomorrow afternoon. Is it a deal? It's a deal. Well, come on, come on. Start getting your stuff back. Well, uh... Hello? Yes, this is Ted Jordan. Okay, go ahead. Put the call through. What is it? Long distance. Oh. Somebody calling from Fresno. Oh. Hello? Yes, this is Ted Jordan. Who's this? A carry? Where? He's... How'd you get out? I'll be right up. Stay there, I'll be right up. Billy's dead. Oh. He and McCary. Night cross country. Ship caught fire. McCary bailed out. Bailed out and left the kid in the ship. Oh. I'm going to kill him. Ted. I'm going to go up there and kill him. Ted, Ted, wait. I'm going with you. McCary, huh? There you are, you rat. I, I know how you feel, Ted, but believe me, there, there was nothing I could do. Nothing you could do but leave that kid up there to burn. You didn't try to get him out. You did it to get even with me. Uh, Ted, let go of me. I, I tell you, I couldn't help it. I, I tried to get him out. You jumped and left him up there. You murdered him. You killed my brother. No, 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 Ted, I didn't Ted, get... stop. Listen Why to you... me. Let him go, Ted. Let him go. All right. <laughs> let him go. Go on, live. But you live knowing I'm going to pay you back, McCary. I'm going to pay you back. <laughs> story 
Story of Hate, starring William Gargan. The smoky little room at the airport faced the tall, steep cliffs of the Andes. In their shadow, the deep canyons were dark. And dark hatred burned within Ted's soul like the top fires when lightning strikes in the tall timber. In Ted's mind, the wall of angry, burning dark flame mounted into a roaring obsession. So, that's how we happen to be here, Nick. Mary and I got married and came down here to get away from trouble. Uh-huh. Well, Ted, whose idea was it? Uh, I mean, you're coming down here. Oh, Mary's, naturally. She was afraid what I might do if I was up in the States any place where I might run into Wade McCary. Oh, you still hate him, eh? I guess I'll always hate him. When Mary's around, I don't think about it so much, but once she's away, it all comes back to me again, and I think how good it would feel to have his neck between my two hands. No, take it easy, no, take it easy, Ted. Mary will be back soon. She'll come back looking like a million dollars. With all those new clothes she's going to buy over in Port Domingo. I'm worried, Nick. It's two weeks since she left, and I haven't even had a letter from her. It's not like Mary to stay away like this without writing it. If she'd gotten a letter off the day she got there, I'd have had it by now. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm glad I'm not married. You married guys worry too much. Of course, if I was married to a swell girl like Mary, uh, <laughs> maybe I'd worry too. Jordan? Oh, hello, Sparks. What's on your mind? Well, that telegram you sent to your wife at the Hotel Caprio in Port Domingo. Yes? Uh, did you get an answer? Let's have it, will you? Well, it isn't really an answer, Jordan. The telegraph office in Port Domingo just reported back that Mary wasn't there. She checked out of the hotel four days ago. Four days ago? Well, I can't blame her. This is a rotten place for a woman. Stuck away in this godforsaken spot. Not even anyone she can talk yeah, to. Yeah, but you don't know, Ted. Don't get upset until you're sure. Well, I tell you, Nick, I'm... Right back where I started from. You know why this happened, Nick? Wade McCary. If it weren't for McCary, Billy would be alive, and Mary and I'd be living in the States, and we'd have a home. He's responsible. Ted, Ted, now don't look like that. You're talking out of your mind. You shouldn't say those things. Well, what do you know about it? Well, oh, then shut up. But Ted, I'm only trying Get out of here, will you? Get out! <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. Thought I heard somebody out here. It's four o'clock in the morning. What's the matter with you, Ted? I couldn't sleep. Came out to have a cigarette. Anything wrong? No, no, nothing's wrong. Ted, cook says it's three nights since you've eaten anything. He wants to know if there's something wrong with the way he cooks it. No, no. Tell him the food's all right. Maybe you'd like him to fix you something special. A little something extra. I don't want anything. Leave me alone, will you? All right, Ted. All right. Did you call for me, Sparks? Uh, yes, Jordan. We've got trouble on trip 17 coming in from Rio Pass. What's wrong? Well, the electrical system in the ship has gone out, lightning or something. He called me just before it went dead, said he didn't have enough gas to get back to Rio. He's going to have to come on in. See, that's tough. Any passengers aboard? Yeah, none registered. Well, what do you want me to do? Now, this is serious, Jordan. Trip 17 is going to come in over this storm. He can find the valley all right on compass, but he can't get down through this storm. So? So the skipper wants you to go up with your ship and guide him down on the beam. Got no radio at all, huh? Nope. Transmitter faded out just as he got his last message through, and I haven't been able to raise him since. I don't know, Sparks. The storm may be plenty thick and high. Are you sure he's up over it? Yep, he's up in the clear. He said he was at 16,000, and the storm was a 1,000 feet under him. You see, Jordan, if he tried to bring down that crate through the soup line, he wouldn't have a ghost of a chance. Yeah. I have to put flares on the wings of my ship if he's going to follow me down. Uh, Skipper already taken care of that. Oh. The flares are hooked up and the ship's ready to go. I see. What time is he due over? Well, when his radio faded out, he was over Quantero Pass. That should put him over the field in, in 30 minutes. Can you make it? I think so. Good. I'll keep in touch with you from down here. And you better come down slow and easy. There's a new pilot on this trip. It's his first run in. Oh, that's great. Who's the guy? Well, some fellow the line shipped down from the States. Name's Wade McCary. Wade McCary. Yeah. You know him? No. 
No, no, no. I never heard of him. Well, you better get going. You've got a long climb up through this storm. Yeah. Yeah, long climb. I'll be seeing you, Sparks. Jordan to San Mario. 11,000 feet. Black as your hat and still raining. Going on up. San Mario to Jordan. Trip 17 should be there when you break out on top. If you don't see him, take a look around. He's coming in on a compass. Okay? Okay. I wonder how you'd feel, McCurry, if you knew we were coming up to meet you. Guess you never thought it would end this way, huh? You'll die and they'll drag your body off a mountainside and I'll be there to see it. Jordan to San Mario. I've broken out on top in the clear at 14,000. I've spotted trip 17, okay? San Mario to Jordan. Nice going. Where is 17? He's coming toward me from the southwest at about 15,000. I just pulled my flares and he sees me. Okay. Let him come in close and then come on down. Let me know if there's any trouble. Okay? Okay. Come on, McCary. Bring your coffin and get behind me. Jordan to San Mario. Starting down. Hold your lights on the field until I call you. Okay. Okay, Jordan. All right, Billy. Wherever you are, watch me get this guy. Watch me lead him into a mountain. Just a little further. Then a quick turn, and that'll be it, McCary. All right, baby. This is where I'm getting off. Jordan, are you doing all right? Jordan to San Mario. We're doing all right. What's the ceiling and wind? Okay. You have 800 feet. Wind southeast 5. The rain's thinning out. You'll have some visibility. Okay? All right, Sparks. Tell them to light the field. I'll have trip 17 down in 10 minutes. Well, that's your pretty little airplane, Spox. Swell job, Jordan. The skipper will see that the head office hears about this. Nothing to it, Pappy. Uh, mind if I turn in now? <laughs> no, of course not. Hey, it's funny. You look different. What do you mean? Oh, I don't know. When you went out of here, you looked like you were man of the world. <laughs> Doggone it if you're eating smiley. That's something new for you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> Glad to see it. I was worried about you. Good night, Spox. Good night, Jordan. Mary! Oh, Ted, darling, it's so good to be back. Mary, how did you get here? I came in on trip 17. Darling. Ted, what's the matter? Mary, why did you come in on that plane? Well, the truth, honey, is that in Port Domingo, I heard that Wade McCary was going to work for the line, and this was his first run in. I uh, wanted to be here when he arrived. You understand, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I... I understand. I was afraid that perhaps there might still be some old memories, you know. Mary, uh, this is going to surprise you, but uh, those memories are all gone now and now and forever. Oh, Ted, that's the most wonderful thing you could say. Are you sure? This time I'm sure, Mary. I knew McCary was coming in on trip 17. And the plane with the flares that brought us down? I was flying it. You'll never know what went through my mind up there. But you were with me when I needed you, Mary. I saw your face and heard your voice. Oh, Ted. I, I know now, Mary, that the, the old Ted Jordan that you helped me to fight was lost tonight. And he'll, he'll never come back. Believe me, he'll, he'll never come back. Ted, I'll realize the beginning now. I know it. 
This is the beginning of the happiness we've waited for. Uh-huh. It seems that uh, a long time ago, there was three wise men who were guided by a star. Tonight, just one not-so-wise was guided by his star. What do you mean, Ted? Well, uh, sometime I'll tell you, darling. Sometime I'll tell you. <laughs> You have been listening to Obsession. circles of moon fantasy in the forests of moon mist lore. In the fog of the subconscious, there hang great and entwining branches that point strange fingers toward you and seem to whisper in the midnight breeze, Art thou a doubter of my work? You will hear the story of such in a moment when Theodore Osborne creates the role of Edgar Allan Poe in the story of a solitary genius, a man surfeited with a black and morbid and horrible obsession. It was again the blind poet Homer who said, Genius is a state between heaven and hell. And he who shall there reside will neither be understood nor yet have mundane understanding. He will never be forgiven, nor will he heed sup forgiving. He shall always stand solitary and alone, to be scorned yet have no wit for scorning. Such was the precarious estate of the tragic Edgar Allan Poe. Within the whirls and convolutions of his brain, there sprang dazzling flashes of a pure white light of fantasy. And the times, in contrast, there formed eddies and whirlpools and turgid thoughts of black despair and melancholia. He was a man within himself, a man neither understood nor understanding. That is, with but one exception... There was but one beautiful and ethereal light of his existence. The light he immortalized, forever and eternal, in the sweet and pathetic lyrics of Annabel Lee. That was the celestial name he gave to her. Of course, her earthly name was Virginia Clem. wonderment can inspire such music, then I beg of you to continue your wonderment, my dear. Oh, oh no, no, please, don't stop playing. That melody of yours fills this room of our little house until it becomes as the marble halls of iron. How many times have I told you about flattery turning my head? Do you suppose flattery might turn your head sufficiently for me to kiss your lips? Oh, my dear, it's just so silly and so wonderful. And I love you so. Oh, dear. Thank you. You know, Virginia... If love were the only coin of the realm, none could be as wealthy as we. And I would buy you gowns of lace, jewels of the most priceless. And you should live in a palace of Italian marble with 40,001 servants to do your bidding. Oh, which reminds me, Edgar. The butcher called today asking again about his bill. He threatened to cut off our credit. Oh, if I were only St. George and that infernal butcher a dragon, how I would thoroughly enjoy skewering him upon my spear and... What did you tell him? What was it I could tell him? 
tomorrow, perhaps the next day, perhaps the day after. I had no money in the house, you know. Yes, I know. I wonder why poets must always be forced to starve, freeze, and eat cheese and get it like a mouse. Oh, we shan't always starve and freeze, Edgar. Someday you'll be famous. Oh, I just know it. I'm sure of it. Yes, you're as sure of it as you are of tomorrow's breakfast. But, darling, there's no need to become disheartened. There's no reason for us to be unhappy and discouraged. Why, Edgar, look what we have that the others haven't. Yes. Mildewed linen, moldy bread. And a shack over our heads that even cattle would be disgraced. We have love, my dearest. And freedom. Freedom? Yes. Look, Edgar. And what? That bird sitting on that old stump out there. I I think it's a raven, isn't it? Mm, yes. On the surface, his life is black and ugly, but, but his soul is free. Oh, the spaces of the heavens belong to him. He can fly under the sun. <laughs> but I'll bet he can't write poetry. No, he can't. But you can. His wings give him flight. But your poetry gives you flight that shall last beyond the life of... Oh, that silly old bird. Yes. Perhaps. Beyond your life, Edgar, you shall live. And beyond his life, there will be nothing. Your life, our lives. But they shall be forevermore. And his life shall be... Nevermore. Nevermore, quoth the raven... Never more. Uh, Virginia, excuse me. I'm going to my room. You're going to your room? Yes, to my room. And Virginia, don't disturb me. The raven is going to quote Nevermore. And Edgar Allan Poe, in that one word, I promise you, shall live forevermore. In the frenzy of inspiration, Edgar went to his room, sat at his desk, and pondered head in hands just how he should plan this poem. He did it all rationally with sober reason not in abandoned, drunken madness, as it has been said. His was a frenzy which all poets know, the poetic frenzy of inspiration that drove him on and held his thoughts to their purpose. Thus it was that he planned first the length, then the impression and tone of the poem, planned the refrain, and finally he wrote the last part first so that he would have some definite entity toward which to build. In this way, Edgar Allan Poe worked in that poor, cheap, little house. And so grew those 108 lines of mournful and never-ending remembrance. The Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while he nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came... Is some visitor tapping at my chamber door? Only this, and nothing more. It was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Vainly he had sought to borrow from his books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, of the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. But presently his soul grew stronger, and hesitating then no longer, he opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore? This he whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore! Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all his soul within him burning, soon again he heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Open here he flung the shutter. When with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. <laughs> and perched upon the chamber door. Perched and sat, and nothing more. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, from the nightly shore. Then quoth the raven... <laughs> Much he marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. 
But the raven, sitting lonely upon the door, spoke only that one word. <laughs> Prophet Raven, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angel name Lenore. Quoth the raven. <laughs> but that word, our sign of parting, get thee back into the tempest and the night Plutonian shore. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Then quoth the raven. <laughs> and the raven, never flitting, still is sitting just above the chamber door. And his eyes have all the meaning of a demon that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And the soul from out that shadow shall be lifted. Fortune, my dear. No more moldy bread and cheese that even the mice refuse. Oh, Virginia, my dearest, we're rich and we're... Oh. What's the matter, Edgar? Darling, what is it? Didn't they buy it after all? Yes, Virginia. They bought it. Listen. Yes? For all rights, privileges, publications, and copies for your poem, The Raven. Please find enclosed check in the amount. In the amount of ten dollars, Virginia. We are rich indeed. Nevermore. <laughs> the beautiful Annabelle Lee. The sweet chime of music. That was to Edgar Allan Poe the very essence of life, died out upon the morning air, and there by the wild sea pounding, and in the presence of heaven's angels, he buried her. Then his footsteps turned, and the predestined track led him on to a new and strange experience. In the ancient scroll, it is written that the angel Israfel gives to his chosen only once in 10,000 years the power of vision into the future. Edgar Allan Poe, the chosen of this angel, had caught that prophetic crystal from the realms above, had held it, guarded it in his heart, and now he stands without the portals of the strange and foreboding house of Roderick Usher. In his own words, hear him tell in the flash of genius the most startling narrative that mortal ear has ever caught. As I approached the ancient domain of Usher, I sensed a peculiar atmosphere, one which had no affinity to the air of heaven, but which reached up from the decayed trees and the gray walls and the silent ponds, a pestilent and mystic vapor, dull, sluggish, faintly discernible, and leaden hued and I became aware of a great factor, or crack, which, extending from the roof of the building in front, made its way down the wall in a zigzag direction until it became lost in the sullen waters of the town. I crossed the heavy bridge of the moat and went, filled with that ominous feeling, to the ancient portal of the house of fire. my friend, Roderick Usher. I wish shelter and warmth. Tell your master that an old friend has come to call. 
that his name is Edgar Allan Poe. Very well. You may come in. You will wait here in the hall while I inform Mr. Usher of your arrival. As the cadaverous servant disappeared into the gloom of the long, vaulted corridor, my gaze wandered to the tomb-like structure of my surroundings. I say tomb-like only to describe the decaying furnishings and architecture in which I felt strangely confined. Ancestral portraits hung loosely and dull within cracked, cobwebbed frames. Grinning masks of armor peered out from the shadows. A great circular staircase wound and coiled like some black, ugly serpent into the reaches of the room. Oh, Edgar Allan Poe. Roderick. Upon my life, I've never been so surprised. Let me look at you. It is you, isn't it? It is Edgar Allan Poe, not some uh, specter come to haunt these halls of Usher. It is truly I, Roderick. And I think it is only weariness, hunger and cold, which lend me this specter's mask. I hope I haven't intruded. Intruded? My good man. Well, let me say that no visitor to this house has ever been more welcome than yourself. Oh, but come, we'll not stand here in the draft of the hall. We'll repair to the warmth and comfort of my studio. Will you allow me to lead the way, my friend, Edgar Allan Poe? Now. Now, if you will comfort yourself with the fire and the great chair, we'll talk. And I think we have much to say, haven't we? You have much? And I have little. But tell me, Roderick, how have you been? Have you been well? Since you've asked, I can only tell you the truth, Edgar. I trust it shan't frighten you or disturb your visit. I fear that I am falling heir to the same sickness which has held my sister in its bondage. Are you speaking of Madeline? Do you mean to tell me that she's ill? Oh, yes. But I can't conceive of illness striking such beauty of both body and soul that is Madeline. The Madeline that I knew. Life is a strange thing, Edgar. Oh, uh, will you excuse me, please? Yes, come in. Well, Philip, what is it? I beg your forgiveness for this intrusion, sir. Yes, yes. I have just returned from the room of the Lady Madeline, sir. She... she is worse? She... she wants me to come to her? No, sir. I beg to inform you, sir... That the Lady Madeline is dead. Ladies and gentlemen, as the lips of the servant of Usher pronounced the dread words, the Lady Madeline is dead. Slowly the great ancestral clock ticked, devouring the minutes and hours that passed in morbid reverie. The bells of the tower still swayed in their half-crazed dance. And I found myself standing with Roderick Usher within the subterranean copper line vault that was now the tomb of his lovely sister, the Lady Madeline. Roderick. Roderick. Will you not leave her side now? To gaze upon death too long, my friend, is destructive to the soul of the living. Yes, I know. But Edgar, I, I can't believe it. Somehow my mind refuses to accept the truth. This is my sister. No, oh, Roderick. This was your sister. Now, oh, Edgar, please, please. Look at me, Roderick, and listen. Life is the end. Death is the start. And only through death may life begin. The survival constructive value of this life is the only medium through which man, civilization, empires may achieve the ultimate of perfection. In the fulfillment of the two cardinal laws of God, birth and death, do we only see beauty in its most perfect form? All things must end, Roderick, before they can begin. And not as consolation, not as condolence, do I say to you that death is the life of everlasting peace and triumph, that before the dawn of that perfect era of creation shall break, 
Before we stupid infinitesimal minutiae of commonplace episodes shall find the perfect karma of achievement, peace without war, a metamorphosis of death must decay this flesh of the lust and germinate the cell of new life that shall be forever without the pallor of death. But, Edgar, surely... These things I know, Roderick. How I know? Why? But I do know them. As surely as I know that as man shall die, so shall civilization. But as the selfish forms of social organization shall fall, so also shall fall the house of Usher. And then, Roderick, then will come the miracle of birth and the phenomenon of everlasting life. The days wear on, and Roderick Usher, last of the symbolic line that reaches far back into the history of civilization, sinks deeper into his morbid shell. Only his music, the strange, half-mad innuendo of sound that seems to emanate from the depths of his soul, continues on through the murky nights and lurid days to console him. Then, knowing that human companionship alone can hope to break this introverted mania, Edgar Allan Poe breaks in upon the solitary usher and diverts him from his vigil of lone sorrow. Roderick. Roderick. Yes. You must stop this. You must put an end to this means of self-torture, Roderick. If you don't, you shall go mad. And I shall go mad. Body and soul can't stand it. Edgar. Yes. Edgar. My sister is dead. And your sister's brother shall also become dead if you don't cease this vigil of wanton self-effacement. Have you ever heard the voices of silence? Have you ever listened to the words of condemnation echoing from the shadowed corners from rooms, from hallways? No. Roderick, don't give way to hysteria. This is no hysteria. Well, I'm not mad. I'm insane. The voices I have heard were not the mumblings of imagination. I tell you, Edgar Poe, they were real. Repeating the same words over and over. What words? She is not dead. She is buried alive. In the name of God, Roderick. Wait, wait, Poe. Oh. Listen. I hear nothing. Edgar Poe, look as I am looking. See as I am seeing. And if your eyes do not see as mine, then I am truly the rest of reason. Mad, insane. The door. <sighs> Oh, God, the Father Christ. The Madeline. Father. Roderick. Why have you done this to me? Oh. Madeline. Madeline! The body of Roderick Usher fell with a mad shuddering upon the now lifeless corpse as a filament enfolded this death. From that chamber and from that mansion I fled aghast. And suddenly there shot along the path a wild light. And while I gazed, the crack in the castle rapidly widened. My brain reeled as I saw the mighty walls rushing asunder. And there came then, through the brilliance that can come only from catastrophe, a strange and perplexing sight of things to come. <laughs> have been listening to Obsession. a simple word, a word of only six letters, but one fraught with more portent and undercurrent than all the words in the modern lexicon. 
E S C A P E. Escape. The running away from the here to the there. From the known into the unknown. When the present is a knife twisting the wound and the pain is beyond bearing. Escape is an anesthesia, a snare, and a delusion. A pitfall into which so many run afoul. In a moment, you'll hear the story of a man who ran away from himself. A thousand miles, ten thousand miles, yet could not leave one inch from his point of embarkation. The title is Ebb Tide, starring Gail Page and Elliot Lewis. A narrative of a strange and mind-leeching obsession. It is the inexorable order of the universe that as the mystic magnetic forces of the moon sweep the tides of earth into the high mark of flood, so again are they swept out to that shelving reach that is known as the ebb. It is of this that we speak, the low level in which man, in his equation of life, occasionally finds himself. When the forces of hope and courage and ambition and faith are swept up beyond sight by a strange, inexplicable toss of fate. To quote the master, as the tide goes clear out, so must it always come clear in, that the line of failure and success is so fine that man scarcely knows when he's upon it. And thus, in a great hospital, a small group of men are gathered, let us call them men in white. The scene is one of dignity, of scholarship and learning. White-haired Dr. John Cummings, chief surgeon, is speaking. Gentlemen, we are gathered here this afternoon to pay tribute and respect to a colleague, a gentleman whose skill in the surgical theater and whose keen understanding of human ails belies his age and commands for him our deepest admiration and pride in calling him one of us. Gentlemen, it is my honor to present the Schofield Award of Medicine to Dr. Philip Halstead. May I state in passing that Dr. Halstead is the youngest man of our profession to ever receive this award. Dr. Halstead, in the name of medicine and humanity, my sincerest congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Cummings. Gentlemen, I can't tell you how grateful I am for your acclaim. It humbles me all the more to know that such gentlemen of wisdom have placed so much confidence and responsibility in me. And in accepting, I can only make the same vow again that I did make once before. I swear by Apollo, Panacea, Hygieia, and all the gods and goddesses, and make them my witness, that I shall carry out the regimen of the sick and afflicted and give them of my knowledge. And gentlemen, it is my constant prayer to one God that he will grant me an ever-continuing power of that knowledge. Fellas, 
Tell us. Oh. I beg your pardon. My Phil, what on earth are you doing home at this time of day? Uh, Mr. Danvers, may I present my husband, Dr. Halstead? How do you do, Doctor? Quite well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Danvers is an old friend of mine, dear. He just dropped in to say hello. Extremely nice of him, I'm sure. Now you'd better run upstairs, darling, and change clothes. You smell like a hospital, and it positively makes me sick. I'm not staying, Phyllis. I'll be home later. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doctor. Uh, Phil! Gee, isn't he dreadful, Reggie? He's got a jealous streak in him a yard wide. Well, do you blame him, my dear? After all, coming home and finding your lovely wife being kissed by another man. Halstead, I'm turning over that Jackson case to you. I want you to operate in the morning. I didn't tell you what you're up against. I think you know. What? I said, oh, uh, I, you... I beg your pardon, Doctor. I heard you. I was thinking about something else, I guess. Yes, I'll take care of the case. In fact, I'd better run up and take a look at him now. At him, Doctor? I was referring to the case of D-19, Mrs. Jackson. Mrs. Jackson? Yes, of course. How stupid of me. Yes, after you make the pre-surgical examination, Doctor, you'd better go home for the rest of the day. You'll be in for quite a siege in the morning. Siege? Yes, I guess you're right. Well, you finally decided to come home. Do you know what time it is? I was waiting until he left. He? Please, Phyllis, let's not be children. At least pay me the respect of being reasonably intelligent, if nothing else. If you're in a mood for dramatics, Phil, it's not too late for you to go downtown and see a show. I understand the one at the palace is very highly dramatic. I saw all the shows I want to see this afternoon, Phyllis. I should like to know if the show's ended or will there be another act. Don't be absurd. I'm not being absurd, Phyllis. I'm being deadly serious and I want you to be the same way. Well? Phyllis, won't you understand? At least won't you try to understand that you're married to a doctor. And that as such, your life and mine must be kept without any stigma of the cheap or commonplace. We've too much responsibility, Phyllis. Too many things are expected of us. <laughs> you're not only a doctor, Phil, but it seems you're a preacher as well. Now, I know a lot of ministers that would envy your sermons... And if you want to be serious and high and mighty, all right, Phil, I'll play. Maybe I can preach a sermon, too. Go on. You and your holier-than-thou department and your so-called dignity of medicine. I'm not married to a man. I'm married to a bottle of iodine or a can of ether. I'm married to Mrs. O'Callaghan's stomach ulcers or somebody's bursted appendix. What do you expect me to do, Philip? Sit around the house all day with the blinds pulled down, reading the American Medical Journal, while you walk up and down hospital corridors and pressing patients and chucking pretty nurses under the chin? All I expect is that you conduct yourself as any respectable wife should conduct herself. I don't expect you to turn this house into an entertainment parlor for your old boyfriends. Particularly of the ilk that you entertained this afternoon. Well, of all the colossal ego... Not ego, Phyllis. It's only that I want to respect my wife as I respect my profession. The way I want others to respect her, too. You're becoming dreadfully pedantic and boring, Philip. You'll excuse me if I retire... Phyllis, I'm not through yet. No? Then I'm afraid you'll be talking to yourself. And I seem to recall reading in one of your books someplace that talking to oneself is a symptom of being somewhat wacky, shall we say. Good night, Phil. And then one night, when Dr. Hulse had returned to that domain he had called his castle, he was stopped by a silhouette against the cinematic screen of the window shade. What he saw, we shan't repeat. But in that moment of seeing, the house crumbled and the tides swept out to the sea. And that next morning, a patient died under the knife of Dr. Halstead. A death that should not have been, but was. And the word if became huge in his life, for if these things had not happened... Dr. Halstead would not now be on this tramp steamer bound for nowhere in particular. And he would not have been in the bar as he is now. I beg your pardon, sir, if you don't mind me saying it. Drink it so much of that there rum in the tropics this way. It's pretty blinking bad, sir. Don't you think you've had enough? I've had too much, but not of rum. You can fill the glass up again. I can pay for it. Very well, sir. If you insist, but we'll be ducking in the morning. You'll be wanting to be top hill sheep, sir. Well, I want advice. I'll ask for it, bartender. Fill up the glass and keep filling it up until I tell you to stop. (laughs) 
Howdy, mister. Hello. Welcome to Tahiti. Mind if I sit down? No. I saw you got off the boat this morning. Must be planning to stay a while, huh? Maybe. Well, I was about buying a girl a drink so as we can toast to your happy stay here, huh? A drink? Sure, why not? Here. Here's five dollars. Go over to the bar and buy yourself anything you want. Just make sure you drink it over there. Sure. Okay, Mister, I get it. You want to be alone, huh? That's right. I don't know what the idea is, but you sure picked a spot for it, Mister. Outside of a few rum dum sailors blown in here once in a blue moon, there ain't but six whites on the island. Just as a tip, Mister. Being alone in this devil sinkhole ain't for guys like you. Thanks for the tip. Bartender, give me a check. Right, you are, sir. That'll be two dollars United States currency. Uh, here you are. Thank you, sir. And whenever you want another little nip of something to ward off the fever, <laughs> this is the place to get it. Nothing but the best. That's what I carries. I'm sure you do. Uh, wait a minute, mister. Here's your five bucks. I ain't thirsty just now. You can buy me a drink some other time. You better buy yourself one right now, so as you can drink to my long and happy stay here. That's what you said, isn't it? And for God's sake, do it and leave me alone. Well, strike me pink. If he ain't a queer kind of a bloke, arrives here this morning on that old tramp, and he's drunk already. What do you think he's doing here, Goldie? I don't know, Crawley. Maybe the same thing I'm doing here, only in a little different way. Don't ask me what I'm doing here on account I don't know. No more than he does. Maybe that's why I feel sorry for the guy. Offering to give him back his five bucks. <laughs> that's something I ain't never done before. <laughs> Heat, rum, bitterness, frustration. The ingredients to mix a very potent cocktail, but surely not one in which to drown sorrow that floats in the wellsprings of the heart. What does it matter where you go? You must take yourself along, and yourself is the nemesis from which you would gladly be rid. There is no running away. The sun shines on all corners of the earth, and night falls on every nook and cranny. There is no escape. Only the fools chase after the will of the wisp, an endless, senseless pursuit, inspired by an obsession. In a moment, we'll return to our story. In that dark and abysmal world of defeat, wherein a man lives not for the future but in the shadows of the past, where there is no longer the rising dawns of tomorrow but only the sunsets of yesterday, there is but one compelling desire: escape. But escape into what, and into where? Some men toy with a grim thought of death, but. 
That is the crumbling portal of the coward, the long sleep, and the eternal blackout. Philip Halstead is no coward, paradoxical as it may seem. His is the resolute will to remain alive with the torturing apparitions of his memories that are always the companions of the sensitive. To remember what he was, what he could have been, and what he is now. And thus, Dr. Philip Halstead has existed on the remote islands of Tahiti for the turning of three months. I say existed, for surely a man does not live in the blurring fog of rum and heat and the moldering dank earth of the forgotten atolls of the southern waste. Crawley! Crawley! All right, all right, all right. Don't be panned at the table like that. What'll it be for you? The bottle's empty, Crawley. Fill it up again. Right, oh, me auntie. As soon as you pay up for the last one. The last one. Did a gentleman's credit any good? Credit? Not on this blooming island. It isn't Mr. Halstead. Wait a minute. Did you say Mr. Halstead? I did, and what of it? But I went nothing. That's right, Crawley. Mr. Halstead. Just plain Mr. Halstead. Now, look here now. You've been on this blinking place for three months now. You spent your money and there ain't no more coming in. What are you doing here? It's a secret. You don't say. A secret it is. <laughs> maybe there's a treasure buried on this here island somewhere, eh? Pirate treasure, maybe. Oh, oh. Don't make me laugh. All right, Crawley, I won't, and I'll tell you my secret, what I'm here for. I'm here to get drunk. Good and drunk and stay drunk. Well, that's all right with me, providing you pays for what you drink. Now, come on now. Hand over for the last one. This is all I got, Crawley, every cent of it. Blimey! A couple of coppers. And what do you expect to buy with that? That's all I got, Crawley, and I'd like a drink. Oh, you would. Well, you ain't getting one. I'm no charity institution. What's the matter, Crawley? Yeah, me bucko, he is broke. And he wants a drink, he does. Just like a blinking toffee is. I'll sign a chip for it, he says. Like this here place was a blooming officer's club or something. I'll buy him a drink. No, you won't. Thank you. I'll pay for my own. Listen to him talk, will you? <laughs> How about paying for the last one? I'll have to owe you for it, Crawley. No. You'll have to owe me for it. Why, you blinking sot... It's just blokes like you that takes the profit out of business. Now, come on, out you go. Oh, don't do that, Crawley. I'll pay for it, whatever it is. Oh, no, you won't. He goes out of here. Right on his head. Now, come on here. Out you go, like this. One, two, three. Hey, Crawley! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't waste your time feeling sorry for that bloke. He ain't no good for fear, that one. And you stay out of here, see? The next time you come in, I'll slit your throat and use you for fish bait. Only water with a little quinine. Clear your head. Wait a minute. What am I doing here? What's that racket? It's just the natives, Dr. Halstead. You've been here for three days. A combination of rum and fever. Three days? Then you... Well, I couldn't let you lie there in the street, could I? You'd have died. Maybe. Maybe that would have been the answer. You think so, Doctor? Doctor! Wait a minute. When you were delirious, you talked about a lot of things, that's how I am. Oh. Now, you needn't worry about me telling anybody. It's still your secret. Thanks. I don't suppose it makes any difference. It'd make a lot of difference after you went back to America. Have somebody know what happened. Back to America? Sure. You don't think you're staying here, do you? Oh, no, Dr. Hostel. This island ain't big enough for you, and there ain't nobody here that wants you on it. You're clearing out for the States on the next cargo boat. Oh, no, I'm not. Now, look, Doctor... I'll do the talking for now, see. I've been taking care of you for three days like you was a baby, and I wasn't doing it for my health. Understand? My health's okay. What are you talking about? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. When you was laying there talking away about your wife and work at the hospital in New York, I did a little think of myself. 
about things that I ain't thought of for too long. Well? I used to live in New York. About a hundred years ago. But I ain't forgotten what it's like to walk down the street and maybe meet somebody you know. Ask them how they are and maybe have lunch together and talk about a dress sale at Macy's, maybe. In the wintertime, the snow comes down and everything's white and clean. You can see your breath when you talk. I ain't forgotten New York, Doctor. Listen, I... I now, don't... listen to me. Maybe I did the same thing you did, run away from something that hurt me. Sure, I got away from it, but I've been running into things that's been hurting a lot worse ever since. And now I'd give anything in the world for a chance to go back. But I can't. I've been out here too. I belong here now. But you don't. You're a doctor. Your job's supposed to be saving lives, not destroying them. And you're going back to the States, doctor. You can take it from me. I ain't kidding. A week from that day, when Goldie, whose last name we don't know, spoke of home in America to Dr. Philip Halstead. The inter-island cargo boat was due in the lagoon of the tiny island of Tahiti. And on the night proceeding, while Crawley tended his stained and grimy bar, the rear bamboo door of Crawley's house was quietly opened. And in the dark, a match sputtered and glowed yellow for a second, then vanished. Listening ears might have heard the protesting squeak of a rusty tin box. A moment's hesitation, and then the door was opened again as quietly as before, and then shut, and a shadow vanished into the velvet night. Howdy, mister. Looking pretty chipper these days, ain't you? Thanks to you, Goldie. Ah, forget it. Did you come in for a drink? There's one on the house tonight on account of the cargo boat to do in tomorrow morning. Oh, thanks, Goldie. Just came in to say hello, have a look at the bright lights. Ah, come on. You'll have just one with me, won't you? Sort of a toast to you getting well. How's about it? Well, all right, I guess. If they're on the house... Sure. Hey, Crawley, a couple of rum slings for the customer. All right, this once. But I don't want no more guff off that bloke. I don't think I'd better stay, Goldie. Ah, oh, forget it. Crawley didn't mean nothing. You're going to be down to the wharf in the morning when the boat comes in? No, I'm taking a canoe going over to one of the islands. I'd like to have a look around. Sure. Well, here you are. Here's your drinks, and that's all you're going to get, understand? Sure, Crawley, sure. Here's yours, Doctor. And, uh, here's looking at you and wishing you lots of luck. Thanks. Same to you, Goldie. There'll be quite a time tomorrow when the cargo schooner comes in. Be some letters, maybe, and some newspapers from America. Goldie, what's the matter with this drink? What? I don't know. I, I feel funny. I... Hey, what's Blinking well going on around here? What's the matter with him? Oh, nothing, Crawley. It's the first drink he's had since he was sick, and I guess it went right to his head. I'll take care of him. I beg your pardon, sir, for intruding, but I was just wondering if you were all right. All right? Of course I'm all right, except for a headache. Hey, where the blazes am I? Well, you're on board the SS Cabot, sir, down for America out of Honolulu. I'm... What the devil am I doing here, Ward? You've been quite unconscious, sir, and you were transferred on board from a cargo steamer in Honolulu. Incidentally, sir, the purser sent this letter down to you. Letter from whom? I don't know, sir. What is this? One hundred, two, three, four, five hundred dollars. Where did this come from, Stuart? Uh, I'm sure I don't know, sir. Uh, perhaps there's a note. Yes, there is. Dear Dr. Halstead, I told you I wasn't kidding and I wasn't. Goodbye and good luck. Say hello to New York for me. Goldie. P.S. You ever want to return the money... You could send it to Crawley. He was the one who furnished it. Again, good luck. Goldie. Sure, Crawley, I took the money. 
What are you going to do about it? Slit my throat and use me for fish bait? Boy, you dirty, blooming, sneaky little... Ah, 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 don't say it, Crawley. They're not the right words for a lady to hear. And tonight, Goldie's a lady. She's going to celebrate. I think I'll start off with a champagne cocktail. That's what ladies drink, ain't it? Sure. One champagne cocktail, Crawley, for a lady. And so the powerful, inexplicable force of the lunar satellite creates the sorcery which swings the tides in full cycle. What was ebb tide is now flood tide. But out there beyond the curving line of the horizon, Goldie remains trapped in a snare of her own weaving. But through her simple act, she has thrown off the yoke and the ties of her deep-rooted and intertwining obsession. In a moment, I'll return and tell you about our story for next week. the story of a little man of destiny who changed the entire position of the world, brought fear into the hearts of untold millions, and made a hero out of a man named Wellington on a field called Waterloo. It is the narrative of the little man of destiny starring Louis Merrill as Napoleon Bonaparte, a gripping, driving, goading saga Obsession. Our story was produced and transcribed by C.P. McGregor in Hollywood. What is the drive, the whiplash that goads man on to forsake family, friends, and loved ones in an insatiable desire to conquer and subjugate lands beyond land? Alexander cried like a child when there was no longer a nation to subjugate and grind beneath his military heel. Little men have often risen to a giant's height 
and the fanatic desire to reach the stars. In just a moment, you will hear the story of one such man who changed the destiny of the world, a Corsican of lowly birth, whose name became the most feared throughout Europe. It is a story called Napoleon Bonaparte and stars Louis Merrill, a narrative of an insane driving will which seethed within a mind shot through with the dread and insidious cancer of an obsession. August 15th, 1769, is perhaps one of the most portentous dates in the chronicles of world history. What was on this day that in a tiny village of Corsica, a boy child was born. His name was Napoleon Bonaparte, a figure predestined to become the little man of destiny. We shall begin this narrative long, long after Napoleon had risen to the heights of success. He had become Napoleon I, self-anointed emperor of the French realm. The little military genius had vowed a conquest of all the Germanic empires, and nation after nation crumbled beneath his heel and gave ear to the dictates of this redoubtable Corsican. Within the borders of Austria, in the city of Schönbrunn, the victorious Bonaparte, smug and self-satisfied, reviewed his conquering troops. But as he did, a Teuton youth broke from the ranks of the spectators. Under the tyrant of Napoleon, kill him in the name of freedom! Stop that man! All right, all right, you've stopped me this time. But perhaps I shall be more fortunate next time. And I promise you, there shall be a next time. Not in this world. God! I'm chained placed on this upstart. And find him in the palace dungeon under heavy guard. The defiant, aristocratic, intelligent-faced young fanatic is dragged by force from the presence of the emperor to be examined by the brutal lords of the military. But the young man will not speak. Words, threats, trickery cannot move him from his stony silence. For he will speak to no one but the emperor himself to Napoleon I. And thus, wondering and somehow admiring the courage and firmness of his would-be destroyer, Bonaparte orders that the youth be brought before him. You may leave the room, guard. But your majesty... Will you I... permit me to repeat myself, monsieur? I said you may leave the room. As your majesty commands, and with a thousand pounds. And now, my dear young foolhardy friend, I think we can talk in private. First, your name. My name is Friedrich Stapps, and I am the son of Johann Stapps, a pastor of Tyrol. I... I do not understand you, Friedrich. You're a very fine-looking young man, and I should judge your age to be that of, uh, shall I say, 17? 18. I will be 19 in October. And if I am not mistaken, Frederick, was your intention to kill me? Yeah. Then 
I should judge you do not like me. You hate the name of Napoleon, hmm? I was once your greatest admirer, but now I hate you. So? And why did you change? Because you've done nothing but make war upon my people. It is your fault that we are starving to death and freezing to death. Oh, young man, you, you must be mad. Either mad or ill. I'm in neither. I'm in full possession of my faculties. And it was for Germany that I tried to kill you. And will try to kill you again if I ever have the chance. Frederick, you know the penalty for what you did? I suppose so. You will have me shot. But that does not matter. There will be others to take my place when I am dead. But I do not want to shoot you, Frederick. You are too young. I am old enough to know what I'm doing. And what you are doing to Germany. Frederick, you try my patience. Uh, this picture was found in your pocket. She's a very beautiful girl. Your uh, sweetheart? Yeah. And what will she think when she learns you're to be shot? She will understand. And she will only be sorry that I failed. She hates you as much as I do. Friedrich, you are a perfect fool. But I find it very difficult to give the word that will have you killed. You are much too young to die. And I want to pardon you, Frederick. Then I shall be able to kill you after all. <sighs> Very well, my young friend. You give me no choice. Gap. Yes, Your Majesty. You may take the prisoner back to the dungeons. And it is my order that he shall be shot at sunrise. Very well, Your Majesty. Come on. Goodbye, Frederick. And believe me, I have never been so sorry in all my life. And so, for the first time, the little man of destiny becomes aware of the stark hatred that burns deep within the hearts that have been pierced and bruised by his ruthless military saber. And he knows, too, that if the dynasty of Bonaparte is to exist, he must retrench and strengthen his ramparts, not by war, but this time by peace. Now, within his private chambers, a strange calculating drama is being played. Josephine? But yes, my dearest, my brave and great emperor. No, 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 no. no. This is not a moment for zest. I wish to talk with you. Oh, but you are talking with me, are you not? Oh, sit down, sit down. Here, here on this chair. <sighs> Must you look so serious, Napoleon? Ah, perhaps you have been worrying too much. Oh, you must not. Else you will have grey hair and wrinkles like Monsieur Chauvino, and then I should not. Josephine. What? Josephine, the war is over. The war. But yes, France is no longer at war with Austria. I have declared a truce. Oh, then I am so happy. Then we can return to Paris and perhaps have a great ball in celebration. Oh, that would be wonderful, Napoleon. Let me see. Whom could we invite? There is Josephine. Monsieur... Yes. Josephine, as you know, it has always been my dream to become the Emperor of France. Oh, but you are the Emperor of France. Yes. Yes, I am. But uh, when I die, who then will be the Emperor? Oh, I do not know. Oh, they will find someone, I guess. Yes, they will. My son will then be Emperor of France, Josephine. Your son? But you have no son, Napoleon. Oh, I know. But I am going to have one. Okay. A son who shall bear my name and who shall be of royal blood. What do you mean? You are not of royal blood, Josephine. And neither can you give me a son. Uh, Napoleon, uh, what is it you wish to tell me? I wish to tell you that when we return to Paris, I shall get a divorce. Napoleon? Yes, a divorce. And then I shall marry again. And pray God that he will give me a son. So that Napoleon II shall be Emperor of France when and if they should succeed in killing Napoleon I. Napoleon, seeking to strengthen his position by a royal alliance, 
takes to wife the subjugated princess of Austria, Maria Luisa. And a year later, eagerly awaits an announcement of a royal birth, one that will perhaps give him a son and an heir to bear the title of Napoleon II. Suddenly, the guns of the Paris forts boom out, and the city listens with rapt attention, and then goes wild in a frenzy of delight as 22 salutes are fired. A son has been born to their emperor. The guns are still thundering, and the little lieutenant of artillery stands at the palace window, mechanically noting the caliber of the guns from the pitch of the gunfire, while his thoughts reach far back into the past and roam yet farther and forward into the future. Yes, André? Your Majesty? Yes, I know, Charles. You have come to congratulate me, and I thank you. But, Your Majesty... I am a father. I have a son, and his name shall be Napoleon. Napoleon II, the next emperor of France. Your Majesty... Charles... They have fired the salute. Why do the guns continue? It is a shameful waste of ammunition. That is what I have come to tell you, Your Majesty. Tell me. Tell me what? Charles, speak up. Well, well, well. Those guns, Your Majesty. The guns that you hear. What about the guns? They are not French guns, Your Majesty. Not French guns? What is this nonsense? There are no other guns within the borders of France. Your Majesty, they are the guns of the coalition. They are marching on Paris. They? May we, Your Majesty, the English, the Russians, the coalition, I beg you in the name of God to do something. Guns of the coalition within France? We. Oui. Call my guard. Have the toxin alarm sounded. Order the call to colors. Quickly, you fool. Of France will not be France, but the state of coalition. A little man wearing a cockade hat. Hmm. A little man who sought to reduce the world to a size smaller than himself. A little man who would emulate the mighty Hercules and bear the world upon his own shoulders. And the meek shall inherit the earth. Hmm. Perhaps Napoleon considered himself the sole beneficiary of that strange pronouncement. Hmm? In a moment, we'll continue our story. Talks an alarm, and the call to the colors have been sounded too late. And for the first time in his life, the Emperor Napoleon has been caught napping. And so it is that the armies of fate, and as well the armies of the great European coalition, conquer the French capital of Paris and reduce, as the Duke of Wellington avowed, the power and the strength of the little Caesar to the humbleness of ashes. And thus the once victorious Corsican, stripped of his glory and his crown, stands trial before the tribunal of Europe. And here's the dread word of judgment. Napoleon Bonaparte, it is hereby ordered and decreed by the powers of the European coalition that you are divested of your crown and rights of emperor and are banished forever from French citizenship and soil and are to live the remaining days of your life under heavy guard upon the Isle of Elba. A 
And thus is Napoleon stripped of his cloak of power and banished to the tiny molehill in the ocean wastes known as Elba. But the coalition powers have not reckoned with the little man's titanic powers of intrigue. And the word rings throughout all of Europe with the electrifying news that Napoleon has escaped from Elba and is returning with a conquering army to the soil of his empire. And now, within an alpine village, Napoleon escaped, speaks and exhorts his straggling army of a thousand odd men of his old campaigns. Lieutenant, it is not my wish for the men to stand at attention. I wish to speak to them, and I want them to listen. Order them at ease. Very well, sir. Regiment, as you were, at ease. Thank you, Lieutenant. My soldiers, I ask that you recognize me, and I have come to you to say that if there is one among you who wishes to kill his emperor... Let him come forward and do so. Here I am, and here is my breast. Thank you, my comrades. And now I wish to say this. After the fall of Paris, my heart was torn, but my spirit remained unshaken. My life belongs to you, must once more be made useful to you. Soldiers, we are not conquered. Treachery has delivered the capital into the hands of the enemy and disorganized our army, but now, now I have come. Your general has returned, and he asks you to wear the tricolor cockade again and let the eagles which you bore at Ulm and Austerlitz, at Jena, Elo and Friedland, at Eichmühl and Wagram, at Smolensk and the Moskva, at Lutzen and Montmirail, once more wave on high. And I promise that victory will guide us forward through the storms, and the eagles shall again fly from one church steeple to the other, until at last they alight on Notre Dame, and again proclaim Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of France and Dictator of the World. I wait for your answer, comrades. Vive la Pologne de Puglia! Vive, 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 vive. voice of destiny, proclaims that the little man's ambitious conquests shall be short-lived. He is not reckoned with the solemn oath of Britain's Iron Duke of Wellington, sworn to the dying William Pitt. So England maneuvers another war with France, one which terminates tragically upon the shell-torn and scarred battlefield of Waterloo. Your Majesty! Your Majesty! Well, speak up. What is it? They are too much for us. They outnumber us four to one. Both left and right flank have broken and in a headlong retreat. And sound the order for charge. The order has been sounded, Your Majesty, but there's no use. The army is panic-stricken and only God can stop them. Yes, only God can stop them and he shall. For Napoleon is the god of war and of the Frenchman. And Napoleon shall stop this retreat or he shall die. Vive la France! Vive la France! But those blasphemous words and the insane fury of Napoleon are wasted on the sound shock air of heaven. And even though he rushes into the teeth of the enemy to turn his routed army, his once loyal and courageous soldiers completely succumb to the headlong flight of panic. And the great battle of Waterloo is ended. General Bonaparte, inasmuch as you have declared yourself and your armies to be in utter defeat... I shall apply the military law of the victor. May I have your sword, General Bonaparte? I... I should like to ask one favor. That you allow me to keep this sword. I am extremely sorry, General Bonaparte. This steel was once the sword of Alexander. And its edge is scarred from a thousand victories. But never a defeat. And so... Lord Wellington... I give you my sword... Broken in two pieces. And I give you my life in the same way. For like this sword of Alexander, 
Napoleon Bonaparte is broken. A broken sword and a broken man become the souvenirs of the first dictator of Europe. Under English guard, Napoleon is returned to Paris, and again he hears the stern judgments of exile. But this time, he is not to be sent to the historic island of Elba, but to a lonely and extinct volcanic rock in the Atlantic Ocean, the dread island of St. Helena. But now, by virtue of one last request, Napoleon stands again in his chambers of the palace, talks with his brother, Lucien. Lucien? Please. Please, Napoleon. Do not speak to me. Why? You are still my brother? That is the reason that I... that I do not want to talk. I swear I cannot hold back the tears. Then cry. Cry, Lucien. Cry if it will help. It is you who should cry, Napoleon. Not I. I... I have no tears. I am as dry as the sands of Egypt. I cannot cry, Lucien. But you, you can cry for me. Napoleon. Thank you. It is good to know that there are those who can shed a few tears for Napoleon. I... I told you... I told you a long time ago, Napoleon. I said to you, Napoleon... Go drunk with power. And you're likely to become sick. Yes, I know. I remember. But why? Why didn't you listen to me? Ambition listens to no man, Lucien. But my intoxication has been like all intoxications. First, I enjoyed the taste of wine. Then I enjoyed the, the exhilaration of drunkness. Then the drunken frenzy. And now, now the sickness. I think Plutarch would have called it the, the law of compensation. Oh, please, please, Lucien, shed no more tears for me. <laughs> Save them for my death. Napoleon, I... Yes? André? Maria. Napoleon. Will you, will you leave us alone, Lucien? But yes, of course, Napoleon. Maria, my dearest... No, no, no. Please, no, Napoleon. No? Please do not touch me. I'm sorry. So you too. You too would be named Brutus. No. For it was not my I who stabbed you, Napoleon. It is only yourself whom you should name Brutus. And now in answer to the second and last request from the powers of the coalition, the fallen Caesar stands before his troops that once so valiantly served his command, head bared to the driving rain, which mingles the tears in his eyes with the tears of heaven. Napoleon Bonaparte, the little man of destiny, bids his last farewell. Soldiers of my old guard, I take leave of you. For twenty years I have seen you always upon the path of honor and glory. And during the last few weeks, you have been models of bravery and fidelity, just as in the years of good fortune. But there would have been civil war. And that is why I sacrificed all other interests to those of the country. And I am going away. You, friends, I beg of you to continue to serve France. Her happiness has been my only thought, and my good wishes go with you. Do not mourn my fate, but remember that if I have determined to go on living, it is only that I may increase your fame. I shall write a story of the great deeds we have wrought together. And so... Farewell, my children. I would gladly press you all to my heart, but at least let me kiss your colors, the flag of France, 
Goodbye, comrade. And may God bless you. And vive la France. Who was it that said, what goes up must come down? Hmm? It's a simple law of compensation. But coming down in such a spot of degradation on St. Helena is not considered as homesteading on choice acreage, is it? Napoleon, however, bought and paid for his final landscape with a counterfeit coin of his evil and ambitious obsession. In a moment, I'll return to tell you of our story for next week. many forms, has often been the three-forked barb which goads man to the very brink of hellish inferno. History is filled with the stories of those to whom colors on canvas were more than life itself. You'll hear such a story, a drama in which death painted a picture in obsidian black, contrasted with the vermilion reds of murder. It is called the Blue Stain in which an old attic trunk became the focal point of an overpowering... Obsession. Our story was produced and transcribed by C.P. McGregor in Hollywood. anyone measured the four dimensions of the subconscious mind, it might be a good trick if you could do it. And if there were any devices long enough to reach from end to end, the answer might come up as the nth power of the infinite, which only an Einstein could fathom out. And there is such a shortage of Einsteins, isn't there? Such men are rationed out of top priority by the universal director of scarce commodity allocation. 
In just a moment, you'll hear the story of how a mind or spirit, if you wish, reached into infinity out of the void of death. It is called The Kiss of Kismet and stars Barton Yarborough. A tale which grew from the seedlings of a strange and primal obsession. The name India suggests many things, doesn't it? The Taj Mahal in the moonlight. The funeral ghats burning along the banks of the Ganges. Kipling's Kim. Steaming jungles. Indian Thakurs performing the impossible. The great King Cobra, deadly in its hooded wrath. Striped tigers stalking through the banyan grove. And elephants bedecked with jeweled trappings and a gold-encrusted howdah bearing some fabulous maharaja. Oh, yes, and the monsoon. But let me give you another picture of India, a place called Kardong Pass, which lies north of the ancient city of Leh. Elevation, 18,000 feet, where even in midsummer, the snow lies thick along the Caravani Trail. Picture, if you can, an exploratory party approaching this pass, the tiny shaggy ponies plodding warily along a precipitous ledge. A man named Warburton commands the train, and I don't think you're going to like him. Russell! Russell! What the damnation is the matter up there? Wait a moment. What's the matter here? Get that horse onto its feet. I think he's hurt his legs, I eat. Nonsense. Just lazy, that's all. Here. Give me that bridle. Come on, get up. Get up. You lazy beggars. Get him on his feet. You go back where you belong, will you? I'll attend to this. Come on. But the, poor, be- the poor beast is hurt, Warburton. Look. Look how that leg's twisted under him. Uh, I suppose we'll have to take the pack off him and put it on the other horses. Oh, but Roger, they're overloaded already. We've come such a way since morning, and they're so tired. Can't we camp here? We're going as far as Tano tonight. Well, I don't see how we can do it with a lame horse. Then we'll shoot him. Russell, get my rifle. Yes, sir. Mrs. Warburton, uh, perhaps yes, we'd better go back and wait. Look how the color of the peaks have changed in the sunset. I wonder how many sunsets they have seen since the world began. They must be very old, very wise, these mountains. What if they could talk and tell us what they know? The very secret of life itself. I've heard that they can impart their knowledge to those fitted to receive it. Slide. Yes? You love me, don't you? What? Why, I... We're out of the world somehow up here. We don't have to lie and dissemble anymore. We don't have to act according to its petty deceits. We're... We're beyond all that. Clyde, I love you. Grace, you... Do you love me? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. I do. I... Oh, but I can't tell you that. I don't dare. I'd be a cat. I'd be a coward. Those are only words, Clyde. Little hypocritical words with which we make a chain to bind ourselves. You aren't a cad. You know you are. You're fine and strong. Oh, I want you to be strong. I want you to be strong enough to break your chains and my chains and take me away. You... You mean away from Roger? Yes. Oh, I think the mountains have imparted to me some of their knowledge. The knowledge that we have a right to be happy. That our lives are our own. I've never realized it before. I've only thought what I was told to think and done what I was told to do. But now, now... Oh, but you... you can't be in earnest. Oh, but I am. I'm dreadfully in earnest. Clyde, you're... you're not afraid, are you? No, not for myself. I don't matter. But you do. You matter more than anything in the world. Oh, you can't. You can't do it. You... you couldn't face a scandal. You... you couldn't stay here. You couldn't go back to England. We wouldn't have to. We could go to America. No one would know us. No one would ever find out. 
And we could be so happy there. Oh, yes. Yes, we could. Roger will be returning to Swinegar soon. We'll wait till he goes. Then, then we'll leave. We can catch a boat. No, no, no. No, that won't do. We've got to be honest in this thing. We can't sneak away like thieves. I'll tell him. Oh, no. Yes. Don't you see, we've got to. We've got to face him and tell him. It's just as you say, Grace. We don't have to lie and assemble anymore. I'm going to tell him. Tonight. As soon as we make camp. Have you lost your way, my children? Oh, uh, I'm sorry if I frightened you. Why, Grace, it's... It's a llama from the monastery. That's all. It is getting dark. And you were so busily engaged, you did not see me approaching, I fear. Have you lost your way? No, uh... Why, no, our, our party is on ahead. We're, we're going to Tano. To Tano? Yes. Yes, we'll, we'll make camp there tonight. You cannot go on. It is getting dark. You will lose your way. Oh, we have guides. We, we've been over the trail before. One must pass over the same trail many times before one knows it. Oh, I, I fancy we'll have no difficulty. The wrong path is always difficult. For out of today, tomorrow is made. And if today is error, tomorrow will be error. And the next, and the next, until the end of time. Universes decay, and out of their elements, new universes are formed. And the wanderer must continue to wander. Why, yes, sir. It's quite right, sir. Good night. My children. Oh, money, pardon me. Good night. Clyde, where did he come from? Why, up the trail, I suppose. Why, no, he didn't. I was looking at the trail all the time. There was no one near us. And all of a sudden, he was here, standing here. Well, those chaps go long distances at times and walk with almost incredible rapidity. I've heard it said that they induce a sort of hypnosis, practically hypnotize themselves, and travel by what amounts to walking in one's sleep. When they wake up, why, they're here. They're there. It's not a half bad way to travel. And what was he talking about? What did he mean? He said, out of today, tomorrow is made. And out of tomorrow, the next, and the next, until the end of time. Until the end of time. Grace! Grace! Quiet! Yes, coming. Will you... you tell him? As soon as we make camp, Atano. Well, I drove it. Commencing to snow. Where in damnation have you been? Don't you see it's getting dark? We're only around the bend of the trail. I've been shouting for you for the last ten minutes. We came as soon as we heard you. Oh. Don't think I don't see through your little trick. Trying to delay us, so we'll have to camp here. Well, we're not camping here. We're not stopping until we get to Tano, if it takes all night. You don't know how anxious I am to get to Tano. Yes, we're very anxious. Well, don't stand there, Grace. Get on your horse. Looks like we're in for a blizzard. Russell! Yes, I... Uh, but it's enough! Oh, oh. oh I, I can't go on any further. But we've got to go on. We've got to reach Tano. Everything depends on that. The rest of our lives. I know. Where is he now? Up at the head of the column with Rasul. This doesn't look like the trail, Clyde. We're lost. I know we're lost. We've taken the wrong path. Oh, now, now we're all right. It's this storm. You can't recognize the trail here. There. Grace, we're taking the, the only path uh, there is to take. I don't know. Wait. Wait a moment. Move back there. Yes. We'll have to dismount and lead your horses. Well, what's that? The trail ahead runs over a ledge. It's covered with snow. We don't know whether it's wide enough for the horses. 
Somebody's got to go over it on foot first. I see. Well, well, I'll go. Oh, no, no, Clyde. Oh, you better let Russell do it. This wind's blowing a gale. Might not be much of a ledge there. Oh, well, let's have a look at it anyway. Wait. There. There, wait. I'm coming to you. There it is, covered with snow. Hard to tell whether it's wide enough to cross. I wouldn't attempt it. If you lost your footing, there wouldn't be much left of you by the time you hit the bottom of the canyon. Oh, yes, but there'll be no danger if I keep close to the inside edge. Oh, Clyde, Clyde, you mustn't. We'll wait till daylight. You mustn't go. Well, we've... We've got to get to town over. You keep out of this place. Oh. All right, all right. Well, wish me luck. Well, it, it seems wide enough here. Wait a moment, now. How is it there? Still wide enough for the horses. Wait a moment. Roger. Roger, look. It's a slide. Tell him to come back. Hi. Hi. The rains had come and gone, and the heat lay across India. In a muffling torpor. In the home of Saab and Mem Saab Warburton, the Ponka fans were waving in the humid air. The Mem Saab was escaping from herself at the moment in the notes of some lost melody. Warburton was, in his insufferable way, acting as host to a house guest. That sort of thing might go in England, but not here in India. I say, uh, care for a spot of brandy? Oh, I don't mind if I do. If you'll pardon me, I'll get it. I don't trust the service. Key. Don't stop. That sounds mighty pretty. Oh, I'm tired of playing. I'd rather talk. Mr. Mortimer, have you ever been to the Buddhist monastery... At Lama Yuru? Well, not exactly, ma'am. I, I've ridden past it. Why? I want to go there. I want to see it. Roger's so busy that he can't possibly get away to go with me. I wonder if you'd mind. Well, I'd be glad to. You see, I... I have a rather special reason for going. Oh, I, I know you'll think it's silly, but... Well, when Clyde Jerome was killed, something strange happened to me. I... I haven't told it to anyone... But you remember, you came riding up the trail just after they'd found him. I see. Hello there. Wait a minute, Jack. Whoa, whoa. Wonder if you could give us a little help. We've had rather a nasty accident up ahead. Chap went over the edge of the cliff, swept off the ledge by a snow slide. Wait, I'll have uh, some of my boys come up. Well, that won't be necessary. My own boys have found him at the foot of the cliff. They're bringing him up now. I'd like to have you, well, as a witness. I'm the only white man in the party. A friend of yours? An acquaintance. A chap named Clyde Jerome. <laughs> Hurry! Hurry, can't you? We are hurry, Sahib. The trail up the cliff is slippery. Here, let me have a hold of that rope. Get him under the arms there while I hang on to this rope. I have it, Sahib. Slide, slide. You'd better get back. No, no, I want to see him. I want to see him. If I was you, ma'am. Oh, I've got to. Oh, oh, Clyde. She's fainted. That's all. Bring some water. Here. You take her over there. Grace. 
Grace. Grace, don't you hear me? I'm calling to you. Clyde. Clyde, where are you? I can't see you. Stretch out your hand. It's so dark. No. I can't touch you. I... You must listen to me, Grace. I have only a little time to talk. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I... I loved you, Grace. But I was wrong in loving you. Oh, no, no, no. It wasn't wrong. We could never have been happy. I know that now. Happiness could never come from wrong. It is better that I died. I must go now. Oh, don't go. Don't. Don't. Another moment. Goodbye. Oh, I can't give you up. I won't. I won't. <laughs> Now, a woman might faint and come out of it, believing that she had talked to a dead man. There is nothing particularly unusual about that. And, of course, there was no question that Clyde Jerome was dead. As I say, it was some months after the accident that Mrs. Warburton went to the Buddhist monastery at Lama Yuru. It was late afternoon, the time of the ceremony. Om Mani Padme Hum. Sub Warburton. Why? Well, how did you know I'm... We sent for you. But I... I don't understand. I received no message from anyone. When I... the proper time had run its course, we sent for you. And you came. And you... You are from a faraway country, Sahib. And you will return there soon. Why, yeah, yes, I... I'm going back next... Say, how... Uh... That is well. For what you will hear today is best not repeated in this country. You will come this way, Mimsa. This corridor is dark, Mimsa. If you will follow closely behind me, this way. That was the echo of yourself, Mimsab. Wait here in the chapel. I will send Brother Sharfa to you. He will be here in a moment. Mr. Mortimer, did you hear that music? Why, no. I didn't hear anything. Why, oh, I, I wish we hadn't come. Why did you come anyway? Oh, I don't know. All of a sudden, I... I wanted to come here, but it's so dark and quiet, and that music, I never heard anything like it before. I am Brother Sharfa. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Mem Saab, you are at war with your life. You wish to change that which cannot be changed, for today is made of yesterday. And yesterday cannot be altered. I, I don't understand. What do you mean? You were in love with a man, and now... Now he is dead. Now he is in another phase, another plane of existence. He must live out his life on that plane, as he lived it out here. And you must live out your life here. But why? Why do you tell me this? Because you refuse to let him go. You refuse to let him live out his life in another plane. You refuse to give him up. And because of that refusal, he is handicapped. You must let him go. 
You must put him out of your mind. Out of your thoughts. Oh, I could never do that. It's all I have. If he asked you to release him. What do you mean? He's in his grave. And if I could bring him back from his grave? Oh, why do you talk like that? You're only tormenting me. He is dead. You have not answered my question, Memsab. If he should come and show himself to you, show himself as an appeal to you for his release, then would you believe? Would you? Oh, yes, if you could bring him out of the grave. If you could prove to me that he wants me to forget. Oh, then, then I would believe. Then I would give him up. Grace. Oh, that, that boy. Grace. Oh, no, no, you're trying to trick me. A trick of the voice, that's all, a trick. Grace. Grace, look at me. Oh, Clyde! Clyde! Oh. Oh. You have been listening to Obsession. Obsession. The fiction writers have long been seeking that plot which is known as the perfect crime. But like the elusive will of the wisp, it is always just beyond reach. Murder will out, say the wise ones. And the pursuer is often that shadowy ghost known as conscience. In a moment, you'll hear such a case in the story of Cry Vengeance, starring Barton Yarborough and Michael Raffetto. A tale told in the Belgian Congo of violence, death, and greed, which brought two men to a stern justice. True men trapped in a pitfall of their own obsession. is as commonplace as the predatory animals which roam the jungles. It is a place also of loneliness and where isolation is a thing of necessity, not of choice. On a back trail, two men ride toward a destination charted on a map of greed. Their names, Harris and Pitkin, and their plans are as dark as the blackness of their own obsession. Yeah, but how can we be sure that Kenning has got any money? 
Why, must have. Stands to reason, don't it? He's lived out there on that farm for years. He must have some money. And he's never spent any. Yeah. Well, uh, what do you mean? He's uh, kind of a miser? Yeah, that's it. Too stingy to even have any help on the place. He's all by himself. That's why it's going to be easy. The nearest farm to him is that place we passed eight or nine kilometers back. <laughs> well, I guess they won't hear him holler then, anyhow. <laughs> Not a chance. Why, they probably won't even find him. Nobody ever comes along here. Hey. Ain't that it? Right over there? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Well, now... Uh... Just how are you going to go about this now? Well, we've got to stall a little and see if we can find out where he's got his money, see? Mm-hmm. We'll ride up and ask him if we can stay for supper and offer to pay him. Then we'll keep an eye on what he does with the money we give him. That might give us an idea where the rest of it's hid. Mm-hmm. If that don't work, why, I'll try to draw him out a little. So... Don't be too anxious with that revolver. Hey, wait a minute. I thought you was going to do the killing. Well, all right, all right. I'd just as leave as not. Only if I'm going to do the talking, somebody else has got to do the dirty work, don't they? I can't do both. No, I know. I'll do it. But listen, uh, how am I going to know when? Huh? Oh. Well, let's see. Uh, I'll tell you. After I found out all I can find out, I'll say to you, uh, it seems to be a little bit cooler this evening. And then you let him have it in the back. Okay. I'll be listening for you to say it. Let's see. We ought to be able to get started again just after dark. By morning, we'll be in Portuguese territory and safe. And we'll be in Luanda and on a boat before they ever find him. Maybe they'll never find him, huh? Oh. Oh, boy. Oh. Oh. The house is back of that clump of trees there. Mm. Yeah, I... Yeah, I see the smoke from the chimney. <laughs> the old boy must be getting supper. We're just in time. We better... Better tie the horses outside the gate here. Yeah. Oh, whoa. Whoa. Well, are you coming? Yeah, wait a second, will you? Well, come on, come on. And close the gate. Hello? Hello in there? Hello? Yeah. Maybe he ain't there. Oh, he's there, all right. Come on, we'll go up to the door. Hello? Who is it? Uh, Mr. Koenig? Yeah, yeah, I'm Koenig. Why, uh... My name's, uh, Clark, uh, Mr. Koenig, and oh. this is Mr. Anderson here. I see. They told us we might be able to get some supper here. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Just I'm getting ready to eat. Uh, come right on in. Oh, fine. Uh, come on, Anderson. I am, uh, I'm just putting uh, supper on the table. <laughs> well, of course, we, we want to pay you for what we eat, you know. Oh, never mind about it. You're very welcome. I, I put on some extra plates and then... Oh, no. No, no, no. We always pay our way, Miss Koenig. Sort of a... Well, a, sort of a principle with us. <laughs> uh, Anderson? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, this covering... Oh, no, no, no. No, no, I, I couldn't... I couldn't take it. I, I haven't much of a zubber, but... Uh, but it is, you are no, welcome No, 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 to... that's out. Yeah. Yeah, you take this. Sure. Uh, go ahead now. We'll, we'll feel better about it, you know? Uh, well, if, if that's the way you feel, well, danke schön. Just pull up some chairs, dear. I, I put out the things right away. Yeah, pull up another chair, will you? Uh, well, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah I'm done. Hey, look. Hmm. Look in that coffee den behind the stove. Yeah, yeah, I see. Well, that, uh... That soup certainly smells good, Mr. Koenig. Yeah, we're kind of hungry. Uh, you boys been riding a long ways today? <coughs> Ach, donner, wetter, that, that soup bowl is hot. Here, here, here's some plates. Yes, uh, 
We've come quite a ways today. Now, uh, just help yourself. Yeah, well, just leave that to me. Uh, Mr. Koenig, uh, we are, uh, we're thinking of taking up some land around here. Oh. Uh, how is it for farming? Can a fellow make any money? Well, no, little maybe. Well, that's no, not so bad if he can save it, huh? <laughs> In the course of five or ten years, a man ought to be able to lay away a nice little nest egg, shouldn't he? Well, I I don't know if things go well. Why, yes. Uh Hmm. I see. Well, tell me, uh, how uh, how have things been going with you? Oh, so so. Um. Must be kind of lonesome out here, though. No friends or. Oh, I I I have lots of friends. Huh? Oh. The animals. Oh. Uh, my horses and cows and chickens and, and then there's the birds and the... I see. Well, then you... You must be pretty fond of animals, eh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you know? But sometimes I think I can almost understand them. Know just what they are thinking. And they know just what I am thinking. I never heard an animal in my life. And no animal would ever hurt me. Yeah, they wouldn't, huh? No, sir. They they are all my friends. Even the wild animals. Why, one time, one time a leopard broke into my chicken pen and I walked right out there without even a clock. I don't even keep a firearm in the house. Oh. And, uh, and I just spoke to him nice and, and told him to go away. And he did. Why, why, I bet even a lion, if I saw one, wouldn't hurt me. All animals is my friends. <laughs> well, that makes it nice. They would all protect me. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me, it must get pretty hot here. Oh, yeah, yeah. At this time of the year, it is warm. Mm-hmm. But it seems a little bit cooler this evening. Never knew what hit him. So I hope nobody heard the shot. Uh, there's nobody around here who could hear it. What's the matter with you? It sounded louder than I thought it would. That's because it was in a closed room. Well, let's see what's in that tin. Mm-hmm. Is it there? Yeah. Yeah. Here, all right. I don't know how much. We can count it later, though. Yeah, that suits me. I ain't so keen about hanging around here. All right, all right, then. Come on. Come on. Just about, uh, about how long do you suppose we was in there? Five, maybe ten. No more than ten minutes. What? Uh, seems to me it got dark awful fast. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'll open it. Uh, seems like it's been a year... Th- Bitkin. Huh? Now, oh, what's the... Look, the horses. They're gone. Wait a minute. What? Why? Why, look. This board you tied him to is busted off. Say, what do you... I bet you they heard that shot. I told you it sounded loud. Now, what are we going to do? We got to have horses. We can't cover that distance on foot. Now, we... wait a minute. Wait a minute, will you? Don't get excited. Yeah, but... The old man must have horses. Why, sure, don't you know? He said he did. Come on. No, wait a minute. Wait. Listen. Listen, there's somebody coming up the road. Oh, there's no... Listen, I tell you, there is. Well, whoever it is will ride by. Nothing to get excited about. Come on, duck into the bush. Come on, hurry up. Say, is that chicken squawking? Why, it is, sure enough. Must be something in old man Kalik's chicken run. Oh, oh, oh. I'd hate to see him lose all his chickens. Let's ride in and tell him. Hey, Kenny. Kenny. Hey, Kenny. Oh, Kenny. Kenny. Oh, good Lord, then. They'll, they'll find them. Well, what if they do? They're not going to get us. Well, we'll be aboard ship by this we time. We can't get over the line into Portuguese territory without horses. We can't go on foot. It'll take days. Don't worry. We're going to have horses. Yeah, well, what do you mean? We're going to take their horses when they come out. There's only two of them, and there's two of us. And we've got a gun. Say, where is that revolver? Why, it's right... What? What, Pitkin? What's the matter? I... 
I left it in there. In the house. On the table. In the house? Yeah. Fine chance of holding them up and getting the horses without a gun. We'll have to go on without horses. We can't. We can't. We've got to now. We've got to get into Portuguese territory by morning. Yes. Murder will out. Say the wise ones. As they also have said that the best laid plans of man will oft times go awry. And no matter how vast the jungles, there will always be the pursuers and the pursued. It is the law of the jungle. In a moment, we'll return to our story. Unexpected that wreaks vengeance in the formula of the stern law of justice. Pitkin and Harris had planned the perfect crime. But the shot that went crashing into the brain of gentle old Koenig frightened their horses and they broke away from their tether. Now Harris and Pitkin are attempting the perilous journey to the Portuguese territory on foot. In the jungles, the monkeys chatter, and the bright plumaged birds fill the creeping vine laced air with their unearthly cries. Every sound of the dank, steaming growth of untold centuries now resounds in the minds of Pitkin and Harris as two words cry vengeance. Two words that have become their obsession. Wait. Wait a minute. Wait. We're lost, I tell you. We... You know we are. Oh, stop your whining. Yeah. I know where we are. We'll be inside of the river within an hour. That's what you said this morning. It must be long past noon now. I tell you, we've been gone in a circle. We'll never get out of here. We'll die here. We'll die and rot here. Shut your mouth, will you? Come on. What's that? Oh, it's only a couple of monkeys up there. Will you stop wasting your breath talking? Oh, I, I can't go any further. I, I got to rest. I can't. Shut up and come on. Oh, I can't. I got to rest. I'm not going any further until I... Do you want to spend the night in here? Well, if you don't, you'd better get up. And... It's a long time to dark. We can afford to rest a few minutes. And I'm going to. You can go on if you want to. I'm only walking in circles anyhow. I'm gonna stay right here. Uh, All right. Uh, All right. Five minutes. Say. What? Keating said animals were his friends. <laughs> well, they've certainly been friendly to him so far. If it hadn't been for animals, we... We wouldn't be in this fix. What do you mean? The horses running away and leaving us to go on foot. The chickens attracting the attention of those men. Yeah. You know, I wonder what started them squawking. Oh, rubbish. We could have taken their horses if, if you hadn't left your revolver in the house. Do you suppose they'll be able to find out who that revolver belonged to? I don't know. Won't do them any good if they do find out. Nobody could track us through this jungle. But we're not as bad off as we might be. If we'd had horses and gone by the road, they could have followed us easy. In the jungle here, they... Well, they wouldn't have a chance. They could pass within 50 feet of us right now and not see us. Yeah, I never thought of that. And another thing. They'd never expect us to cut through the jungle in the first place. They'd naturally suppose we took the road. That's where they're looking for us, more than likely, if they are looking for us. By the time they find out that we're not on the road... We'll be across the river. Yeah. 
If we can find the river. Oh, we'll find it. I lost my bearings for a while this morning, but I'm all right now. We'll be at the river. Hey! Hey, listen. Listen, did you hear that? Keep quiet. Curse them monkeys. Hey, Irie! Hey, he's coming this way. Get out. Get out and keep quiet. Oh, Irie! No! Is that you, Irish? Yes, it's me. Where's Lafarge? He's gone ahead. I thought I heard something over here. Good Lord, they... They are trailing us. Well, they'll never get us. They haven't a chance, I tell you. They'll find us in here in a million years. we got to lay low, though, for a while. We'll get out of here before night. Yeah, but we can't make our way through the jungle at night. And we'll wait till morning. They'll soon get tired of beating through this bush. And we're... We're safe here just as long as we... Pitkin. Pitkin. Dogs. They're trailing us with dogs. I can... Horses, chickens, and now dogs. Oh, everything's against us. Everything. Come on. Come on, don't be a fool. We've got to keep moving now. Oh, what they use. We'll never reach the river. Come on. Come on, Will. Come on. Surrounded. This way, you fool. Don't stop. This way. No, 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 I can't. Oh, it's no use going on. They got us. Horses, chickens, dogs, animals. Betraying us. Oh, we, we can't beat them. I'm, I'm going to give up. Come on. Come on, I I'm see. not. I'm not going. I'm going to give up. Come on. Come on, do you hear me? Come on or I'll kill you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Kill me. I don't care. Those dogs can follow. I'm not afraid of the men, but animals, animals. Oh, we, I'm going to give myself up. I'm going to call him. I'm going to tell him. Listen, you do, Harris, and I'll choke you to death with my bare hands. You hear? And I mean it. I'm going to get to the river, and I'm not going to let you or anyone else stop me. Do you hear that? And if you make a noise, I don't I'm... care. I'm going to give up, Harris. I'm going to give Harris. up. Here we are. Over here. Harris. Harris, here we you... are. Here. This way. Shut up. Shut up. the river. I want a canoe. I want a canoe and a paddle. Mm. You be run away, huh? No, no. You're talking like a fool. Hey, listen. I want you to take me across the river. Across the river, that's all. Bad to cross river. Bad magic. Oh, rot, rot. You speak them, say so. All same, past all things for bad magic. Look, look here. I got money. The plenty of it. I'll pay you. I'll pay you anything you want. See? Here, yeah, look. Look, I'll give you all this, see? Uh, bad magic to cross river. All right. All right, then. Twice this. See? Here. Here, take these. Here, take them, all of them. 
But but get me across. Get me across. You get him in canoe. Good. I thought that'd bring you to your senses. Well, come on. Come on, get in. Get in. All same. Past all thing for bad magic. Hey. Hurry. Hurry, can't you? Hurry. Make them go fast as can. Hey. Lord. Listen. Can't you? Can't you hurry? Make them go fast as can. Oh, don't, don't tell me that again. I'm sick of hearing it. Here. Here. Give me that other paddle. I'll help you. Give me that other paddle. Oh, oh. Him canoe tip. Not stand up. Him canoe tip over. Hey, hey, give me a hand. Give me a hand, you fool. does not always triumph. The courts do not always mete out the law. The blind goddess of justice will have her way in many forms, and the scales will always be in balance. Such is the case with Pitkin and Harris. Old man Koenig is avenged, and the jungles close in the faithful chapter, and no longer does it cry vengeance through the dark quarters of a guilty man's obsession. In a moment, I'll return and tell you about our story for next week. Sullivan will join us in a story called Faith is the Evidence, in which a man walks a lonely path in a search for that elusive thing we know as contentment, but wanders not knowing that his lamp of discovery casts the black light of... Our story was produced and transcribed by C.P. McGregor in Hollywood.
obsession. It is a strange paradox that oft times man becomes lost in a wilderness within the surge of teeming humanity. To be alone in a crowd is the greatest sorrow ever devised in heaven or hell. To be lost in a jungle or upon the great tundras is understandable and excusable. And there is always Polaris to lead one to the true north. But to be wandering in a peopled maze with a lonely mind is to be hopelessly enmeshed within a web designed by the spider which lays in wait for Barry Sullivan. In our story, Faith is the Evidence. A deadly spider known as Obsession. skirts of a small Midwestern town. A train approached the railroad yard fast, coming in with stack steaming. It wasn't a sleek, fast-moving passenger train, and the station master had no idea that there might be any passengers getting off. As a matter of fact, two men who did get off this train were not exactly traveling first class. We're coming in, John. Oh. I said we're coming in. We'd better get set to make tracks before the yard dig gets curious with a flashlight. Yeah. When we shake the dust off this rattler, we'd better split up until tomorrow night. Then we can meet down here in time to hop the eastbound. Yeah, it wouldn't do for a couple of tramps to be seen together, would it? One guy out of a job and busted is enough. The two of them is just one too many for the citizens to stomach. Yeah, okay, Molly. I'll see you tomorrow night. I'll take off here. <laughs> ah, that door's heavy. Well, I'll wait for you at the water tower, John. But don't be late. Okay. So long, Molly, and good luck on the handouts. Same back at you. So long. So long. <clears throat> okay, buddy. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. Where do you think you're going, mister? Me? I, uh... I don't know. But if I was to make a guess right now, I'd kind of say I'm probably heading for the city of Bastille. Oh. Where are you from, buddy? I don't know. I don't think I'm from any place. What do you mean? I mean, I'm from a lot of places. I'm just a guy that's broke, out of a job, and trying to get along, that's all. You don't look or sound like a hobo, mister. No? No, no, no. You're too young to be tramping the roads. You don't talk like you did, either. Sure, I went to school once, if that's what you mean. They even gave me an engraved sheepskin when I got through. One that proclaims in loud letters that I'm a bachelor of arts. Are you trying to be smart with me, son? Smart? No, no, not me. I couldn't be smart if I wanted to, mister. You ask me a question, and I answered it. And now we'd better get going, don't you think? You, uh... You don't like being locked up, do you, son? No. No, I don't. I didn't think so. So, maybe I... I didn't see you jump off that train. Oh? Yeah, maybe I was somewhere else. What's the catch? No catch, son. Except maybe it's Sunday morning, and... Maybe it's gonna be a nice day, and... Maybe you'd rather walk around in the sunshine and sit on a jail cot. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe I would. But you better be out of town before tomorrow night, or I might have to run you in after all. You better trot along before somebody else sees you. Okay, and thanks. You're pretty decent. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah? You, uh, probably get breakfast up at the parsonage. Parsonage? Yeah, yeah, you'll find it at Magnolia and Third. 
Dr. Homestead's the minister's name, and I don't think he'll turn you down. Thanks. Thanks again, mister. I won't forget this. Yes? Oh, I, uh... Yes? I didn't expect... I mean, well, I, I wanted to see Dr. Holstead. You I... mean Dr. Homestead, don't you? Homestead? Oh, yes, of course. I guess I do. Well, he's just having breakfast. Breakfast? Mm-hmm. But if it's important, I can call him. Oh, no, no, it's not important. I'll... I'll come back again and... Who is it, Catherine? Oh, Father, it's a gentleman to see you. To see me? Oh, how do you do, sir? Good morning. Won't you come in? Oh, well, I, uh... Please do. Uh, thank you. Now then, what can I do for you? Well, I, I... I didn't mean to disturb you, Doctor, but <clears throat> I... I was told... I mean... Well, I was told that maybe I could get breakfast here. Oh, breakfast. I haven't got any money to pay you for it, but if you've got a couple of odd jobs around here, I could do... Well, of course, my boy. Hey, Catherine, set another plate at the table, will you? I will, Father. And if you'd like to follow me, I'll show you where you can wash up a little. No, but I don't want to put you to any trouble. I mean, j just a sandwich or something. I can eat it outside. I think it's always much nicer to sit down to a table, don't you? If you'll just come this way, son. I wonder if you'll forgive my rudeness, young man, but I've my sermon to finish and I must get to it. If you'll just remain comfortable and finish your breakfast, my daughter here will keep you company. Oh, well, I, I think I'd better be going. And leave all those lovely hot cakes. Oh, well, I, I could take them with me. <laughs> <laughs> you stay right where you are, my boy. And I'll see you later. Goodbye, Doctor. Well? Some more syrup? Hmm? Oh, please, yes, thank you. Tell me, Mr. Carvel, what do you do? I mean, when you're working. Oh, I... I started out to be a writer. A writer? What sort of things did you write? A lot of tripe, Pollyanna stuff. <laughs> I used to believe it, too. What do you mean? Oh, stuff like good fellowship, silver lining. It's always darkest just before dawn. It's a long road that has no turning. Well, what do you mean you used to believe it? Don't you now? Nope. Why? Because it's not true. I think it is. So does my father. Oh, sure. Being a minister, a man's got to believe it so he can preach it. And I guess people want to hear it preached, too. But that doesn't make it true. Why not? Well, there's a lot of things people want to hear about how perfect everything is, that God is love, that there's beautiful sunshine everywhere. Well? Well, they don't believe that stuff. How can they? Maybe they used to think it was a long road that doesn't turn, but they get kind of hungry and tired waiting for it, too. And the silver lining hasn't shown up yet. They don't want to hear about God as love and faith and hope and all the rest. They want to hear how they can do something for themselves. And they'd be suckers for the first guy that came along, too. They'd believe anything that might help them, maybe. But you say the word of God wouldn't help them? Isn't that what you mean, Mr. Carver? Oh, look, Miss Homestead, there are two subjects that I don't argue about. Politics and religion. I believe what I believe, and you believe what you believe. All right. What you prefer well, it sort of looks like I've done a pretty good job on my breakfast, doesn't it? And now, maybe you could figure out a few little chores I could do to pay you? I can't think of any chores. But I'll tell you what you can do, if you want to. Anything at all. Go to church with me this morning. Church? Mm-hmm. Listen to my father's sermon. Oh, well, I... Nobody will try to convert you. And I think that's the least you could do to thank my father. To listen to what he has to say. <laughs> He's rather a good speaker. Uh-huh. Will you? Well, if that's what you want me to do, I guess I can stand it. Thanks, Mr. Carver. And after church, you can come back and have lunch with us. And in conclusion... May I leave you with these few thoughts that carry with them so much hope and faith and promise of the eternal future? They are indeed beatitudes of strength. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are they who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And in these words of everlasting truth and promise, seek ye the comfort of life and of life beyond. Amen.
If you please sit here, Mr. Carville, I'll, I'll have lunch on in a moment. Of course, it won't be very fancy. Well, look, I'm afraid I'm overdoing it just a little bit, don't you think? I, I mean, after all, breakfast and, well... Oh, I think nothing of it, my boy. We enjoy having a guest. We don't have very many, you know, so we're really taking advantage of you, not you of us. Well, that's very kind of you, sir. Uh, how did you like my sermon this morning, Mr. Carville? Your sermon? I don't think Mr. Carville liked it very well, Father. Oh, why not? Well, now, I didn't say that. I... Mr. Carvel believes that sermons should be more practical. That faith and hope are too flimsy to help much. Well, I... Isn't that what you said, Mr. Carvel? Well, yes, maybe it is. Why, my boy? Well, I guess your sermon was all right this morning, Dr. Homestead. Things that people want to hear. I mean, people that only come to church to salve their conscience. The ones that don't need any help to begin with. Don't they, Mr. Carvel? Well, maybe spiritual help, I guess. But I'm talking about the kind of sermon that would really help people. Why, I'll bet I could preach a sermon that wouldn't even leave standing room. I'd tell them a few things. A few things that might help right now. So they wouldn't have to wait until they went into the next world. Things that might begin to fill up that emptiness that people feel when they're down and out. When they're discouraged and everything's a mess. Yeah, that's what I'd do if I were a minister. That sounds very interesting, my boy. If you could do it. Of course I could do it. I think I know what people want. I mean, really want. Hmm. We're having a meeting at the church Tuesday night. Supposing you preach the sermon, Mr. Carvel. Preach this? Oh, no, no. I couldn't do that. No. Besides, I, I won't even be here Tuesday. Have you someplace definite to go, Mr. Carvel? Well, no, not exactly, but... Then why couldn't you stay until Tuesday? Well, I... I, I should like to hear that sermon, my boy. Oh, no, Doctor, I... I, I think Mr. Carvel was just talking, Father. Joking. I don't think he meant what he said. Of course I meant what I said. Then why don't you prove it? Do as my father asked. Well, because I... Because why, my boy? Well, I... All right. All right, I will do it. Maybe I was just talking to hear myself talk. But I'd like to prove whether I'm right or not. And if I am... I'll stay, Dr. Homestead, for Tuesday night. <laughs> It is obvious that he walters in the dank undergrowth of doubt. But one only arbitrarily tries to prove what he disbelieves. And the constant search for that proof is the sure sign of a mind, consciously or not, held in the shackles of an obsession. In a moment, I'll return to our story. Nervously waiting in the doctor's study, has had his tattered, battered suit pressed by Kathy. He looks much fitter. He wears also one of her father's white shirts, several sizes too large. Why don't you sit down and relax, Mr. Carvel? You wear yourself out. Miss Homestead. Yes. I, I don't think I can go through with it. Why? I don't know. It's just that, well. I, I thought I had something to say, but I guess I haven't. I can't think of a thing. You will. What makes you think I will? I tell you, I haven't got a thought in my mind. It's funny, too, because I was so sure before. I was so certain. Now I can't do it. But you must. After all, Father's told everyone that there'll be a guest speaker. 
You can't let him down now. Look, it isn't a question of letting anybody down. It's a matter of me going out there and making a first-class fool out of myself. I tell you, I can't do it. You'll do it, Mr. Carvel. What makes you so sure? Ready for you, Mr. Carvel. Will you come this way, please? But I just got through telling Miss Homestead that... He was just got through telling me he was going to say, Father, and it sounds wonderful. I... Good for you, my boy. You know, this experiment of yours is proving to be one of the most interesting things that's happened to us in a long time. Now, will you follow me, please? But, Dr. Homestead... You'd better hurry, Mr. Carvel, or you'll be late. Good luck. And I'll be listening. My dear people, we have a visitor with us tonight, Mr. John Carver who first came to our house last Sunday morning and who since then has proved himself to be a very good and valuable friend. Without knowing of his text, I asked him to talk to you tonight and he very kindly consented. And now, without me saying anything further, may I introduce Mr. John Carvel. Thank you, and... Ladies and gentlemen, the other day when I told Dr. Homestead that I had something to say, I guess I was wrong. Because what I have to say shouldn't be said here. The reason that I said I had something to say is that I... Well, I disagreed with Dr. Homestead. I disagreed with whoever it was that said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek have never inherited anything except tragedy and unhappiness and a kicking around. It's the strong who inherits the earth. Brute force, take what you can get, no matter how you have to take it. Blessed are they, sure, the meek are blessed. They're blessed with everything and anything that the strong doesn't want kicks aside. My father was meek. And he was blessed. Ah, oh, but what does it matter? You don't want to hear what I've got to say. I'd blaspheme your ears if I did say it. And you'd smirk and sneer and say that I was doomed to eternal fire and brimstone. All right, I am, and I'm glad of it. If that's what it means not to be meek, I don't want the earth. You can have it. I got the package I had with me, Dr. Homestead. I'd like to get it. It's got a few things in it that... Uh, wait a minute, John. Yes, sir. Sit down for a moment, won't you? What for, sir? I'd like to talk to you. No, I don't think there's much of anything to say, Dr. Homestead, except that I'm sorry that I embarrassed you. You didn't embarrass me in the least, John. In fact, I'm glad you said what you did. John, what happened? What happened? Yes. You spoke of your father. You didn't finish what you were going to say. Would you mind telling me? Oh, you wouldn't be interested, Dr. Homestead, because it... Yes? Well, my father was a doctor. He was a very great doctor and a very great man. But he got himself mixed up with a lot of cockeyed ideas. He went for that blessed other meek stuff. That's what happened to him. What do you mean, that's what happened to him, John? Look, Dr. Homestead, my father was a great man. I worshipped him. I always wanted to be like him, just like him, because he was tolerant. Gentle and meek. And do you know what that did to him and to my mother? No. Well, my father never refused a call. Dead of night, middle of the winter, howling blizzard. Even for a toothache, he'd go. But he never collected any money. People would tell him they didn't have it, and he'd tear up the bill. Or he'd say, pay me when you get it. They never got it. But they bought automobiles and radios and new clothes. But they never got enough money to pay my father for saving their lives or helping them when they needed it. Go on, son. But still, he'd go out. Every call, night and day, day in and day out. Even when he was sick, he'd go. Until finally it killed him. One night he came to my mother and myself and he apologized because he knew he was about to die. He said he was sorry that he couldn't leave mother and me anything except a bunch of worthless bills. And those people, Dr. Homestead, those people didn't even come to his funeral. Not even a card or a note saying they were sorry. Sure, my dad was meek, and he inherited the earth six feet of it. I see. Oh, that's... That's why I shut off my mouth. Every time I think of it, I see red. Red usually means a danger signal, doesn't it, John? And the usual thing to do when you see red is to stop. The green is the light to go on. Go on? John, your father was probably even much greater man than you thought he was. And he inherited... A great deal more than you think he did. You, for example. What? Think about that, John. You know what I mean without me telling it to you. If he were alive, I wonder what he would have thought about that speech of yours the other night. 
You see, John, your father lived and died for a principle, the principle of mankind. He was meek, yes, but Christ was meek. But it takes strength to be meek, enough strength to thrash the money changers, enough strength to live for what he believed in. And it sometimes takes more strength to live for what you believe in than it does to die for it. That's all I had to say. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, Doctor. Gee, I thought you was never going to show, John. I waited and waited last night. I was going to catch these bound without you. Well, I'm here now. Sure. But Stuart, let's get going, huh? Here comes the rattler now. Okay. Try for the center cars. Come on. Wait a minute, you guys. The yard dick. Come on, John. Stop for us, too. Come on, John. Go on, Marley. I'm staying. Oh, don't be a sap. Go on. Okay, sucker. What did you stop for, boy? Why didn't you grab the train with your buddy? Never mind. Never mind if I'm pinched. I'm pinched. I didn't figure on you stopping. I didn't shoot to get you, but sort of make sure that you wouldn't keep going. You know, we don't like tramps in this town. Well, I'm not going. And your shooting didn't change my mind any either. Except to make me wonder kind of suddenly where it was I thought I was going, what I was running away from. I'm staying right here, if you don't mind. There's no place else to go. Well? Well, what? A little while ago, I got a phone call that a certain chap might try to hop the eastbound about now. But wish him luck if he made it. And if he didn't, <laughs> Dr. Homestead lives at 3rd in Magnolia. Yeah. Hello, John Carvo. Hello. How long have you been sitting here in the church? Oh, I don't know. Quite a while, I guess. We've been waiting for you at the house. We'd about given up. Then the caretaker said you were over here. You changed your mind about leaving. Yeah. I'm glad about that, John. I guess Dad will be pretty glad, too. He thinks a lot of you. Does he? Mm-hmm. So do I. That's why I was hoping you'd come back. In fact, that's why I called Mr. Perkins. Who's Mr. Perkins? He's the detective that takes care of the freight yard. Oh, so you were the one who called him. Mm-hmm. But I didn't want you to come back if you didn't want to. Really? I thought it might be that you had some place to go or something to find. I did. But I guess I'd already found it, Kathy. At your house. Shall we go there now? Oh, yes, thank you. It's a beautifully clear day, isn't it, John? Clearest day I've known in a long time, Kathy. You understand that? I think I'd understand better if I knew why you came back. I don't know exactly why myself, Catherine. Except, well, well, maybe I'm a sucker, like my dad. Maybe I've gone for the same things he went for. Blessed are they. With good enough for him. Yes, I guess so. Yes, it must have been. And I, I can't kick much because he was happy. He was very happy. Well, I haven't been at all. You can be. I know that, Kathy. And I'm going to be from now on, thanks to your father and mine. John, that's what I meant the day I talked to you. Your father was like mine. That's why... Blessed are they that are meek, for they shall inherit the earth, and they shall bequeath it to you. It's yours for the taking, John. Yours for the taking. Ours for the taking, too. Isn't that so, Kathy? Why, yes, John. <laughs> yes. The meek shall inherit the earth. The earth is for the taking. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and created man in his own image. Therefore, man can, by the very power of this heritage, become godlike, unless, and I say unless, the dark angel who is passed out of paradise shall speak his silent and evil words, and fill the mind with the quick sands of obsession.
Produced and transcribed by C.P. McGregor in Hollywood. against society, in a moment you'll hear a weird and fantastic story of a terrible obsession starring Mary Anderson. In the sordid confines of a psychopathic ward, redolent of iodoform and peraldehyde, where a moon-faced clock bites off time in rounded nibbles, a girl lies under the white counterpane of a restraining bed. A girl somewhere in her early twenties. She had been found wandering in the streets, her mind enveloped in that darksome mantle that is called amnesia, remembering not even her name. Then at the hospital, that void of darkness was probed by the searching skill of a psychiatrist. And she wanted to talk. She had to talk with the same urgency that one must breathe. It was an obsession. There. There. 
Isn't that funny? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You feel a little easier now? Skip the bedside, Nana, Doc. I just want you to listen to me for a while. That's all you can do for me anyway. This whole thing keeps buzzing around inside my head. It, it's driving me crazy. I... Yeah, I saw that look between you two. <laughs> You think I'm crazy already. Well, maybe I am. Maybe I'm dead, too. I don't know. It all seemed like simple arithmetic. Just simple arithmetic. What? What is it you want to tell us, Miss Bennett? <laughs> I don't know why I want to tell you. The whole life's on me. But I... I've got to stop this buzzing inside my head, this buzz, buzz, buzz. Look, Doc, do you remember a guy called Olins? Frankie Olins? The gangster? Oh, yes, I saw him in the headlines. Held up a postal truck, didn't he? Well, let's see now. He, uh, he got away with $400,000. Well, he, uh, almost got away. And the next time I saw his name, the state had him in a gas chamber. That was it, wasn't it? No, Doc. Not by a long shot. That was just the beginning. You mean you've been in conversation with him since he went to the great beyond? Where Frankie finally went. It's too hot for conversation. But he didn't go there when the state and the newspapers thought he did. You see, I was Frankie's girl. Well, anyway, you figured I was. So I know the whole story. I ought to know. I made it happen. Right from that day, I went to visit Frankie in the death cell. He was waiting for his mouthpiece, Jim Vincent, and for his brother, Carl. I knew he'd never tell where he had hidden that hut. Four hundred thousand. Four hundred (laughs) thousand. Unless we got him out. So, when Jim and Carl arrived and told us a reprieve had been turned down there by everybody, even the governor, I decided to try a long shot. Something I'd been keeping under wraps for a long time. Frankie was pacing the cell again. Well, what are you going to do? Just sit here? Can't you think of something? Come on, Carl. Where's that brotherly love? We've seen everybody. I don't don't know what to do. There's not a legal trick left. But there is a chance. Just one. It's a long one, Frankie. What is it? For Pete's sake, what is it? There's a friend of mine. A doctor. I was talking to him last night. A doctor? Are you kidding, Sally? What good can a doc do me? Why don't you let her talk, Frankie? Maybe she's got something. All right, all right. Go ahead. It's like this, Frankie. The doctor told me that with the right injections, a man who's been gassed can be uh, brought back to life. Brought back? Sally, what are you giving me? What kind of a double cross is this? Relax, honey. Before you have a guard here. I'm telling you a plain fact. Anyone who's been gassed and even pronounced dead can be revived, provided you get into the right doctor fast enough. You want to hear the details, Frankie? Okay, Sally. I'm listening. But get this straight. You, Jim, and you, Carl, I don't do no talking about the 400 grand until I'm out of this pen. And you can figure how much talking I'll do if I come out dead. laughing in myself all the time, Doc. Funny, worrying about Jim and Carl when it was little me who had all the plans. Well, anyway, we pulled it off. We bought ourselves a couple of prison guards and a laundry driver. On my instructions, Frank asked to be cremated. Then, after the prison officials pronounced him dead, our guards switched bodies. One body was sent to the crematory with a tag of Frank Ollins. That's the one you read about in the headlines. But the real Frank Ollins was shoved into a laundry sack. In less than ten minutes, the truck driver was pulling up in the rear of an old house I'd rented. About a mile from the pen. Laundry man! Come on, Jim. Come. Okay. Give me a hand. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Lay him down on the table. All right. Okay, driver. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Here's your money. Beat it. Okay, lady. All right, Scotty. Here he is. Scotty, he was a Dr. 
friend of mine. He had his apparatus all set up. A tank of oxygen, a pull motor, and a little miracle drug called methylene blue. You can look it up in any medical journal if you're interested. Anyway, Scotty went to work. Boy, she's breathing. Breathing again. <laughs> it was like a miracle, all right. But I didn't have no time to think about miracles. Not then I didn't. I had a neat little plan all worked out. And I had to spring it before Frankie got too much like him old self again. Right now, he was kind of dazed. And what was more important to me, pretty grateful to be seeing light coming through the windows. And no bars on them. I... I can't believe it. I... I just can't believe it. The last thing I remember, I... I was being strapped to that chair in the gas chamber and... Oh, and then... Oh, forget it, Frankie. You're gonna be fine now. Oh, you bet I am. Especially when we pull out of here and I pick up that dough. That's gotta take a little doing. You leave this house and you'll be spotted in a minute. Well, what do you expect me to do? Hold up in here like a hermit? We got a better plan than that. We're going to fix it so you'll never be recognized as Frankie Olins again. Yeah? Well, how, how do you mean? Plastic surgery, Frankie. A new face to go with a new life. Well, you know, that's not bad. <laughs> not bad. Well, come on, let's do it and get it over with. And the only trouble is we're broke. Shut up, Carl. Sally, what's he giving me? What do you want? An automatic statement of how much it costs to buy your life? All right, here it is. Five thousand for each of the guards. Two thousand for that other stiff. Twenty five hundred. You'll get it back with interest. Sure. Sure, we trust you, Frankie. Well then what are you after? Look, honey, it isn't what we're after. It's what we gotta have. Enough of that four hundred thousand to buy the plastic surgeon and then get us all out of here. But it isn't safe for me to go after it. You said so yourself, Sally. That's right, I did. But uh how about one of us going after it? No. No, I can't. You mean you want to drop the whole thing just after going this far? Well, why won't the surgeon go on the cuff? Maybe he don't believe you got 400000 buried. Why should he? I had nothing to show him. All right, then. Look, Sally, do you think you could convince him if, if you had a map to show him? Now you're making sense, Frankie. I don't know whether I am or not, but I'm trusting you, Sally. I'll draw a map of where the dough is, then you use it to sell the dock, see? But get this. Nobody is to leave this joint until I'm ready to leave with him. Is that a deal, Sally? Sure, it's a deal, honey. Now, just sit down, and I'll get you a pen and some paper. And then, right at this point, on the left side of the highway, there's an auto club road sign. You just pace off ten yards into the woods from that sign, and that's it. Right next to a big rock. That's fine, Frankie. Yeah, I'll take that paper. Now, how about running up the dock, huh? So we can get this whole thing over with it. Jim, get your hands up, Frankie. Come on. Now, over against the wall. Sally! You're not going to let him do this to us. Sally! Sorry, Frankie. But this is the way it's got to be. What? Are you dirty little double crosser? I'll kill you. I swear I'll kill you. Go on. Get back to the wall. Yeah, that's better. You always were hot-headed, Frankie. Jim, don't do it. She'll only double-cross you like she done me. Carl! Carl, you tell him! Carl's not going to tell him a thing, Frankie. It's a simple question of arithmetic. Four hundred grand divided four ways just don't add up to as much as when you divide it among three. All right, Jim. Wait! For Pete's sake, wait! That map I drew... It ain't on the level. I was trying to trick you. Let me go and I'll show you where it is. No good, Frankie. We were expecting that one. So long, honey. No! That was the real end of Frankie Olin. I don't know why he couldn't understand. It was just a matter of simple arithmetic. Besides, it wasn't any crime. There's no crime involved, is there? Shooting a man who was already dead. Mm. 
No. There is no crime in killing a man who is already dead. No crime to be reckoned with in the courts of mortal men. But what of the crime reflected in the dark mirror of your mind? The hideous crime of your own obsession. Returning now to the strange obsession starring Mary Anderson. In the white-walled cubicle of the psychopathic ward, the sweep hand of the clock turns silently on its orbit as Sally Bennett's voice knifes through the stillness like a thin blade of a scalpel ripping through membrane. Frank Orleans is dead. His debt to society marked, paid in full. And somewhere, $400,000 lies waiting for those who can find it. For those whose murder-warped minds will stop at nothing under the compelling influence of obsession. So now there were only three of us. We piled into Carl's sedan. Jim, Carl, and me. And we started out. Well, Carl was anxious to get there all right. He drove like one of those high school kids, and I cut down Lizzie. What are you trying to do, Carl? Jump us all? Uh, you want to get there, don't you? Exactly, I want to get there. That's why I'd like you to slow down. Take it easy, both of you. Uh, all right. Say... Why don't we stop at a roadside hotel for the night and go on in the morning? Okay with you, Carl? Mm, well, I I think it's crazy, but uh, if that's the way you want it, okay. The three of us had dinner in an upstairs room. Dinner and wine and conversation. Conversation that set things up for a little plan I'd worked out with Carl. <laughs> well, how's about it, Jim? Another glass for you? I don't think I'd better have any. Don't be <laughs> silly, Jim. We've got lots to celebrate tonight. <laughs> okay, yeah, certainly have. Okay, Carl, fill her up. Sure, yeah. You yeah. keep Jim company, Carl. I'm going to take a look at that balcony view. Okay, Sally. Okay. Well, here's to the 400 grand, Jim. And to Sally, huh? <laughs> ah, what a girl. Ah, and it's one thing I want you to keep straight, Carl. The money we divide. But not Sally. She's all mine, you understand? Uh, Jim. Huh? Why don't you come out here on the balcony with me? It's nice and private out here. Huh. <laughs> now, you don't have to repeat that invitation. Well, see you later, Carl. <laughs> yeah, go to it, Jim. I wouldn't have a chance with her even if I wanted it. I am, Jim. Huh? Over by the railing. Oh. It's pretty out here, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You're pretty, Sally. Come here, come here. You and me are going to have a great time, aren't we? Why not? We'll have nearly 300,000 bucks to keep us warm, Sally. Anywhere we want to go, we go there. Anything we want to do, we do it. I've been waiting a long time. Time for a setup like this. So have I. Oh, Jim, huh? look. Right in our backyard, a deer. Yeah, that's nice. Look at him, Jim. He's cute. Uh, I, I don't see anything. Here, get where I'm standing. Huh? Right by the rail. Uh, I still don't see anything. He's down under our balcony. You'll have to lean over to see him. Ah, uh, sure you're not seeing an elephant, Sally? A little pink one, huh? Ha. Oh, where? How are you seeing things, Sally? Maybe you'd better have another... Carl, what are you... No, no, no! And so we find that the deceased, James Vincent, met his death from an accidental fall while under the influence of alcohol. Naturally, the other guest understood when Carl and I left immediately after the inquest. We, uh, we couldn't bear to hang around the scene of a tragedy. Besides, there was a pile of dough waiting to be dug up. Carl and I, we were the only members left of the 400 Grand Club. There were no secrets between us. <laughs> <laughs> 
Except one. Just one. Carl didn't know that. I'd uh, gotten Jim's gun. <laughs> A girl can't be too careful, you know. It's kind of nice, isn't it? <laughs> What's that? Uh, two of us alone. You did want it that way. What do you think, Carl? I think the future looks mighty sweet. <laughs> it was different with Frankie and Jim along. They were both suckers. Always in hot water with the cops. Ah, you and me. Nobody's got a thing on us. It's because we keep our heads working. Yeah, and that's why we get... Carl, Carl, there it is. The hills. The road side of the map. Yeah, you're right. Come on, honey. Get your purse open. Just a minute, Carl. Get that shovel out of the turtle bag. Oh, yeah. I'm so excited. I almost forgot. And you were just saying you always keep your head working. Well, mine's still on tight. Let's see now. Ten paces from the sign into the wood. Yeah, you measure it off. I'll get the thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This must be it, all right. Does everything match up? It sure does. I came right out by this big rock, just like on the drawing. Yeah, I... Okay, Carl. I'll keep a lookout, just in case anybody gets Yeah, healthy. okay, okay. Go on. You can start digging. Yeah, all right. <laughs> dig it plenty wide, Carl. No use missing the spot. <laughs> Don't worry, baby. I'll dig it wide as a grave. I never felt more like working. <laughs> Baby, there she is. Looks like an old tool chest, don't it? But we know better. Don't we, Carl? We know it's a gold mine. Come on, get it out of that hole. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. There she comes. Oh, oh there we are, safe and sound. Oh, now, Sally, now we can... Sally. Sally, what are you doing with that gun? A... Sally, we're, we're, we're partners, ain't we? There's plenty here for... Both of us. Please, Sally, don't, please. I don't know why none of them understood. It was all just simple arithmetic. I wanted it to be 400,000 divided among one. Me. And that's the way it was now. I pushed Carl's body into the grave he'd dug for himself. And then I knelt down beside the chest. And I pried it open with a shovel. And that did it. I wondered if the money would be in small bills or big ones. <laughs> I lifted the lid. There didn't seem to be anything in it. Just just torn pieces of newspaper. But there had to be. It, it just couldn't be empty. Then I found something. An envelope. Sealed. That was it. I, I tore it open. Do you... Do you know what was inside? There was a single dollar bill. And a note. A note from Frankie that said, Whoever's double cross me, keep this buck for your trouble. The rest of the 400 grand, I leave to the worms. <laughs> to the worms! <laughs> what a funny talk! All that money! <laughs> They say they found me wandering on the highway. I don't know how I got there. I didn't remember anything until just a little while ago. And then I got this awful buzzing inside my head. I thought it'd go away if I told you about everything, but it... It's worse than before. I... I guess I just gotta die to get rid of it. 
Anyway, it'll, it'll be better that way. I wouldn't want to live without the money. You see, I counted so much on it. I never thought about the things I was doing to get it until... The money wasn't there. You understand about that, don't you, Doc? It was all just simple arithmetic. Simple arithmetic. Hold it up, Doctor. Hold it. What's happened to it, Doctor? Hold it. Mm, just a minute. No. No, it's no use. She's dead. You have been listening to Obsession. take root in the soil of envy and flower in crime. We can give the world a face free of lurking malice, but back in the dim recesses of our mind crouch the age-old instincts, ready to destroy. And so to our story, starring Evelyn Anchors. with wild, thrusting arms upon the stern rocks of the New England shore. Silhouetted against the slate sky is the outline of a house, Huntley House. And the girl in our story, Maxine Stark, must have regretted her visit to this home above the sea because back of her smiling and friendly face was a grim and growing obsession. Time, it seemed the right thing. You see, Teresa Huntley was my twin sister. We were worlds apart socially. <laughs> In fact, we had mutually refused to see or speak to each other for ten years. She had been through a tragedy, and I was with my husband, Dudley, on one of his trips I couldn't avoid. He was a beer salesman. We were in Maine, and I insisted that we drive over to the coast to see my sister last few miles, the road was very bumpy. And my husband was worse than the road. Oh, why in the Sam Hill are we going over here anyway? Because I want to. Uh, drive to the ends of the earth? And for what? She is my sister, you know. Well, I've never heard you brag about that before. Well, there are times. After all, she did just lose her husband. And well, what's that to you? I'm thinking of Teresa. Maybe her husband meant something to her. Huh. Thanks. Oh, Daddy, let's not argue. Well, who's arguing? I just think it's stupid. What'd your sister ever do for you? Who knows? Maybe she'll have a change of heart. Finally, we arrived at Huntley House. Teresa had certainly done well. It was a charming place. Not too big, but... but with a touch of elegance every woman dreams of. The house ran almost to the beach with the ocean beyond... And there were flowers, lots of them, alongside the house, protected from the wind by a heavy, thick concrete wall. It was lovely. We knocked at the door. Even after ten years, Teresa didn't seem surprised. Well, come in, Maxie. Teresa, this is my husband, Dudley. Glad to know you, Mrs. Huntley. How do you do? Say, I can't get over it. Get over what? How much you two look alike. Oh, what did you expect? 
Uh, my husband and I were traveling by this way. I, I heard what had happened, so... Well, I, I thought we'd drive over. I had a premonition you were coming. Now I suppose you'll want to straighten up a bit after your trip. It's right up the stairs there. Thank you. As Dudley and I walked upstairs, I got my first glimpse of the interior. What I saw made me green with envy. Chippendale, the Dresden over the fireplace. <laughs> Teresa always did have such marvelous taste. The house was a picture. Dudley must have been thinking the same thing as we dressed for dinner. Some joint she's got here. Dudley, please remember where you are. Now, what did I say? Well, don't joint the place up all so. All right, all right. I know how to handle myself. We went downstairs and had dinner. It was very uncomfortable. With Dudley blundering all over the place and Teresa. Prim, starch, Teresa. And not too friendly. After dinner, it got so late, she had to ask us to stay all night. Dudley went to bed early. Well, Teresa and I had a little chat in the living room. Ten years is a long time, Maxine. Yes, it is. I think it was very nice of you to come. Even though it took a death to bring you. I'm glad it pleases you, Teresa. There was no other reason, was there? Of course not. No, I didn't come to ask you for anything. Ten years haven't changed you much, Maxine. <laughs> Nor you. After what I've gone through this last month, that's a compliment. You do miss your husband, don't you? Yes, I miss Everett very much. Poor fellow, we couldn't even give him a decent burial. What happened? He'd been working in his garden. He loved his garden. He decided to go for a swim. I watched him. He was well beyond the breakers when the riptide hit him. He screamed for help. I was powerless. We're five miles from anyone here. You know how I'm afraid of. I've always been afraid of the water. Oh, make seem if you've just been here that day. She broke off. Finally excused herself. Thought she was going to bed, but a moment later I saw her walking down on the beach. Looking out at the sea as if, as if imploring it to return her husband. I went up to our room feeling almost a little bit sorry for Teresa. Dudley was still awake. Well, what'd she say? Oh, she was talking about her husband. Huh. She certainly wasn't very glad to see us, was she? Well, I think she was, in a way. Well, who knows? You're her only sister. Maybe you'll get yours someday. I don't want anything from her. Oh, not much you don't. You'll have to play your cards smart, though. Oh, why don't you go to sleep? All right, all right. Oh, I still can't get over how much you and your sister look alike. It was the second time Dudley had said that. And the words revolved in my mind. I went over and opened the shutters of the window. The sea breeze was fresh and cool. I thought of my sister and I. There never had been much love between us, only... Only a question of who got what. I walked back to the bed. Dudley was asleep. I thought to myself, in spite of everything, Teresa had got hers. Prim, starch, Teresa had won. The next morning, I got up late. After breakfast, I found Teresa in the flower garden, which was protected from the wind by that heavy cement wall. Good morning, Maxine. Good morning, Teresa. You look as if you rested well. I should. I've been on sleeping tablets ever since it happened. Oh. <laughs> Your garden is lovely. It was Everett's garden. He was very proud of it. He even built the cement wall here. He just finished it. What do you uh, plan to do? Oh, I don't know. I may take a trip later on and sell the house. Oh, no, never. Everett thought too much of the house. If I do go, I'll lock it up. 
But there's still all of Everett's business affairs to clear up. Those things are always hard for a woman. Oh, no. Everett's friend at the bank in town, David Courtley. He's been wonderful. He's taken over completely. Teresa, I... I want you to know something. What? Well, we've never been very close as sisters, and it's... It's hard for me to say this, but... If there's anything that... That's very kind of you. In coming here as you did, you already expressed that. Maxine, why don't you and Dudley stay on over the weekend? Thank you. That would be very nice. Perhaps Dudley was right. Perhaps if I played my card smart. That afternoon, I decided to take a swim in the ocean. Put on a suit, and as I approached the terrace facing the beach, I heard Dudley babbling about something to caress. <laughs> Oh, this is the life. This is for me. You like it here at the beach, don't you? Uh, uh, I don't care if I never write another beer order in my life. Well, Maxine, your husband likes it here. So I understand. You're going for a swim? Yes. Anyone care to join me? No, not me. How about you, Dudley? Not me. I swim like a rock. You're in my class. As I walked down to the water, I noticed the house faced a cove. And there was a mooring out into the water with a small sailboat tied up at the end. I guess Everett had kept it there during the summer months. I hit the water and took a long turn way out past the breakers. When I returned, the terrace was empty. I dried off and walked to the door and stopped at the sound of a man's voice I Hello, didn't Teresa. recognize at first. And as I listened, I realized it was David Cawthon to David, whom Teresa was so nice talking. to see you. Well, I'm sorry I haven't been up, Teresa. I've been terribly busy. But say, you're looking wonderful. Thank you. Believe me, for the first time, I believe you're coming around to my way of thinking. You've been getting some sun. Yes, I have. Well, that's good. That's good for you. But say, I um, I noticed the car on the driveway as I came in. That belongs to Maxine, my sister. Your sister? Yes, she and her husband are here for a few days. <laughs> I dare say that now I've come into all of Everett's money, I'm certain to be plagued by relatives. <laughs> That was all I needed to hear. Teresa would never change. <laughs> Teresa, who had always coveted and always won. Or had she? Suddenly a plan evolved. Out of what Dudley had repeated many times since our visit to Huntley House. If I could just change places with her... <laughs> But I don't know, Maxine. I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You said you liked it here, didn't you? Yeah, Maxine, but... How can we ever go back to what we had, knowing... Well, knowing all this is here for us? Well, I don't know. I'm afraid. Think what we would have. Just think what would be ours. The house. Her money. Freedom. All the things you've wanted and I've wanted. Yeah, but this is murder. Oh, murder, Dudley. It's, it's merely retribution. The retribution she deserves. But how? That's the easiest part. I needed Dudley for my plan. Oh, how I needed him. That night, we waited until well after Teresa had gone to bed. Then we slipped up to her bedroom. I knew she practically knocked herself out with sleeping pills every night. We opened the door, crept into the room. We had her gagged and her arms bound almost before she went up. Then Dudley held her while I began the transfer. My rings, and my wristwatch, and a locket with my name inscribed on it. We carried her downstairs, down to the mooring, into the sailboat. Dudley spoke the first word. Maxine, are, are you sure you know how to say this thing? Of course, get in. There was a good breeze. We sailed out quickly. About half a mile offshore, we untied Teresa and pushed her over the side. <laughs> Her scream was lost in the sound of the heavy drum. And now we return to the story on the wild sea in the shadow of Huntley House, starring Evelyn Ankers. I did have a feeling of elation as I stood beside my husband, deadly in the sailboat, watching the glimmer of a white cat which, which a moment before had been my sister. But the sense of elation somehow was not complete. I, I thought of my plan. It had worked splendidly. 
Dudley had been a help, but, but now he was nervous. Maxine, don't you think we'd better be heading back? All right. Uh, and quickly, there's a boat over there. Where? Uh, ahead of us. Oh, she's miles away. There was the outline of the boat with running lights clear in the moonlight. But she was far away. We came about and headed back to the cove. About a quarter of a mile from the shore, I ducked below. My plan was nearly completed. I opened the seacocks, jumped up on deck, and was in the water before Dudley realized what was happening. What are you doing, Maxine? What are you doing? Come back! Don't leave me here! Come back! I watched. Fascinated. Until the sailboat went under. Then I swam in. Climbed up on the sand below the house and... And I stood up, prepared to assume my new identity as Mrs. Everett Huntley. At the house, I waited a full hour before I notified the authorities that the boat was missing. I knew that neither Teresa nor Dudley could swim, and it would be over quickly for them. And I called David Cortland, Teresa's counselor since her husband's death. He rushed out to the house immediately. He was to be the first test in my new role. And he was easier than I expected. Oh, David. I got her as quickly as I could, Teresa. It's terrible, David. They, they've been gone nearly six hours now. There, there. The Coast Guard searching by boat and by plane. I'm sure they're all right. But uh, tell me, what happened? Well, Maxine and her husband decided on the spur of the moment to, to go on a moonlight sail. Did either of them know anything about a boat? Of course, Maxine handles the boat marvelously. She did practically nothing else but swim and sail when we were youngsters. Well, then, there's nothing to worry about. It's a very calm sea tonight. Yes, I... Oh, I never would have let them go otherwise. Oh, David, I... There, there, now. <laughs> You've certainly had your share these past weeks. But don't worry. If they're in trouble, they'll be picked up. upset me. There was the other boat that night, but, but the day passed. Then two days. Oh, I felt relieved. The afternoon of the second day, I got a sudden phone call from David. I was prepared for that too, but, but not quite all of it. I have bad news for you, Teresa. A fishing boat was just brought in the body of a woman. It's evidently... Oh, no, David. Yes. Seems the boat did go down. Oh. oh, how terrible. I suppose I I should come in and, and arrange for the body. No, I'll do that. But won't they want me to identify her? Oh, no. No, they'll do that merely by taking fingerprints. I certainly wasn't prepared for that, nor for what followed in a few hours. Summoned by the police in town. David picked me up. He, he certainly was understanding as we sat in the waiting room of the police station. We won't be long, I'm sure. What is it they want? No, I don't know. They just said to bring you down. You may go in now. Thank you. Yes, Lieutenant? Sit down. You're uh, Mrs. Huntley? Yes. Mrs. Huntley, I called you down here. I want a complete report of what happened the other night. Certainly. I suppose after what I tell you, you won't be interested in seeing the body. No. At least I know if I were in your shoes, I wouldn't be interested. Why not? The body had deteriorated, so we were unable to identify it with fingerprints. Can you uh, identify these? This locket, these rings? Oh, yes. Yes, 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 those were Maxine's. Oh, oh my dear sister. <laughs> made the report as the police requested, and a week or so later, we held Teresa's funeral. They never did find Dudley's body. Then I returned to Huntley House, but well, as the days passed by, it, it became oppressive. What had been so lovely before, the, the house, the beach, the garden with the cement wall shielding it, all too quickly became the storehouse of memories I, I wanted to lose. Then I... Uh, 
I mulled over an idea. And finally, I made up my mind. I called David, and he came out immediately. Come on in, David. Won't you sit down? Thank you, Teresa. You know, it's always so good to see you. Is it? Need I tell you? David, I'm going to take a trip. Excellent. Wonderful idea. Bermuda, England, France. How does it sound to you? Well, I think it's the only thing. Tell me when you want to leave, and I'll make all the arrangements. Well, I'd, I'd like to go as quickly as possible. Well, no sooner said than done. One other thing, David. Hmm? I, I've decided to sell the house. Really? Yes. Well, isn't that rather a change? I thought you said you'd never sell it. You mean Everett did, don't you? He loved it so. Well, that he did. David, Everett was your best friend, wasn't he? My very best. As you knew him, do you think he would want me to live here after what has happened? No, I dare say you wouldn't. I'll post it for sale. You'll have no trouble selling it, I'm sure. And I'll arrange you the finest accommodations for your trip to Europe. David was so kind. So very thoughtful. <laughs> I almost believed that he liked me. Or maybe it was because of Everett. I sold Huntley House the next day. People who bought it simply loved it. All except the cement wall by the flower bed. <laughs> they said it destroyed the view and that they were going to tear it down. They moved in practically as I moved out. When I arrived at the station to take the train to New York, David was waiting for me with a beautiful corsage. Thoughtful as always. This is for you. Oh, thank you, David. It's beautiful. Now, I want you to have a wonderful rest. You'll be in New York a few days before you sail. I will. Yes, I thought you might want to do some shopping. Oh, you, you think of everything. All aboard! All aboard! You know, Teresa, I'm going to miss you. Really? Very much. I want you to know that. Oh, I shall miss you too, David. Hurry back, won't you? Yes, I, I will, David. New York was marvelous. <laughs> Especially after the memory of David standing there at the station and what he had said. Oh, I had a glorious shopping spree and the date for sailing came around almost too quickly. I'd been on board an hour since the ship had left the port of New York when there was a knock on my cabin door. Come in. You're Mrs. Huntley? That's right. Uh, Sergeant Burns, New York Police. You'll come with me, please. They rushed me off to the station. No one would say anything. I had no idea what was happening or what, what had happened. Then they, they put me in a room alone. Suddenly the door opened and David walked in. I rushed over to him. David, well, what's happened? Keep your hands off of me. David, well, what's the matter? Well, to think, Teresa, it? that I was falling in love with you. David, please... Please don't stand there like that. Tell me, what's happened? You know what happened. You were there that last day with Everett. Everett? Well, Why, weren't you? Well, weren't yes. you with him there alone? Yes. Did you hear him there in that riptide? And didn't you hear his cries? Yes, that's right, yes. Teresa, you should never have sold Huntley House. Why? What do you mean? The new owner tore down that cement wall Everett had been building to protect his flowers. The new owner found Everett's body embedded in the cement. How could you ever do it, Teresa? How could you ever murder him? You have been listening to... Obsession. facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
session. I'd known. I only wanted to get out of the rain. Oh. What? Well, you're hurt. Oh, it's my ankle. I turned it. There. Now we can see something. Now, you're a pretty sight. You're wet clean through, aren't you? I didn't have any matches or I'd have made a fire. A lot of old papers. What are you doing out in this godforsaken place? A girl like you has no business out like this. You're wet, too. Never mind about me. Now stay where you are, like, so I get my bearings around here. Isn't this your house? Huh? Yeah, sure. Sure, this is my house. I I just had it done over for spring, and I can't find my way around. This isn't your house. What are you doing here? Listen, sister, that's my business. Stop asking questions and roll up some of those old papers while I see if there's any wood. There is in that room over there. I fell over it when I first came in. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. There's lots of it. Piled nearly to the ceiling. <laughs> Gosh. With that wood, we could stay warm for the rest of our life. Imagine being warm the rest of your life. Maybe that's why I'm going to California. California? Is that where you're going? Yeah, I got an aunt there. She doesn't know I'm coming. I don't know how glad she'll be to see me either, but I haven't got any other place to go. Oh, here's some more paper. Oh, okay. Did I roll them tight enough? Yeah, yeah, they're okay. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty swell. The boy scouted me. <laughs> well, it's not bad, is it? Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah, I feel better already. What's your name? Mary Evans. Mine's... A... Mine's Todd. Todd what? Todd's good enough. Well, look, we, uh, we'd better be thinking of getting some shut-eye. I want to get on my way early in the morning, and I guess if you're going to California, you'll need some shut-eye, too. I wonder if they have fireplaces in California. <laughs> what for? They got sun. Well, it's a long way to California, especially if you're hitchhiking. Say, look, I got some dough. Enough to get you a bus ticket. I oh, know, I wouldn't think of it. Well, it isn't right for a girl to go hitchhiking around the country. Not a gal like you. You haven't got enough for yourself. Who said I didn't have enough? I got a car. I ran it into a ditch down the road, but I'll get it out in the morning. 
Why are you bound? Back where I came from. And I thought I was coming to sort of a heaven on earth. A house, land, all mine for the taking. <laughs> and what do I get? A broken down wood pile with a lot of weeds around it. You mean this house is really yours? Now look, we've talked it up. Oh, here. Here, put my coat over you and stop worrying about things that don't concern oh. you. But where are you going to sleep? There's a pile of papers in that other room. I'll be warm enough there. Good night. Good night. Todd. Hey, I never heard such a racket. Those aren't birds. Sure, there must be thousands of them. Oh, and I thought the country was supposed to be quiet. Sounds like Times Square on New Year's Eve. The storm's over and the sun's out, Tom. I want you to see what the place looks like in the daytime. Oh, I saw the weeds last night. Not the weeds. The trees. Fruit trees. Look. Say, it's not bad at that, is it? Oh, it's beautiful. All those fields stretching out green beyond the house. They must all belong to it because they're fenced just the same as the house. Imagine all that ground. I didn't know there was so much ground left in the world. Yeah, but the weeds. Well, why wouldn't the weeds be waist high? Anything would grow here. You can tell just by looking out there. I bet you could have flowers and all the vegetables you wanted in almost no time. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose maybe you could. And Todd, there's a kitchen, too. With a stove, old-fashioned range, as big as all outdoors. And there's an upstairs to the house, and above that, an attic. It smells funny up there. Kind of like a perfume, almost. You're pretty excited about this, Joy, aren't you? Uh-huh. <laughs> Your eyes are shining like a kid. Oh, maybe it's the air. You can breathe. <laughs> oh, you can actually breathe. No, yeah, just try it. No, not me. I couldn't stand it. Well... I'm going someplace to see if I can round up some grub. I'm hungry. Oh, so am I. Well, there's bound to be a store around someplace. Some bacon and eggs would go pretty good right now, huh? Oh, and coffee. Don't forget coffee. Yes, sir. I'll be back in a flash with the bacon. I thought you were never going to find that bacon. I found it all right. Found trouble along with it. What happened? We've got to get out of here. What's happened? Plenty, plenty. Now look, here's the dough for your bus fare, and I'll be seeing you. I don't want your money. I've made my own way all my life. I don't need help from you or anybody else. Goodbye. Hey, you're a hot-tempered little number, aren't you? <laughs> you're okay. I like you. And, uh... Just because I do, I'll explain about this house. It isn't really mine. Oh? It belonged to a fellow named Todd Brandon. It belonged to his family. He was the last. We, uh, we were both in the racket in New York. You mean gangsters? I never killed anybody. But I was running along with a gang. They got Brandon. But before he died, he gave me all the papers and the deed to the house. Told me to take his name and live out here just like I was a Brandon. I gathered from him that the Brandons were a special kind of people out here. Well, it would it'd mean a new chance for you. To put your past behind you. That was wonderful of him. Yes, but there's an uncle. An uncle Caleb Brandon out in California somewhere. He's sick and can't get about much, and he hasn't seen Brandon since he was nine. Well, then you wouldn't have to worry about him. All you have to do is fill out the papers he gave you, tell everybody you're Todd Brandon... And you are. Yeah, and just like that, I'm a guy of property. And all this land would be yours, Todd. You've got to stay. What? Don't you see? It's your one chance. My chance for what? To spend my life picking weeds? You said you had a little money. Well, about 300 bucks, that's all. Well, that 300 will buy seeds to plant your land. It'll buy paint to fix your house. It's enough to buy life, Todd. You're crazy. Oh, look out there. The trees and the grass. Even the weeds are green and strong and healthy. Part of the earth. They belong. 
And where do you belong? Nowhere. Huh? Yet you're just as much a part of that earth as they are. That's fine talk for you. Would, uh, would you want to stay on in this dump? Would I? Oh, for all your life you'd been shoved around. Nowhere to go that you belong. No one to care whether you stayed or went. And if one day someone said that there was a house to live in and land to make your living on, and it was yours for as long as you cared to stay, <laughs> do you think I'd say no? All right. All right, supposing I do like you say. Supposing I do stick on. Pretend I'm Brandon. Would you stay with me? Me, Todd? Back there in the store, an old fossil that runs the place got it in his head that I that I really was Todd Brandon and that I brought back a wife with me. You mean... You mean you'd marry me? Well, if I'm going to plow the fields and plant whatever a fellow plants in a dump like this, there's still a house. And a house without a woman isn't much of a house. And a man's life would be pretty empty unless there were regular meals to come to and, well, somebody to talk things over with him when his work was done... I can't believe what you're saying is true. Will you... Will you stay? Oh, sure I will. I guess neither of us have got any past to brag about. Well, maybe that's not important. But, Todd, remember this. If things don't work out, you can go your way, and I'll understand. You're a good kid. And I'm not one to pass up a hunch. So we'll give it a whirl. Huh, baby? Yes. And what's more, I think you'll make the grade. I'm betting on Todd Brandon to win. And as Mary said, Todd was shoved around all his life. No one cared whether he stayed or not. But now, here was a chance. A long chance. Without discovery, he could be Todd Brandon. He could forget the old angry thoughts. But maybe the fear of detection might become the foundation for another obsession. when you're pawing it. I just couldn't wait. A letter just came for you. I had to know what was in it. A letter, huh? Uh, from your Uncle Caleb out in California. Uh-oh, uh-oh, that means trouble. Let me have it. What did he say? He's coming, isn't he? Coming to see us. Yeah, how'd you guess? Oh, I just know that's all. I've known all along that, that it was going to happen someday. It's been too perfect to last. Coming for Thanksgiving. Oh, Todd... What do we do, Mary? We just go on doing what we've been doing. How is he going to guess you're not his real nephew? He never saw the real Todd since he was a kid. If Ezra and Marty can be fooled, then so can Uncle Caleb. But there'll be questions. There'll be his eyes looking at us, wondering, watching. So what? Listen, this place is ours. This earth is ours, yours and mine. Our fields ripe with the grain that we've planted. It's our gardens that have fed us. It's our labor that's fixed up the place and painted the house and made a home of it. It's ours, I tell you. And no Uncle Caleb or anyone else is ever going to take it from us.
Yes, sir, Caleb. I thought I'd better pick you up. Yes, help Mary. You know, that nephew of yours is made of the real Brandon stuff. Yes, sir. Really, yes, sir. And that little wife of his, she's a humdinger, too. The way they tore into that house, you'd have thought it was their last chance on earth. Their last chance, eh? They painted the place up, got hold of some fancy ideas about irrigation, and by gosh, they're growing the best vegetables and fruit in Midland. Does he look like the family? Well, I don't care, but that's a funny thing. He's a Brandon, all right, you can tell that. But he don't look like him. He's handsomer than any Brandon ever was. No, I can't rightly say there's much resemblance. I see. Hey, there's a house now. The old house. Just like it used to look when I was a kid. Same clean, trim, welcome look about it. A house that could sell for quite a bit of money nowadays, couldn't it? Sure, just off the highway and Midland's glowing like anything. But they'll never sell. Not Todd and Mary. You seem very sure, yes, huh? Caleb, there's something in the back of your mind. Something worrying you. Something you ain't sure you're right about. Is it tough? Maybe it is, Ezra. And maybe it ain't. But I'll know for long. I'll know for sure. Most everything Mary and I have learned about a farm, Uncle Caleb, we've read out of books. <laughs> Well, it looks as if the books were pretty fair teachers. Well, we've had luck on our side, too. Luck's a pretty handy thing, especially when you're taking the wrong chance. Yeah. Yeah, especially then. Todd, are you wear Uncle Caleb about? Why don't you come inside and have something to drink? I'll build a fire and you can talk and be comfortable, too. That's a good idea, young lady. Yeah, my old legs aren't as spry as they used to be. <laughs> Here, sit in that comfortable chair, Uncle Caleb. Thank you. We haven't gotten around to doing much about the furniture. We thought we'd wait till winter when there wasn't so much work to be done outside. You poke up the fire a bit, Todd, and I'll get the drink. All right, honey. Uh, uh, you know, Todd, it's it's good to sit here in this old room again. I guess when you get as old as I am, you get sentimental about places you've known when you were young. You see, Todd, we Brandons belong to the real America. The America that ventured and dared and built in the days when life wasn't so easy as it is now. And the land was the thing, the great thing. That's why I've let this house stand empty all these years just waiting for a Brandon to come back. Because we Brandons have always felt that it would never be right for anybody but a Brandon to live in it. I think I understand how you feel. There you are. Here's your drink, Uncle Caleb. Huh? Oh, <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. Thanks, honey. Uh, well, here's to the Brandons. Yes. Here's to the Brandons. Yeah. The Brandons. Todd. Todd, we've got to tell him the truth. There's only tonight. He'll be gone after tonight. I couldn't stay on Todd and him not know. It'd be like living with a lie. Everywhere I'd turn in the house, everywhere I'd go in the field, it'd be there, haunting me. I can't do it, Todd. Neither can you. I've seen it in your eyes since he's been here. I've heard it in your voice the night he told us about the family. You can't go on any more than I can. Even if it means giving up everything. Okay. You're right, honey. We'll tell him tonight. Oh, I'm so glad, Todd. I knew you'd say that. Well, 
Good night, Mary. Good night, Todd. This has been a wonderful week. But I better get some sleep. I am leaving early tomorrow. Oh, just a minute, Uncle Caleb. Before you leave, Todd has something to tell you. Uh, couldn't it wait till morning? Oh, no, we've got to say it now. Because maybe it'll change your plans about leaving tomorrow. Tell him, Todd. We hadn't planned to tell you. At least I hadn't. Tomorrow would have come and you would have gone and things for us would have been just the same. We could have gone on living here, making our making our living off your form, becoming a part of the town, carrying your name because it really isn't ours. I'm not Todd Brandon. Oh. Oh, I see. My name, my real name is Conway. When Todd died, the real Todd, he gave me the deed to this place. I filed it like it was my own. But believe me, it wasn't stealing. We didn't mean to steal it, Uncle Caleb. It was it was just that it was our only chance to make a life for ourselves. We made vegetables and crops and fruit grow where only weeds were growing before. We built a home out of a broken down wood pile. And for just a little while this earth was ours. We were Brandon's too. I've got to tell you something else, Uncle Caleb. Something I've never told Mary before. It's her doing, really. Without her, I wouldn't be here now. She taught me what it means to live. She taught me what it means to love. That's why I stayed on, because of her. It isn't exactly what he said. He taught me the meaning of living, too. He taught me about love. And, and then when you came, we saw how swear you were. And we talked it over. We knew we couldn't go on living a lie. Not any longer. I am glad you decided the way you did. Though I wouldn't have said anything in any case. You mean you knew I wasn't Todd Brandon? I knew when he died. I'd been hunting him for some time. I just learned about him. What he was and what he did and how he died. I was planning to come back here. Then I got your letter saying you'd come back to the farm to live. I thought I'd wait and see what happened. That's why I came back. I'm so glad we told you. Well, after all, being abandoned is a quality that's in a man, whether he's Tom, Dick, or Harry, or Todd Brandon. This earth is yours because you've made it so. You belong here, both of you. You belong in this house. Gosh, I don't know what to say. It's as if I was suddenly made whole again. Only one thing I've got to say. It was mostly Mary's doings. Without her, I couldn't have even pretended to be abandoned. Well, it took both of you to do it, son. Oh, believe me, Uncle Caleb. I promise you this, that as long as Todd and I live, you'll never be ashamed of our bearing your name. That's right. We've learned what this earth of ours means. We've learned what it means to be a Brandon. What it means to be an American. <laughs> been listening to Obsession.